Volume One, Part One, Chapter One of War and Peace. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Marianne Spiegel. War and Peace by Leo Tolstoy. Translated by Nathan Haskell Doyle. Volume One, Part One, 1805. Chapter One. Well, Prince, Genoa and Lucha are now nothing more than the Aponige, than the private property of the Bonaparte family. I warn you that if you do not tell me we are going to have a war, if you still allow yourself to condone all the infamies, all the atrocities of this Antichrist, on my word, I believe he is Antichrist, that is the end of our acquaintance. You are no longer my friend. You are no longer my faithful slave, as you call yourself. Now be of good courage. I see I frighten you. Come, sit down and tell me all about it. It was on a July evening, 1805, that the famous Anna Pavlovna Scherer, maid of honor and confidant of the Empress Maria Fyodorovna, thus greeted the influential statesman, Prince Vasily, who was the first to arrive at her reception. Anna Pavlovna had been coughing for several days. She had the grip, as she affectionately called her influenza, grip, at that time being a new word only occasionally employed. A number of little notes distributed that morning by a footsman in red livery had been all couched in the same terms. If you have nothing better to do, Monsieur le Comte, or Mon Prince, and if the prospect of spending the evening with a poor invalid is not too dismal, I shall be charmed to see you at my house between seven and ten. Annette Scherer. Oh, what a savage attack, rejoined the prince, as he came forward in his embroidered court uniform, stockings, and diamond-buckled shoes, and with an expression of serenity on his insipid face, showing that he was not in the least disturbed by this reception. He spoke that elegant French, in which Russians formerly not only talked, but also thought, and his voice was low and patronizing, as becomes a distinguished man who has spent a long life in society and at court. He went up to Anna Pavlovna, kissed her hand, bending down to it his perfumed and polished bold head, and then he seated himself comfortably on the sofa. First tell me how you are, cher ami. Calm your friend's anxiety, said he, speaking in Russian, but not altering the tone of his voice, which— in spite of the gallant and sympathetic nature of his remark, still betrayed indifference and even raillery. How can one be well when one's moral sensibilities are so tormented? Is it possible in these days for a person possessed of any feeling to remain calm? exclaimed Anna Pavlovna. You will spend the evening with us, I hope. Ah, but the English ambassador's fete. It is Wednesday, you know. I must show myself there said the prince. My daughter is coming for me, to take me there. I thought that had been postponed. I confess all these fetes and fireworks are beginning to grow insipid. If they had known that it was your desire, they would have postponed the fete, said the prince, from habit, like a watch wound up, saying things which he had no expectation of being believed. Don't tease me. Well, what decision has been reached in regard to Novosilstov's dispatch? You know everything. How can I tell you, said the prince, in a cold tone of annoyance, what decision has been reached? This, that Bonaparte has burnt his ships, and I believe that we are about to burn ours. Prince Vasily always spoke indolently, like an actor rehearsing an old part. Anna Pavlovna, on the contrary, in spite of her forty years, was full of vivacity and impulses. Being an enthusiast had given her a peculiar position in society, and sometimes, even when it was contrary to her own inclinations, she worked herself up to the proper pitch of enthusiasm, so as not to disappoint her acquaintances. The suppressed smile constantly playing over her face, although incongruous with her faded features, expressed, just as in the case of spoiled children, the unfailing consciousness of a failing on the side of amiability, which she could not and would not correct, even if she thought it advisable. 
They got deep in a conversation about political matters, and Anna Pavlovna became thoroughly heated. Oh, don't say anything to me about Austria. Perhaps I do not know anything about it, but Austria has never wished for war, and she does not now. She is betraying us. Russia alone must be the salvation of Europe. Our benefactor realizes his high calling and will be faithful to it. That is one thing in which I have a firm belief. The grandest part in the world lies before our kind and splendid sovereign, and he is so benevolent and good that God will not abandon him, and he will fulfill his mission of crushing the hydra of revolution, which is now more monstrous than ever, in the face of this murderer and scoundrel. We alone are called upon to redeem the blood of the just. On whom can we rely, I ask you? England, with her commercial spirit, does not understand, and cannot understand, all the loftiness of soul of the Emperor Alexander. She has refused to evacuate Malta. She is anxious to find. She is seeking for some secret motive in our actions. What did they say to Novosilstov? Nothing. They do not and they cannot understand the self-denial of our Emperor, who wishes nothing for his own gain, but everything for the good of the world. And what have they promised? Nothing. Even what they have promised will not be performed. Prussia has already declared that Bonaparte is invincible, and that all Europe is powerless before him. And I have not the slightest faith in Hedenburg or Hogwitz. This famous Prussian neutrality is only a snare. I believe in God alone, and in the high destiny of our beloved Emperor. He will save Europe. She suddenly paused, with a smile of amusement at her own impetuosity. I think, said the prince, smiling, that if you had been sent instead of our dear Vitzengeroda, you would have taken the king of Prussia's consent by storm. You are so eloquent. Will you give me some tea? Directly, apropos, she added, becoming calm once more. This evening I shall have two very interesting men. Le Vicomte de Montmartre, connected with the Montmercies, through the Rohans, one of the best families of France. He is one of the decent emigrants of the genuine sort. And then Le Abbe Morio. You know that profound mind. He has been received by the sovereign. Do you know him? Ah, I shall be most happy, said the prince. But tell me, he went on to say, as though something just at that moment for the first time occurred to him, whereas in reality this question was the chief object of his visit. Is it true that La Pera Tres Mer wishes Baron Funke to be named as first secretary at Vienna? It seems to me that this baron is a poor specimen. Prince Vasily was anxious for his son to get the appointment to this place, which a party was trying to secure for the baron through the influence of the Empress Maria Fyodorovna. Anna Pavlovna almost closed her eyes to signify that neither she nor anyone else could tell what would satisfy or please the Empress. Baron Funke was recommended to the Empress Dowager by her sister, she said in French, curtly, dryly, and in a melancholy tone. Whenever Anna Pavlovna spoke of the Empress, her face suddenly assumed a deep and genuine expression of devotion and deference tinged with melancholy, and this was characteristic of her at all times when she was reminded of her august patroness. She said that Her Majesty had been pleased to show Baron Funke beaucoup de thème, and again the shade of melancholy passed over her face. The prince preserved an indifferent silence. Anna Pavlovna, with a quickness and dexterity characteristic of a woman, and especially of one brought up at court, had taken pains to give the prince a rap because of his daring to speak in dispraise of a person who had been recommended to the empress, and at the same time she consoled him. Mais à propos de votre famille, she added, do you know that your daughter, since she came out, has roused the enthusiasm of all our best people? She is considered to be as lovely as the day. The prince bowed in token of his respect and gratitude. I often think, perused Anna Pavlovna, after a moment's silence, drawing a little closer to the prince and giving him a flattering smile, as though to imply that she had nothing more to say about politics and society, but was ready to enter into a confidential chat. I often think how unfairly happiness in life is distributed. 
Why should fate have given you two such splendid children? I don't count Anatole, your youngest, for I don't like him, she said decisively, in a way of parenthesis, and raising her brows. Two such lovely children. And really you do not appreciate them, and therefore do not deserve them. And she smiled her enthusiastic smile. Qu'avoulez-vous? Lavater would have said that I lack the bump of philoprogenitiveness, said the prince. Now stop joking. I wanted to have a serious talk with you. You must know I am out of patience with your youngest son. Between you and me, here her face assumed its melancholy expression, they have been talking about him at Her Majesty's and pitying you. The prince made no reply, but she paused and looked at him significantly while waiting for his answer. Prince Vasily frowned. What do you wish me to do? he exclaimed at last. You know I have done everything for their education that is in a father's power, and both have turned out des imbeciles. Ippolit is nothing worse than an inoffensive idiot, but Anatole is one of quite an opposite stamp. There is that difference between them, said he, with a smile more natural and animated than usual, and at the same time allowing an unexpectedly coarse and disagreeable expression to be most distinctly manifest in the wrinkles around his mouth. And why is it that such men as you have children? If you were not a father, I should not be able to find fault with you about anything, said Anna Pavlovna, lifting her eyes pensively. I am your faithful slave, and I can confess it to you alone. My children are the stumbling blocks of my existence. This is my cross. That is the way I explain it to myself. Que voulez-vous? He paused, expressing with a gesture his submission to his cruel fate. Anna Pavlovna was lost in thought. Has it never occurred to you to find a wife for your prodigal son? They say old maids have a mania for matchmaking. I am not as yet conscious of this weakness, but I know a petite personne who is very unhappy with her father, a relative of ours, un princess Bolkonskaya. Prince Vasily made no reply, but the motion of his head showed that, with the swiftness of calculation and memory characteristic of men of the world, he was taking her suggestion into consideration. Do you know that this Anatole cost me forty thousand a year, said he, evidently unable to restrain the painful current of his thoughts. He hesitated. What will it be five years hence, if it goes this rate? Voilà l'advantage d'être père. Is she rich, this princess of yours? Her father is very rich and stingy. He lives in the country. You know, he is that famous Prince Bolkonsky, who retired during the lifetime of the late emperor. He was nicknamed the King of Prussia. He is a very clever man, but full of whims and a trial. La pauvre petite is as unhappy as she can be. She has a brother who recently married Lise Meinen. He is on Kutuzov's staff. He will be here this evening. Listen, Sharonet, said the prince, suddenly taking his companion's hand and bending it down for some reason. Arrangez moi cette affaire, and I will be your faithless slave for ever and ever. She is of good family and rich, all that I require and with that easy and natural grace for which he was distinguished, he raised her hand, kissed it, and having kissed it, still retained it in his, while he settled back in his armchair and looked to one side. Attendi, said Anna Pavlovna, after a moment of consideration, I will speak about it this very evening to Lise, young Bolkonsky's wife, and perhaps it can be arranged. In your family I shall begin my old maid's apprenticeship, End of chapter 1 Part 1, Chapter 2 of War and Peace by Leo Tolstoy Translated by Nathan Haskell Doyle This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Marianne Anna Pavlovna's drawing-room gradually began to be filled. The highest aristocracy of Petersburg came, people most widely differing in age and character, but alike in that they all belonged to the same class of society. Prince Vasily's daughter, the beautiful Ellen, came, in order to go with her father to the ambassador's reception. She was in ball toilette, 
and wore the imperial decoration. There came also the little, young Princess Bolkonskaya, known as the most fascinating woman in Petersburg. She had been married during the past winter, and now, owing to her expectations, had ceased to appear at large entertainments, but still went to small receptions. Prince Ippolit, Prince Vasily's son, came with Montmartre, whom he was introducing to society. The Abbe Morio and many others also came. "'Have you seen my aunt yet?' or, "'Do you know my aunt?' asked Anna Pavlovna of her guests as they came in, and with perfect seriousness she would lead them up to a little old lady wearing tremendous bows who had sailed out from the next room the moment the guests began to arrive, and she presented them by name, deliberately looking from guest to aunt, and then going back to her place again. All the guests had to go through the formality of an introduction to this superfluous aunt, whom no one knew or cared to know. Anna Pavlovna, with a melancholy, rapturous expression of sympathetic approval, silently listened to their exchange of formalities. Montant spoke to all newcomers in precisely the same terms about their health, her own health, and the health of Her Majesty, which was better today, thank God. All those who fell into her clutches, though from politeness they showed no undue haste, made their escape with the consciousness of relief at having accomplished a disagreeable duty, and took pains not to stay near the old lady, or to come into her vicinity again during the evening. The young princess Bolkonskaya came, bringing some work in a gold-embroidered velvet bag. Her pretty little upper lip, just shaded by an almost imperceptible down, was rather alert, but all the more fascinating when it displayed her teeth, and more fascinating still when she drew it down a little and closed it against the underlip. As is always the case with perfectly charming women, her defect of a short lip and a half-open mouth seemed like a peculiar distinction and an addition to her beauty. It was a delight for all to look at this beautiful young woman so full of health and life, and so gracious with the promise of coming motherhood. Old men, and surly young men, soured before their time, as they looked at her, seemed to become like her, after being in her presence and talking with her for a little time. Whoever spoke with her and saw her bright smile, and her shining white teeth, displayed at every word, was sure to go away with the impression that he had been unusually agreeable that day. And everyone felt the same. The young princess, with her work-bag in her hand, making her way along with short, quick steps, passed around the table, and joyously disposing her dress, sat down on the sofa near the silver samovar, as though all that she did was partie de paisière for herself and all around her. "'I have brought my work,' she said in French, opening her reticule and addressing the whole company. "'Now see here, Annette, don't play a naughty trick upon me,' she went on to say, turning to the hostess. "'You wrote me that it was to be a little informal soiree. See, how unsuitably I am dressed.' and she spread out her arm so as to display her elegant grey gown trimmed with lace and belted high with a wide ribbon. "'Soyez tranquille, Lise,' replied Anna Pavlovna. "'You will always be the most beautiful of all.' "'You know my husband is deserting me,' continued the young princess, still in French, and addressing a general. "'He is going to meet his death. Tell me, why this wretched war?' she added, this time speaking to Prince Vasily and without waiting for his rejoinder, she had some remark to make to Prince Vasily's daughter, the handsome Ellen. Quelle délicieuse personne, que cette petite prosaise, whispered Prince Vasily to Anna Pavlovna. Shortly after the young princess's arrival, a huge, stout young man came in. His head was close-cropped, he had on eyeglasses, and wore stylish light trousers, an immense frill, and a cinnamon-colored coat. This stout young man was the illegitimate son of Count Bezukhoi, a famous grandee of Catherine's time, and now lying at the point of death in Moscow. He had not as yet entered any branch of the service, having just returned from abroad, where he had been educated, and this was his first appearance in society. Anna Pavlovna welcomed him with a nod reserved for men of the very least importance in the hierarchy of her salon. But notwithstanding this greeting, almost contemptuous in its way, Anna Pavlovna's face, as Pierre came toward her, expressed anxiety and dismay such as one experiences at the sight of anything too huge and out of place. 
Pierre was indeed rather taller than any one else in the room, but the princess's dismay could have been caused only by the young man's intelligent and at the same time diffident glance, so honest and keen that it distinguished him from every one else in the room. It is very kind of you, Monsieur Pierre, to come and see a poor invalid, said Anna Pavlovna, looking up in alarm from her aunt, to whom she was conducting him. Pierre blurted out some incoherent reply, and continued to let his eyes wander around the assembly. With a gay, rapturous smile he bowed to the little princess as though she were an intimate friend, and was led up to the aunt. Anna Pavlovna's alarm was justified, for Pierre did not wait for the old lady to finish her discourse about Her Majesty's health, but left her in the midst of it. Anna Pavlovna, in dismay, tried to detain him with the words, "'Do you know the Abbe Morio?' she asked. "'He is a very interesting man.' "'Yes, I have heard of his plan for a perpetual peace, and it is very interesting, but hardly feasible.' "'Do you think so?' said Anna Pavlovna, for the sake of saying something, and once more returning to her duties as hostess. But Pierre was now guilty of an incivility of an opposite nature. Before, he had left a lady without allowing her to finish speaking. Now he detained another lady, and made her listen to him, though she wished to leave him. Bending his head down, and spreading his long legs, he began to show Anna Pavlovna why he conceived that the abbe's plan was chimerical. "'We will talk about that by and by,' said Anna Pavlovna, with a smile. And having turned away from this young man who did not know the ways of polite society, she once more devoted herself to her duties as hostess, and continued to listen and look on, ready to lend her aid whenever conversation was beginning to flag. Just as the proprietor of a spinning establishment, who has stationed his workmen at their places, walks up and down on his tour of inspection, and when he notices any spindle that has stopped, or that makes an unusually loud or creaking noise, hastens to it, and checks it, or sets it going in its proper rote, even so Anna Pavlovna, as she walked up and down her drawing-room, came to some group that was silent, or that was talking too excitedly, and by a single word, or a silent transposition, she set the talking machine in regular, decorous running order again. But while she was occupied with these labors, it could be seen that she was all the time in a special dread of Pierre. She watched him anxiously while he went to listen to what was said in the circle around Montmartre, and then joined another group where the abbe was discoursing. For Pierre, who had been educated abroad, this reception at Anna Pavlovna's was the first introduction to society in Russia. He knew that all the intellect of Petersburg was gathered here, and like a child in a toy show, he kept his eyes open. He was all the time afraid of missing some clever conversation that might interest him. As he saw the assured and refined expressions on the faces of those gathered here, he was ever on the lookout for something especially intellectual. He had finally come to where Morio was. The conversation seemed to him interesting, and he stood there waiting a chance to air his opinions, as young men are fond of doing. End of chapter 2 Part 1, Chapter 3 of War and Peace by Leo Tolstoy Translated by Nathan Haskell Doyle This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Marianne Anna Pavlovna's reception was in full swing. The spindles on all sides were buzzing smoothly and without halt, with the exception of Matante, near whom sat only one elderly lady with a thin, tear-worn face, a poor soul rather out of place in this brilliant society, the guests were divided into three circles. In one, for the most part, composed of men, the Abbe Morio formed the center. In the second, there were young people grouped around the beautiful Princess Ellen, Prince Vasily's daughter, and the pretty little Princess Bolkonskaya, fair and rosy, but too stout for her age. In the third were Montmartre and Anna Pavlovna. The Viscount was an attractive-looking young man, with delicate features and refined manners, he evidently regarded himself as a celebrity, but through his good breeding, modestly allowed the company with which he mingled to profit by his presence. It was plain to see that Anna Pavlovna served him as a treat for her guests, just as a good maitre d'hôtel offers a supernaturally delicious dish, some piece of meat which no one would feel like eating were it seen in the unsavory kitchen. So this evening Anna Pavlovna served up to her guests first the viscount, then the abbe, as some sort of supernatural delicacy. 
In Montmartre's circle, they immediately began to discuss the murder of the Duc d'Angeon. The Viscount maintained that the Duke had fallen victim to his own magnanimity, and that there had been personal reasons for Bonaparte's ill will. Ah, voyons, comptez nous cela, vicomte, said Anna Pavlovna, ecstatically, with a consciousness that this phrase, comptez nous cela, vicomte, tell us about it, Viscount, had a certain ring like Louis the Fifteenth. The Viscount bowed in token of submission, and smiled urbanely. Anna Pavlovna made her circle close in around the Viscount, and invited all to hear his account. The Viscount knew the Duke personally, whispered Anna Pavlovna, in French, to one of her guests. The Viscount is wonderfully clever at telling a story, she said to another. How easy it is to tell a man used to good society, she exclaimed to a third, and the Viscount was offered to the company in a halo most exquisite and flattering to himself, like a roast beef garnished with parsley on a hot platter. The Viscount was just about beginning his narration, and a faint smile played over his lips. "'Come over here, Sherlaine,' said Anna Pavlovna, to the lovely young princess, who was seated at some little distance, the centre of the second group. The Princess Ellen smiled. She stood up with the smile on her face so natural to a perfectly beautiful woman, and which she had worn when she first came into the room. Lightly trailing her white ball dress, ornamented with smilax and moss, with shoulders gleaming white, with glossy hair and flashing gems, she made her way through the ranks of the men who stood aside to let her pass, and not looking at any one in particular, but smiling on all, and as it were, amiably granting each one the privilege of viewing the beauty of her form, of her plump shoulders, of her beautiful bosom and back, exposed by the low cut of the dress then in vogue, seeming to personify the radiance of festivity, she crossed over to Anna Pavlovna's side. Ellen was so lovely that not only there was not a shade of coquetry to be perceived in her, but on the contrary, she was, as it were, conscience-stricken at her unquestionable and all-conquering maidenly beauty. She seemed to have the will, but not the power, to diminish the effect of her loveliness. Quelle belle personne, was remarked by all who saw her. The Viscount, as though overwhelmed by something quite out of the ordinary, shrugged his shoulders and dropped his eyes at the moment she took her seat in front of him and turned upon him the radiance of that perpetual smile. Madame, I fear my ability is not on par with such an audience, said he, inclining his head with a smile. The young princess rested her bare round arm on the table and did not think it incumbent upon her to say anything in reply. She smiled and waited. All the time that he was telling his story she sat upright, glancing occasionally now at her beautiful plump arm, which by its pressure on the table altered its shape, now at her still more beautiful bosom, on which she adjusted her diamond necklace. Once or twice she smoothed out the folds of her dress, and when the story was unusually impressive she would look at Anna Pavlovna and for an instant assume the very same expression that was on the Fräulein's face, and then again relapse into her calm, radiant smile. The little princess, Bolkonskaya, also left the tea-table and followed Ellen. "'Wait a moment. I am going to bring my work,' she exclaimed. "'Vous y en a quoi pensez-vous?' she added, turning to Prince Hippolyte. "'Bring me my work-bag.' The young wife, smiling, and having a word for everyone, quickly effected her transmigration, and as she took her seat, merrily arranged herself. "'Now I am comfortable,' she exclaimed, and begging the Viscount to begin, she set herself to her work again. Prince Ippolit brought her the bag, and, placing his chair near her, sat down. Le Chermont Hippolyte struck one by his extraordinary likeness to his sister, the beautiful Ellen, and still more by the fact that in spite of this likeness he was astonishingly ugly. His features were the same as his sister's, but in her case all was illumined by her radiantly joyous, self-contented, unfailing smile of life and youth, and the remarkable classic beauty of her form. In the case of the brother, on the contrary, the face, though the same, was befogged with an idiotic expression, and looked always self-conceited and sulky, and his body was lean and feeble. Eyes, nose, mouth, all were fixed, as it were, in a perpetual grimace vaguely indicative of his discontented state of mind, 
while his arms and legs always assume some unnatural attitude. This is not a ghost story, is it? he asked, as he sat down near the princess and hastily put on his eyeglasses, as though without this instrument it were impossible for him to say a word. Why, no, my dear, replied the astonished narrator, shrugging his shoulders. Because I detest ghost stories, he added, and it was plain from his tone that only after he had spoken these words he realized their significance. The self-assurance with which he spoke was so complete, no one could tell whether his remark was very witty or very stupid. He wore a dark green coat, pantaloons of a shade that he called cuisse de nymphe affray, and stockings and pumps. The Viscount gave a very clever rendering of an anecdote at that time going the rounds, to the effect that the Duc d'Angeon had gone secretly to Paris to see Mademoiselle Georges, and there met Bonaparte, who also enjoyed the favors of the famous actress, and that Napoleon, on meeting the Duke there, happened to fall into one of the swoons to which he was subject, and thus came into the Duke's power. But the Duke refrained from taking advantage of it, while Bonaparte, in return for this magnanimity, revenged himself in the Duke's death. The story was very nice and interesting, especially the place where the rivals suddenly recognized each other, and the ladies, it appeared, were moved. Charmant, exclaimed Anna Pavlovna, looking interrogatively at the little princess. Charmant, whispered the little princess, looking for her needle in her work, as though to signify that the interest and charm of the tale had prevented her from going on with her sewing. The viscount was flattered by this mute tribute of praise, and with a gratified smile was about to continue. But at this instant Anna Pavlovna, who kept her eye constantly on the young man who seemed to her so dangerous, noticed that he and the abbe were talking altogether too loud and energetically, and she hastened to carry aid to the imperiled place. In reality, Pierre had succeeded in leading the abbe into a conversation on political equipoise, and the abbe, evidently interested by the young man's frank impetuosity, was giving him the full benefit of his pet idea. Both were talking and listening with too much natural ardor, and this was displeasing to Anna Pavlovna. By what means? The balance of Europe and droit des gens, the abbe was saying. It is possible for one powerful empire like Russia, having the repute of being barbarous, to take her stand disinterestedly at the head of an alliance whose aim is the balance of Europe, and she would save the world. How would you bring about this balance of power? Pierre was beginning to ask, but just at this instant Anna Pavlovna joined them, and, giving Pierre a stern glance, asked the Italian how he bore the climate of Petersburg. The Italian's face instantly changed, and took on an offensively, affectedly soft expression, which was evidently habitual with him when he engaged in conversation with women. I am so enchanted by the charms of the wit and culture, especially among the women of the society into which I have the honor of being received, that I have not had time as yet to think of the climate, said he. Anna Pavlovna, making sure of Pierre and the abbe, brought them into the general circle, so that she might keep them under her observation. At this moment a new personage appeared in the drawing-room. This new personage was the young prince, Andrei Bolkonsky, the husband of the little princess. Prince Bolkonsky was a very handsome youth of medium height, with strongly marked and stern features. Everything about him, from the weary, bored expression of his eyes to the measured deliberation of his step, presented a striking contrast with his little, lively wife. He was not only acquainted, it seemed, with every one in the room, but found them so tedious that even to look at them and hear their voices was too much for his equanimity. Of all those faces there, apparently, the face of his lovely little wife was the one that bored him the most. With a grimace that disfigured his handsome face, he turned away from her. He kissed Anna Pavlovna's hand, and with half-closed eyes looked round at the assembly. So, are you getting ready for war, prince? asked Anna Pavlovna. General Kutuzov has been kind enough to desire me as his aide-de-camp. He spoke in French, and accented the last syllable of Kutuzov's name like a Frenchman. Elise, votre femme? She will go into the country. Isn't it a sin for you to deprive us of your charming wife? 
Andre! exclaimed the little princess, addressing her husband in the same coquettish tone that she employed towards strangers. You should have heard the story the Viscount has been telling us about Mademoiselle Georges and Bonaparte. Prince Andre frowned and turned away. Pierre, who from the moment that Prince Andre entered the room had not taken his merry, kindly eyes from him, now came to him and took him by the arm. Prince Andre, without looking round, again contracted his face into a grimace expressing his annoyance that any one should touch his arm, but when he saw Pierre's smiling face, his face lighted up with an unexpectedly kind and pleasant smile. "'What is this? You also in gay society?' said he to Pierre. "'I knew that you would be here,' replied Pierre. "'I will go home to supper with you,' he added in a whisper, so as not to disturb the Viscount, who was proceeding with his story. "'Can I?' "'No, of course you can't,' said Prince André, laughing, and by a pressure of the hand giving Pierre to understand that he had no need of asking such a question. He had something more on his tongue's end, but at this moment Prince Vasily and his daughter arose, and the two young men stood aside to give them room to pass. "'You will excuse me, my dear Viscount,' said Prince Vasily, courteously insisting that the Frenchman should keep his seat. "'This unfortunate ball at the embassy deprives me of a pleasure and compels us to interrupt you. I am very sorry to leave your delightful reception,' he said to Anna Pavlovna. His daughter, the Princess Ellen, gracefully holding the folds of her dress, made her way among the chairs, and the smile on her lovely face was more radiant than ever. Pierre looked with almost startled, though enthusiastic eyes, at the beautiful creature as she passed by him. "'Very handsome,' said Prince André. "'Very,' said Pierre. As he went by, Prince Vasily seized Pierre by the hand and turned to Anna Pavlovna. "'Train this bear for me,' said he. "'He has been living a month at my house, and this is the first time that I have seen him in society.' Nothing is so advantageous for a young man as the society of clever women. End of chapter 3 Part 1, Chapter 4 of War and Peace by Leo Tolstoy Translated by Nathan Haskell Doyle This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Marianne Anna Pavlovna smiled and promised to look out for Pierre, who was, as she knew, on his father's side related to Prince Vasily. The elderly lady, who had been sitting near Montante, jumped up hastily and followed Prince Vasily into the entry. Her face lost all its former pretense of interest. Her kind, tear-worn face expressed only anxiety and alarm. "'What can you tell me, Prince, about my Boris?' she said, as she followed him. She pronounced the name Boris, with the accent on the first syllable. "'I cannot stay any longer in Petersburg,' Tell me what tidings I can take to my poor boy. Although Prince Vasily's manner in listening to the old lady was reluctant and almost uncivil, and even showed impatience, still she gave him a flattering and affectionate smile and took his arm to detain him. What would it cost you to say a word to the emperor, and then he would be at once admitted to the guards, she added. Be assured that I will do all I can, princess, replied Prince Vasily but it is not easy for me to ask his majesty. I should advise you to appeal to Romyatsov, through Prince Golitsyn. That would be a wiser move. The elderly lady bore the name of the Princess Drubetskaya, belonging to one of the best families in Russia, but as she was poor and had long been living in retirement, she had lost her former social position. She was now in Petersburg in the hopes of securing the admittance of her only son into the Imperial Guards, Merely for the sake of meeting Prince Vasily, she had accepted Anna Pavlovna's invitation to come to the reception. Merely for this, she had listened to the Viscount's story. She was dismayed at Prince Vasily's words. Her handsome face expressed vexation, but this lasted only an instant. She smiled once more and clasped Prince Vasily's arm more firmly. "'Listen, Prince,' said she, "'I have never asked anything of you.' and I never shall ask anything of you again, and I have never reminded you of the friendship that my father had for you. But now I beg of you, in God's name, do this for my son, and I will look upon you as our benefactor, she added hastily. No, don't be angry, but promise me this. I have asked Golitsyn. He refused. 
Soyez le bon enfant que vous avez été, she said, trying to smile, though the tears were in her eyes. Papa, we shall be late, said the Princess Ellen, who stood waiting at the door, and turned her lovely head on her classic shoulders. Influence in society is a capital which has to be economized lest it be exhausted. Prince Vasily understood this, and having once come to the conclusion that if he asked favors for everybody who applied to him, it would soon be idle to ask anything for himself, he rarely exerted his influence. The Princess Dubitskaya's last appeal, however, caused him to feel something like a pang of conscience. She had reminded him of the fact that he had owed to her father his early advancement in his career. Moreover, he saw by her actions that she was one of those women, notably mothers, who, having once conceived a notion, do not rest until they attain the object of their desires, and, if opposed, are ready with fresh urgencies and even scenes at any day or any moment. This last consideration turned the scale with him. Cher Anna Mikhailovna, said he, with his usual familiarity and with a shade of ill humor in his voice, it is almost impossible for me to do what you wish, but in order to show you how fond I am of you and how much I honor your father's memory, I will do the impossible. Your son shall be admitted to the guards. Here is my hand on it. Are you satisfied? My dear, you are our benefactor. I expected nothing less from you. I knew how kind you were. He started to go. Wait, two words more. Une fois posé un garde. She hesitated. You are good friends with Mikhail Ilarionovitch Kutuzov. Do recommend Boris to him as aide-de-camp. Then I should be content, and then... Prince Vasily smiled. That I can't promise. You have no idea how Kutuzov has been besieged since he was appointed commander-in-chief. He himself told me that all the ladies of Moscow had offered him all their children as adjutants. No, but you must promise. I will not let you go, my dear friend, my benefactor. Papa, again insisted the beautiful Ellen, in the same tone, we shall be late. Well, au revoir. Good-bye, you see. Then tomorrow you will speak to his majesty? Without fail. But I cannot promise about Kutuzov. No, but promise, promise, Basili, insisted Anna Mikhailovna, with a coquettish smile, which perhaps in days long gone by might have been becoming to her, but now ill-suited her haggard face. She evidently forgot her age, and through habit put her confidence in her former feminine resources. But as soon as he was gone, her face again assumed the same expression as before, of pretended cool complacency. She returned to the group where the Viscount was still telling stories, and again she made believe listen, though she was anxiously waiting for the time to go, now that her purpose was accomplished. "'But what do you think of this last comedy, Du Sacre de Milan?' asked Anna Pavlovna. "'And the new comedy of the people of Genoa and Lucha coming to offer their homage to Monsieur Bonaparte sitting on a throne and accepting the homage of nations. Oh, this is delicious! No, it is enough to make one beside oneself. He would think the whole world had gone mad. Prince Andrei looked straight into her face and smiled. God has given me this crown. Beware of touching it, he said. Those were Bonaparte's words. Du me les dons, gorech cal a touché, at his coronation. They say he was very handsome as he pronounced these words, he added, and again repeated them in Italian. Dumele du nom guie si la tuka. I hope, pursued Anna Pavlovna, that this will at last be the drop too much. The sovereigns cannot longer endure this man, who is a menace to each and every one of them. The sovereigns? I do not refer to Russia, said the Viscount politely, but in a tone of despair. The sovereigns, madame. What have they done for Louis the Eighteenth, for the Queen, for Madame Elizabeth? Nothing, he added, becoming animated. And, believe me, they are suffering their punishment for having betrayed the cause of the Bourbons, the sovereigns. They sent ambassadors to compliment the usurper. And with an exclamation of contempt, he again changed his position. Prince Ippolit, who had long been contemplating the Viscount through his lorgnette, suddenly at these words turned completely round to the little princess, and asking her for a needle, 
proceeded to show her what the escutcheon of Conde was, scratching it with the needle on the table. He interpreted this coat of arms for her benefit with such a business-like expression that one would have supposed the princess had asked him to do it for her. Beton de jeu, ongreli de jeu d'azur, mise en compte, he said. The princess listened with a smile. If Bonaparte remains a year longer on the throne of France, things will have gone quite too far, said the viscount, still pursuing the same line of conversation, like a man who, without regard to the opinions of others, and considering himself the best informed on any given subject, insists on following the lead of his own thoughts. By intrigue, violence, proscriptions, and capital punishment, society, I mean good society, French society, will be utterly destroyed, and then... He shrugged his shoulders and spread open his hands. Pierre was about to put in a word. The conversation interested him, but Anna Pavlovna, who was on the watch, broke in. The Emperor Alexander, said she, with a melancholy which always accompanied any reference to the imperial family, has declared that he will leave it to the French themselves to choose their own form of government, and it is my opinion that unquestionably the whole nation, when once freed from the usurper, will throw itself into the arms of its rightful king, said she, striving to say something flattering to the emigre and royalist. That is doubtful, said Prince André. Monsieur le Vicomte is perfectly right when he remarks that things have already gone too far. I think that there are many difficulties in the way of returning to the old. I have recently heard, remarked Pierre, again with a flushed face, venturing to take part in the conversation, that almost all the nobility have gone over to Bonaparte. That is what the Bonapartists say, replied the Viscount, not looking at Pierre. It is hard nowadays to know what the public opinion of France really is. Bonaparte said so, sneered Prince André. It was evident that the Viscount did not please him, and also that the latter, though without especially addressing him, directed all his remarks in his direction. I have showed them the path of glory, he went on, after a moment's silence, again quoting Napoleon's words, and they would not enter it. I opened my antechambers to them, and they rushed in in throngs. I know how far he was justified in saying that. Not in the least, said the Viscount. After the assassination of the Duke, even the most partial ceased to look on him as a hero. Even if he has been a hero for certain people, continued the Viscount, turning to Anna Pavlovna, since the assassination of the Duke, there is one martyr more in heaven, and one hero less on earth. Anna Pavlovna and the others had not time to reward the Viscount with a smile of approval for his words, before Pierre again rushed into the conversation, and Anna Pavlovna, though she had a presentiment that he would say something indecorous, was unable to restrain him. The punishment of the Duc d'Angion, said Monsieur Pierre, was a political necessity, and I for one regard it as magnanimity in Napoleon, not hesitating to assume the sole responsibility of this act. Dieu, mon Dieu, exclaimed Anna Pavlovna, in a whisper of dismay. What, Monsieur Pierre, you see magnanimity in assassination, said the little princess, smiling and moving her work nearer to her. Ah, oh, said a number of different voices. Capital, said Prince Ippolit, in English, and he began to slap his knee with his hand. The Viscount merely shrugged his shoulders. Pierre looked triumphantly at the company over his spectacles. I say this, he went on to explain, in a sort of desperation. Because the Bourbons fled from the revolution, leaving their people a prey to anarchy, and it was Napoleon alone who was able to understand the revolution, to conquer it, and consequently, when the good of all was in the balance, he could not hesitate before the life of a single individual." "'Don't you want to come over to this table?' suggested Anna Pavlovna. But Pierre, without heeding her, went on with his discourse. "'No,' said he, growing more and more excited. "'Napoleon is great because he stands superior to the revolution, because he has crushed out its abuses, preserved all that was good, the equality of citizens, and freedom of speech, and the press, and that was the only way that he gained the power.' "'Yes.' if, when he gained the power, instead of using it for assassination, 
he had restored it to the legitimate king, said the viscount, then I should have called him a great man. But he could not do that. The power was granted him by the people, solely that he might deliver them from the Bourbons, and because they saw that he was a great man. The revolution was a mighty fact, continued Monsieur Pierre, betraying by this desperate and forced proposition his extreme youth and his propensity to speak out whatever was in his mind. Revolution and regicide, mighty facts. After this, but will you not come over to this table? insisted Anna Pavlovna. Rousseau's contre social, suggested the viscount with a benign smile. I am not talking about regicide, I am talking about the idea. Yes, the idea of pillage, assassination, and regicide, suggested an ironical voice. Those are the extremes, of course, and the real significance is not in such things, but in the rights of man in emancipation from prejudices. Inequality of citizenship, and all these principles Napoleon has preserved in all their integrity. Liberty and equality, exclaimed the viscount, scornfully, as though he had at last made up his mind seriously to prove to this young man all the foolishness of his arguments. All high sounding words, which long ago were shown to be dangerous. Who does not love liberty and equality? Our Saviour himself preached liberty and equality. But after the revolution, were men any better off? On the contrary, we wanted freedom, and Bonaparte has destroyed it. Prince Andre, with a smile on his face, looked now at Pierre, now at the viscount, and now at the hostess. During the first instant of Pierre's outbreak, Anna Pavlovna was appalled, notwithstanding her experience in society. But when she saw that Pierre's sacrilegious utterances did not make the viscount lose his temper, and when she became convinced that it was impossible to check him, she collected her forces, and taking the viscount's side, she attacked the young orator. Mais mon cher, Monsieur Pierre, said Anna Pavlovna, how can you call a man great who can put to death a duke, simply a man, when you come to analyze it, without trial and without cause? I should like to ask, said the viscount, how Monsieur explains the eighteenth brumaire. Was it not a fraud? It was a piece of trickery wholly unlike what a great man could have done. And the prisoners of Africa, whom he killed, suggested the little princess, that was horrible, and she shrugged her shoulders. C'est un rotrier, vous a rebaudier. Monsieur Pierre did not know which one to answer. He looked at them all and smiled. His smile was unlike other men's, falsely compounded of seriousness. Whenever a smile came on his face, then suddenly, like a flash, all the serious and even stern expression vanished, and in its place came another, genial, frank, and like that of a child asking forgiveness. The Viscount, who had never seen this young Jacobin before, recognized clearly that he was not nearly as terrible as his words. All were silent. How can you expect him to answer all of you at once? said Prince Andre. Besides, in all the actions of a statesman, one must distinguish the actions of a private individual, a general, or an emperor. It seems to me so. Yes, yes, of course, put in Pierre, delighted at this ratification of his ideas. It is impossible not to acknowledge, pursued Prince Andre, that Napoleon was great as a man on the bridge at Arcola, or in the hospital at Jaffa, when he shook hands with the plague-stricken soldiers, but— but there are other actions of his which it is hard to justify. Prince Andre, who had evidently been desirous of smoothing over Pierre's awkwardness, got up with the intention of leaving and giving his wife the hint. Suddenly Prince Ippolit arose, and with a gesture of his hand detaining the company and begging them to be seated, he went on to say, Ah, aujourd'hui on me raconte une anecdote muscovite charmante. Il faut causer vous un regal. Vous m'excuserez, vicon. Il faut causer racon en russe. Autrement, on ne centre pas le zèle de Isora. And Prince Hippolyte began to speak in Russian with much the same fluency as Frenchmen who have spent a year in Russia usually attain. All stopped to listen because Prince Hippolyte had been so strenuously urgent in attracting their attention to his story. In Moscow. There is a lady, 
une dame, and she is very miserly. She has to have two valets de play behind her carriage, and very tall ones. That was her hobby. And she had une femme de chambre, who was also very tall. She said, here Prince Ippolit paused to think, evidently at a loss to collect his wits. She said, yes, she said, girl, à la femme de chambre, put on livery and go with me, behind my carriage, faire des visites. Here Prince Ippolit burst out into a regular guffaw, and his laugh so completely failed to be echoed by his hearers that it produced a very disheartening effect upon the narrator. However, a few, including the elderly lady and Anna Pavlovna, smiled. She drove off. Suddenly a strong wind blew up. The girl lost her hat, and her long hair came down. Here he could not hold in any longer, but through his bursts of broken laughter he managed to say these words, and every one knew about it. That was the end of the anecdote. Although it was incomprehensible why he told it, and why he felt called upon to tell it in Russian rather than French, still Anna Pavlovna and the others appreciated Prince Ippolit's cleverness in so agreeably putting an end to Monsieur Pierre's disagreeable and stupid freak. The company, after the anecdote, broke up into little groups, busily engaged in the insignificant small talk about some ball that had been, or some ball that was to be, or the theatre, or when and where they should meet again. End of chapter 4 Part 1, Chapter 5 of War and Peace by Leo Tolstoy Translated by Nathan Haskell Doyle This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Marianne Congratulating Anna Pavlovna on what they called her charmante soirée, the guests began to take their departure. Pierre, as has been already said, was awkward, stout, of more than the average height, broad-shouldered, with huge red hands. He had no idea of the proper way to enter a drawing-room, and still less the proper way of making his exit. In other words, he did not know how to make some especially agreeable remark to his hostess before taking his leave. Moreover, he was absent-minded. He got up, and instead of taking his own cap, he seized the plumed three-cornered hat of some general, and held it, pulling at the feathers until the general came and asked him to surrender it. But all his absent-mindedness and clumsiness about entering a drawing-room, and his zeal in putting forward his own ideas, were redeemed by his expression of genuine goodness simplicity, and modesty. Anna Pavlovna turned to him, and with Christian sweetness, expressing her forgiveness for his behavior, nodded to him, and said, I hope I shall see you again, but I shall hope also that you will change your opinions, my dear Monsieur Pierre, said she. He could find no words to answer her. He only bowed, and again they all saw his smile, which really said nothing except this. Opinions are opinions, and you can see what a good and noble young man I am. And all, Anna Pavlovna included, could not help feeling that this was so. Prince Andrei went into the entry, allowed the lackey to throw his mantle over his shoulders, and with cool indifference listened to the chatter of his wife and Prince Ippolit, who had also come into the entry. Prince Ippolit stood near the pretty little princess and stared straight at her through his eyeglasses. Go back, Annette. You will take cold, said the little princess, by way of farewell to Anna Pavlovna. It is all understood, she added in an undertone. Anna Pavlovna had already had a chance to speak a word with Lisa in regard to the suggested match between Anatole and the little princess's sister-in-law. I shall depend upon you, my dear, said Anna Pavlovna, also in an undertone. You write to her and tell me, comment le père envisage choix la chose how the father will look at it. Au revoir. And she went back from the entry. Prince Ippolit came to the little princess, and bending his face down close to her began to talk to her in a half-whisper. Two lackeys, one the princess's, holding her shawl, the other his, with his overcoat, stood waiting until they should finish talking and listen to their chatter, which being in French was incomprehensible, but their faces seemed to say, we understand, but we do not care to show it. The princess, as always, smiled as she spoke, and listened, laughing gaily. I am very glad that I did not go to the ambassadors, said Prince Ippolit. 
A bore. We've had a lovely evening, haven't we? A lovely evening. They say it will be a very fine ball, replied the princess, curling her downy lip. All the pretty women in society will be there. Not all, because you are not there. Certainly not all, said Prince Ippolit, gaily laughing, and taking the shawl from the servant, he even pushed him away and began to wrap it round the princess. Either through awkwardness or intentionally, no one could tell which, it was a long time before he took his arms away from her, even after the shawl was wrapped around her, and he seemed almost to be embracing the young woman. She gracefully, and with a smile on her lips, drew back a little, turned around, and glanced at her husband. Prince Andrei's eyes were closed. He seemed so tired and sleepy. "'Are you ready?' he asked, giving his wife a hasty glance. Prince Ippolit hastily put on his overcoat, which being in the latest style came to his heels, and stumbling along in it rushed to the steps after the princess, whom the lackey was assisting into the carriage. "'Princess, au revoir!' he cried, his tongue as badly entangled as his feet. The princess, gathering up her dress, took her seat in the darkness of the carriage. Her husband was arranging his sword. Prince Ippolit, in his efforts to be of assistance, was in everybody's way." "'Excuse me, sir,' said Prince Andrei in Russian, in a cold, disagreeable tone, addressing Ippolit, who stood in his way. "'I shall expect you, Pierre,' said the same voice, but warmly and affectionately. The postillion whipped up the horses, and the carriage rolled noisily away. Prince Ippolit laughed spasmodically as he stood on the steps, waiting for the viscount whom he had promised to take home. "'Eh bien, mon cher,' Votre petite princesse est très bien, très bien, said the viscount, as he took his seat in the carriage with Ippolit. Mais très bien. He kissed the tips of his fingers. Et tout à fait française. Ippolit rolled with laughter. And do you know, you are terrible with your little innocent ways, continued the viscount. I pity the poor husband, that little officer who puts on the airs of a reigning prince. Ippolit again went off into a burst of laughter, though he managed to articulate, "'And yet you were saying that the Russian ladies were not anywhere equal to the French ladies. One must be able to show a little skill.' Pierre, being the first to reach the house, went into Prince Andrei's own room, like one thoroughly at home, and immediately stretching himself out on the sofa, as his habit was, took up the first book that he found on the shelf. It was Caesar's Commentaries, and leaning his elbow, began to read in the middle of the volume. "'What have you been doing to Mademoiselle Cher? She will be quite laid up now,' said Prince Andre, coming into the room and rubbing his small white hands together. Pierre turned over with his whole body, making the sofa creak, looked up at Prince Andre with his eager face, smiled, and waved his hand. "'No,' said he, "'that abbé is very interesting, only he does not understand the matter aright. In my opinion,' Permanent peace is possible, but I cannot tell how, certainly not through the balance of power. Prince Andrei was evidently not interested in these abstract questions. It is impossible, mon cher, always and everywhere to say what you think. But have you come to any final decision yet as to your career? Will you be a horse guardsman or a diplomat? asked Prince Andrei, after a moment's silence. Pierre sat up on the sofa doubling his legs under him. Can you imagine? I have not as yet the slightest idea. Neither the one nor the other pleases me. But see here, you must come to some decision. Your father is waiting. Pierre, at the age of ten, had been sent abroad, with an abbé for a tutor, and had remained there till he was twenty. On his return to Moscow, his father dismissed the abbé, and said to the young man, Now go to Petersburg, look about, and take your choice. I give my consent to anything. Here is a letter to Prince Vasily, and here is money for you. Write me about everything, and I will help you in any way. Pierre had been trying for three months to choose a career, and had not succeeded. It was in regard to this choice that Prince Andre spoke. Pierre rubbed his forehead. But he must be a Freemason, said he, referring to the abbé, whom he had met that evening. That is all nonsense, said Prince Andrei, again stopping him short. Let us talk about your affairs. 
Have you been to the house guards? No, not yet. But here is an idea that occurred to me, and I wanted to tell you, now that there is war against Napoleon. If it had been a war for freedom, I should have taken part. I should have been the first to enter the military service. But to help England and Austria against the greatest man in the world, that is not good. Prince Andrei merely shrugged his shoulders at Pierre's childish talk. He made believe that it was impossible to reply to such stupidities, but in reality it was difficult to answer this naive question in any way other than Prince Andrei did answer it. If all men made war only for their convictions, there wouldn't be any war, said he. That would be splendid, said Pierre. Prince Andrei laughed. Very likely that would be splendid, but it will never be. Now, why are you going to war? asked Pierre. Why? I'm sure I don't know. It must be so. Besides, I'm going, he paused. I am going because the life which I lead here, my life, is not to my mind. End of chapter 5 Part 1, Chapter 6 of War and Peace by Leo Tolstoy Translated by Nathan Haskell Doyle this LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Marianne. The rustle of a woman's dress was heard in the adjoining room. As though caught napping, Prince Andrei shook himself, and his face assumed the same expression which it had worn in Anna Pavlovna's drawing room. Pierre set his feet down from the sofa. The princess came in. She had already changed her dress for another, a wrapper to be sure, but equally fresh and elegant. Prince Andrei got up and courteously pushed forward an easy chair. "'Why is it, I often wonder,' she remarked, speaking as always in French, and at the same time briskly and spryly sitting down in the easy chair. "'Why is it that Annette never married? How stupid you all are, messieurs, that you never married her. You will excuse me for saying so, but you have not the slightest comprehension of women. What an arguer you are, Monsieur Pierre!' Your husband and I were just this moment arguing. I cannot understand why he wants to go to war, said Pierre, turning to the princess without any of the embarrassment so commonly shown in the relations of a young man toward a young woman. The princess gave a start. Evidently Pierre's words touched her to the quick. Ah, that is exactly what I say, said she. I do not understand. Really, I do not understand why men cannot live without war, why is it that we women wish nothing and need nothing? Now you be the judge. I will tell him just as it is. Here he is adjutant to uncle, a most brilliant position. Everybody knows him. Everybody esteems him. The other day, at a Praskin's, I heard a lady asking, C'est ça la femme ou présent, mes paroles du noir. She began to laugh. And he is received so everywhere. He might very easily be even flegal adjutant. You know his majesty talks very cordially with him. Annette and I have talked it all over. It might be very easily arranged. What do you think? Pierre glanced at Prince André, and seeing that this conversation did not please his friend, made no reply to her. When are you going? he asked. Ah, don't speak of going. Don't speak of it. I do not wish to hear a word of it exclaimed the princess, in the same capriciously vivacious tone in which she had spoken to Ippolit. It was obviously out of place in the family circle, in which Pierre was an adopted member. Today, when it came over me that I had to break off from all these pleasant relations, and then, you know, André, she blinked her eyes significantly at her husband. J'ai pour, j'ai pour, she whispered. A shiver ran down her back. Her husband looked at her with a surprised expression, as though for the first time he had noticed that anyone besides himself and Pierre had come into the room. Then with a cool politeness he addressed his wife inquiringly. "'What is it that you are afraid of, Lisa? I cannot understand,' said he. "'Now how selfish all you men are! All! All selfish! Simply from his own whim, God knows why, he deserts me, shuts me up in the country alone.' "'With my father and sister. Don't forget that,' said Prince Andrei, gently. 
all alone, just the same, away from my friends, and he expects me not to be afraid. Her tone grew querulous. Her lip was lifted, making the expression of her face not mirthful but repulsive and like a squirrel's. She paused, as though she regarded it as indecorous to speak of her condition before Pierre, though it was the real secret of her fear. And still I do not understand why vous avez Pierre, drawled Prince André, letting his eyes rest on his wife. The princess blushed and spread open her hands with a gesture of despair. Non, André, j'ai des coups vous avez tellement, tellement changé. Your doctor bids you to go to bed earlier, said Prince André. You had better retire. The princess made no answer, and suddenly her short, downy lip trembled. Prince André, shrugging his shoulders, got up and began to walk up and down the room. Pierre gazed through his glasses with naive curiosity, first at him, then at the princess, and made a motion as though he also would get up, but then changed his mind. "'What difference does it make to me if Monsieur Pierre is here?' suddenly exclaimed the little princess, and her pretty face at the same time was contracted into a tearful grimace. "'I have been wanting for a long time to ask you, André, why you have changed toward me so. What have I done to you? You are going to the army. You are not sorry for me at all. Why is it?' "'Lise!' exclaimed Prince André, but this one word carried an entreaty, a threat, and above all a conviction that she herself would regret what she had said. But she went on hurriedly. "'You treat me as though I were ill, or a child. I see it all. You were not so six months ago.' "'Lise, I beg of you to stop,' said Prince André, still more earnestly. Pierre, growing more and more stirred as this conversation proceeded, arose and went to the princess. He could not, it seemed, endure the sight of tears, and he himself was ready to weep. Calm yourself, princess. This is only your fancy, because, I assure you, I myself have experienced, and so, because. No, excuse me, a stranger is in the way. No, calm yourself. Goodbye. Prince André detained him, taking him by the arm. No, stay, Pierre. The princess is so kind that she will not have the heart to deprive me of the pleasure of spending the evening with you. Yes, he only thinks about his own pleasure, exclaimed the princess, not restraining her angry tears. Lise, said Prince André, dryly, raising his voice sufficiently to show that his patience was exhausted. Suddenly, the angry, squirrel-like expression on the princess's pretty little face changed to one of alarm, both fascinating and provocative of sympathy. Her beautiful eyes looked from under her long lashes at her husband, and there came into her face that timid look of subjection, such as a dog has, when it wags its drooping tail quickly but doubtfully. "'Mon Dieu! Mon Dieu!' muttered the princess, and gathering up the skirt of her dress with one hand, she went to her husband and kissed him on the forehead. Bonsoir, Lise, said Prince André, getting up and courteously kissing her hand as though she were a stranger. The friends were silent. Neither the one nor the other felt like being the first to speak. Pierre looked at Prince André. Prince André rubbed his forehead with his slender hand. Let us have some supper said he, with a sigh, getting up and going to the door. They went into the elegant dining-room, newly furnished in the richest style. Everything, from the napkins to the silver, the faience and the glassware, had that peculiar imprint of newness which is characteristic of the establishment of a young couple. In the midst of supper, Prince André leaned forward on his elbows, and— like a man who has for a long time had something on his heart and suddenly determines to confess it, he began to talk with an expression of nervous exasperation such as Pierre had never before beheld in his friend. Never, never get married, my friend. This is my advice to you. Do not marry until you have come to the conclusion that you have done all that is in your power to do and until you have ceased to love the woman whom you have chosen. 
until you have seen clearly what she is. Otherwise you will make a sad and irreparable mistake. When you are old and good for nothing, then get married. Otherwise, all that is good and noble in you will be thrown away. All will be wasted in trifles. Yes, 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 don't look at me in such amazement. If ever you have any hope of anything ahead of you, you will be made to feel at every step that, as far as you are concerned, all is at an end, all closed to you, except the drawing-room, where you will rank with the court lackeys and idiots. That's a fact. He made an energetic wave of his hand. Pierre took off his spectacles, and this made his face, as he gazed in amazement at his friend, even more expressive than usual of his goodness of heart. My wife, continued Prince André, is a lovely woman. She is one of those few women to whom one can feel that his honor is safely entrusted. But my God! what I would not give at this moment if I were not married. You are the first and only person to whom I have whispered this, and it is because I love you. Prince André, in saying this, was still less like the Bolkonsky who, that same evening, had been comfortably ensconced in Anna Pavlovna's easy chairs and murmuring French phrases as he blinked his eyes. Every muscle in his spare face was quivering with nervous animation. His eyes, in which before the fire of life seemed to be extinguished, now gleamed with a fierce and intense brilliancy. It was evident that, however lacking in life he might appear in ordinary circumstances, he more than made up for it by his energy at moments of almost morbid excitability. "'You cannot understand why I say this to you,' he went on. "'Why, it is the whole history of a life. "'You talk about Bonaparte and his career,' said he although Pierre had not said a word about Bonaparte. You talk about Bonaparte, but Bonaparte, when he was toiling, went step by step straight for his goal. He was free. He let nothing stand between him and his goal, and he reached it. But tie yourself to a woman, and your whole freedom is destroyed, as though you were a prisoner in chains. And in proportion as you feel that you have ambition and powers, the more you will be weighed down and tormented with regrets. Drawing-rooms, tittle-tattle, balls, vulgar show, meanness, such is the charmed circle from which it is impossible for me to make my escape. I am now getting ready to take part in the war, in the greatest war that ever was, and yet I know nothing and am fit for nothing. Je suis très aimable et très cause de coup, continued Prince André, and at Anna Pavlovna they hang upon my lips, and this stupid society, without which my wife cannot live, and these women. If you could only know what toutes les femmes destinguées and women in general amount to, my father is right. Egotism, ostentation, stupidity, meanness in every respect. Such are women when they show themselves in their real light. You see them in society and think that they amount to something, but they are not. 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 No. Don't marry, my dear heart. Don't marry, said Prince André in conclusion. It seems ridiculous to me, said Pierre, that you should regard yourself as incapable and your life as spoiled. Everything is before you. Everything. And you. He did not finish his sentence, but his very tone made it evident how highly he prized his friend and how much he expected from him in the future. How can he speak so, thought Pierre, who considered Prince André the model of all accomplishments, for the very reason that Prince André united in himself to the highest degree all those qualities that were lacking in Pierre, and which more nearly than aught else can express the concept, willpower. Pierre always admired Prince André's ability to meet with perfect ease all sorts of people. His extraordinary memory, his breadth of knowledge. He had read everything, he knew about everything, he had ideas on every subject. And, above all, his powers of work and study. And if Pierre was often struck by André's lack of aptitude for speculative philosophy, which was his own specialty, he at least regarded it not as a fault, but as a sign of strength. 
In all the best relations, however friendly and simple, flattery or praise is indispensable, just as grease is indispensable for making wheels move easily. Je suis un homme fini, said Prince André. What is there to say about me? Let us talk about yourself, said he, after a short silence, and smiling at his consoling thoughts. This smile was instantly reflected on Pierre's face. But what is there to say about me? asked Pierre, his lips parting in a careless, merry smile. What am I, anyway? Je suis un bâtard. And suddenly a purple flush dyed his cheeks. It was evident that he had exerted great effort to say that. Sans non, sans fortuna. And yet it is true. He did not say what was true. I am free for the present, and I like it. Only I don't know what to take up next. I should like to have a serious talk with you on the subject. Prince André looked at him with kindly eyes, but in his glance, friendly and flattering as it was, there was betrayed the consciousness of his superiority. I am fond of you, especially for the reason that you are the only living man in all our circle. You are happy. Choose whatever you like. It is all the same. You will be happy anywhere. But there's one thing. Stop going to those Kurrigans and leading their kind of life. That sort of thing does not become you. All those revels, that wild life and all. Que voulez-vous, mon cher? exclaimed Pierre, shrugging his shoulders. Les femmes, mon cher, les femmes. I don't understand it, replied André. Les femmes comme il faut. That is another thing. But such as have to do with Kurrigan. Les femmes et le va. I can't understand it. Pierre had been living at Prince Vasily Kurrigan's and had been taking part in the dissipated life of his son Anatole, the very same young man to whom it had been proposed to marry Prince André's sister in order to reform him. Do you know, said Pierre, as though a happy thought had come unexpectedly into his mind, seriously, I have been thinking about it for some time. Since I have been leading this sort of life, I have not been able to think or to come to any decision. My head aches. I have no money. This evening he invited me, but I did not go. Give me your word of honor that you will not go with him again. Here's my word on it. End of chapter 6 Part 1, Chapter 7 of War and Peace by Leo Tolstoy Translated by Nathan Haskell Doyle This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Marianne It was already two o'clock when Pierre left his friend. It was a luminous June night, characteristic of Petersburg. Pierre took his seat in the hired carriage, with the intention of going home, but the farther he rode, the more impossible he found it to think of sleeping on such a night, which was more like twilight or early morning. He could see far down through the empty streets. On the way it occurred to him that the gambling club were to meet as usual that evening, at Anatoly Kurrigan's, after which they were accustomed to have a drinking bout, topping off with one of Pierre's favorite entertainments. It would be good fun to go to Kurrigan's, said he to himself, but instantly he remembered that he had given Prince André his word of honor not to go there again. But, as it happens to men of no strength of character, this was immediately followed by such a violent desire to have one more last taste of this dissipated life, so well known to him, that he determined to go. And, in excuse for it, the thought entered his mind that his promise was not binding, because, before he had given it to Prince André, he had also promised Anatole to be present at his house. Moreover, he reasoned that all such pledges were merely conditional and had no definite meaning, especially if it were taken into consideration that perhaps by the next day he might be dead, or something might happen to him so extraordinary that the distinctions of honorable and dishonorable would entirely vanish. Arguments of this nature often occurred to Pierre, entirely upsetting his plans and purposes. He went to Kurrigan's. Driving up to the great house at the horse guard barracks, where Anatole lived, he sprang upon the lighted porch, ran up the steps, and entered the open door. There was no one in the entry. Empty bottles, cloaks, and overshoes were scattered about. There was an odor of wine. 
In some distant room he could hear loud talking and shouts. Play and supper were over, but the guests had not yet dispersed. Pierre threw off his cloak and went into the first room. Where were the remains of the supper? A single waiter, thinking that no one could see him, was stealthily drinking up the wine in the half-empty glasses. In a third room were heard the sounds of scuffling, laughter, the shouts of well-known voices, and the growl of a bear. Eight young men were eagerly crowding around an open window. Three were training with the cub, which one of their number was dragging by a chain and trying to frighten the others with. "'I bet a hundred on Stevens,' cried one. "'See that he doesn't hold on,' cried a second. "'I bet on Dolokhov,' cried a third. "'Get those fellows away from the bear, Kurigan. "'There, let Mishka go. The wager is here.' "'One pull, or he loses,' cried a fourth. "'Yakov, bring the bottle. "'Yakov!' cried the host of the evening, "'a tall, handsome fellow, "'standing in the midst of the crowd, "'in a single thin shirt, "'thrown open at the chest. "'Hold on, gentlemen. "'Here he is. "'Here is our dear friend, Petrushka,' "'he cried, turning to Pierre. "'A short man, with clear blue eyes, "'whose voice, among all those drunken voices, "'was noticeable for its tone of sobriety, "'shouted from the window.' Come here, and hear about the wagers. This was Dolokhov, an officer of the Semyonovsky regiment, a well-known gambler and bully, whose home was with Anatol. Pierre smiled, as he gaily looked around him. I don't understand at all. What's up? Hold on! He's not drunk! Bring a bottle, cried Anatol, and taking a glass from the table, went up to Pierre. First of all, drink. Pierre proceeded to drain glass after glass, at the same time closely observing and listening to his drunken companions, who had again crowded around the window. Anatol kept his glass filled with wine and told him how Dolokhov had laid a wager with Stevens, an English navalman who happened to be there, that he, Dolokhov, was to drink a bottle of rum sitting in the third-story window with his legs hanging out. "'There, now, drink it all,' said Anatol, handing the last glass to Pierre." I shan't let you off. No, I don't wish any more, replied Pierre, and pushing Anatole aside, he went to the window. Dolokhov was holding the Englishman by the arm, and was clearly and explicitly laying down the conditions of the wager, turning more particularly to Anatole and Pierre as they approached. Dolokhov was a man of medium height, with curly hair and bright blue eyes. He was twenty-five years old. Like all infantry officers, he wore no moustache, so that his mouth, which was the most striking feature of his face, was wholly revealed. The lines of the mouth were drawn with remarkable delicacy. The upper lip closed firmly over the strong lower one in a sharp curve at the center, and in the corners hovered constantly something in the nature of two smiles, one in each corner. And all taken together, and especially in conjunction with a straightforward, bold, intelligent look, made it impossible not to take notice of his face. Dolokhov was not a rich man, and he had no influential connections. But although Anatole spent ten thousand roubles a year, and it was known that Dolokhov lived with him, nevertheless he had succeeded in winning such a position that Anatole and all who were acquainted with the two men had a higher regard for him than for Anatole. Dolokhov played nearly every kind of a game, and almost always won. However much he drank, he never was known to lose his head. Both Kurigan and Dolokhov were at this time notorious among the rakes and spendthrifts of Petersburg. The bottle of rum was brought. Two lackeys, evidently made timid and nervous by the orders and shouts of the boon companions, tried to pull away the sash that hindered anyone from sitting on the outer slope of the window seat. Anatole, with his swaggering way, came up to the window. He wanted to smash something. He pushed the lackeys away and tugged at the sash, but the sash would not yield, so he broke the window panes. "'Now you try it, you man of muscle,' said he, turning to Pierre. Pierre seized hold of the crossbar, gave a pull, and the oaken framework gave way with a crash. "'Take it all out, or they'll think I clung to it,' said Dolokhov. "'The Englishman accepts it, does he? All right?' asked Anatole. All right, said Pierre, glancing at Dolokhov, who took the bottle of rum and went to the window, 
through which could be seen the sky where the evening and morning light were beginning to mingle. He leaped upon the window sill with the bottle in his hand. Listen, he cried, as he stood there, and looked back into the room. All were silent. I wager, he spoke French so that the Englishman might understand him, and spoke it none too well, either. I wager fifty imperials, or perhaps you prefer a hundred, he added, addressing the Englishman. No, fifty, replied the Englishman. Very well, then, fifty it is, that I will drink this whole bottle of rum without taking it once from my mouth, drink it sitting in this window, in that place there, he bent over and pointed to the sloping projection of the wall outside the window, and not holding on to anything. Is that understood? Very good. Anatole turned to the Englishman, and holding him by the button of his coat and looking down upon him, for the Englishman was of small stature, began to repeat the terms of the wager in English. Hold, cried Dolokhov, thumping the window with the bottle in order to attract attention. Hold, Kurgan, listen. If anyone else does the same thing, then I will pay down a hundred imperials. Do you understand? The Englishman nodded his head, though he did not make it apparent whether or no he were prepared to accept this new wager. Anatole still held him by the button, and, in spite of the nods that he made to signify that he understood all that was said, Anatole insisted on translating Dolokhov's words for him into English. A lean, young Lipusar, who had been playing a loser game all the evening, climbed upon the window, leaned over, and gazed down. Who? Ooh, ho, oh, he exclaimed as he looked down from the window to the flagstones below. Hush, cried Dolokhov, and he pulled the officer back from the window, who, getting his feet entangled in his spurs, awkwardly leaped down into the room. Placing the bottle on the window sill so as to be within reach, Dolokhov warily and coolly climbed into the window. Letting down his legs and spreading out both hands, he measured the width of the window, sat down, let go his hands, moved to the right, then to the left, and took up the bottle. Anatole brought two candles and set them on the window seat, although it was now quite light. Dolokhov's back, in the white shirt, and his curly head were illuminated on both sides. All gathered around the window. The Englishman stood in the front row. Pierre smiled and said nothing. One of the older men present suddenly stepped forward, with a stern and frightened face, and attempted to seize Dolokhov by the shirt. "'Gentlemen, this is folly. He will kill himself,' said this man, who was less foolhardy than the rest. Anatole restrained him. "'Don't touch him. You will startle him, and then he might fall. What if he should, eh?' Dolokhov turned around, straightening himself up, and again stretching out his hands. "'If anyone touches me again,' said he, hissing the words through his thin, compressed lips, I shall send him flying down there. So now. Thus having spoken, he resumed his former position, dropped his hands, and seizing the bottle, he lifted it to his lips, bent his head back, and raised his free arm as a balance. One of the lackeys, who had begun to clear away the broken glass, paused in his work, and, without straightening himself up, fixed his eyes on the window and Dolokhov's back. Anatole stood straight with staring eyes, the Englishman, thrusting out his lips, looked askance. The man who had tried to stop the proceeding repaired to one corner of the room and threw himself on a sofa, with his face to the wall. Pierre covered his eyes, and the feeble smile still hovering over his lips now expressed horror and apprehension. All were silent. Pierre took his hand from his eyes. Dolokhov was still sitting in the same position, only his head was thrown farther back, so that the curly hair in the nape of his neck touched his shirt-collar, and his hand, holding the bottle, was lifted higher and higher, trembling under the effort. The bottle was evidently nearly empty, and consequently had to be held almost perpendicularly over his head. Why should it take so long? thought Pierre. It seemed to him as though more than a half-hour had elapsed. Suddenly Dolokhov's body made a backward motion, and his arm trembled nervously. This tremor was sufficient to make him slip as he sat on the sloping ledge. In fact, he slipped, and his arm and head wavered more violently as he struggled to regain his balance. 
He stretched out one hand to clutch the window seat, but refrained from touching it. Pierre again covered his eyes and declared to himself that he would not open them again. Suddenly he was conscious that there was a commotion around him. He looked up. Dolokhov was standing on the window seat. His face was pale but radiant. Empty! He flung the bottle at the Englishman, who cleverly caught it on the fly. Dolokhov sprang down from the window. He exhaled a powerful odor of rum. Capital! Bravo! That's a wager worth having. The devil take you all! were the voices that rang from all sides. The Englishman, taking out his purse, was counting out his money. Dolokhov was scowling and had nothing to say. Pierre started for the window. "'Gentlemen, who wants to make the bet with me? I will do the same thing,' he cried. "'But there's no need of any wager. Give us a bottle. I will do it anyway. Bring a bottle.' "'Hold on, hold on,' said Dolokhov, smiling. "'What's the matter with you? Are you beside yourself? We won't let you. It makes you dizzy even on a staircase,' were shouted from various sides. "'I will drink it. Give me a bottle of rum,' cried Pierre, pounding on the table with drunken resolution, and climbing into the window. He was seized by the arm, but his strength was so great that whoever approached him was sent flying across the room. "'No, you will never dissuade him that way,' said Anatole. "'Hold on. I will throw dust in his eyes. "'Listen, I will make the wager with you, but tomorrow. "'But now we are all going to blanks.' "'Come on,' cried Pierre. "'Come on, and we will take Mishka with us.' And seizing the bear, he began to gallop round the room with him. End of chapter 7 Part 1, Chapter 8 of War and Peace by Leo Tolstoy Translated by Nathan Haskell Doyle This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Marianne Prince Vasily fulfilled the promise which he had made to the Princess Drubetskaya when she asked him on the evening of Anna Pavlovna's reception to help her only son, Boris. The request had been preferred to the emperor, and contrary to the experience of many others, he was allowed to enter the Semyonovsky regiment of the guard as ensign. But in spite of all Anna Mikhailovna's efforts and intrigues, Boris failed of his employment as adjutant or attaché to Kutuzov. Shortly after Anna Pavlovna's reception, the princess returned to Moscow and went straight to her rich relations, the Rostovs, at whose house she always stayed when visiting in Moscow, and where her idolized Borenka had been educated from early childhood and had lived some years, waiting to be transferred from the line to his position as ensign of the guard. The guard had already left Petersburg on the 22nd of August, and the young man, delayed in Moscow by his uniform and outfit, was to join his regiment at Radzivilov. The Rostovs were celebrating the fete day of the mother and the youngest daughter, both of whom were named Natalia. Since morning there had been an unceasing stream of carriages coming and going with guests, who brought their congratulations to the countess's great mansion on the Povarskaya so well known to all Moscow. The countess herself and her eldest daughter, a beautiful girl, were in the drawing-room receiving the guests, whose places were constantly filled by newcomers. The countess Rostova was a woman of forty-five, of a thin oriental type of countenance, and evidently worn out by her cares as mother of a family of a dozen children. Her deliberateness of motion and speech, which arose from her lack of strength, gave her a certain appearance of dignity that commanded respect. The Princess Anna Mikhailovna Drubetskaya, in her capacity of friend of the family, was also in the drawing-room, helping to receive the company and join in the conversation. The young people were in the rear rooms, not considering it incumbent upon them to take part in receiving the visitors. The Count met the guests and escorted them to the door again, urging them all to dine with him. Very, very much obliged to you, ma chère, or mon cher. Ma chère and mon cher, he said to all without exception, without the slightest shadow of difference whether his guest stood high or low in the social scale. Much obliged to you for myself and for my dear ones, whose name day we are celebrating. See here, I come back to dinner. You'll affront me if you do not, mon cher. Cordially I invite you, and my whole family join with me, mon cher. 
These words he repeated to all, without exception or variation, with an unchanging expression on his round, jolly, and clean-shaven countenance, and with a monotonously firm grip of the hand, and with repeated short bows. Having escorted a guest to his carriage, the Count would return to this, that, or the other visitor, still remaining in the drawing-room, dropping down on a chair with the aspect of a man who understands and enjoys the secret of life, he would cross his legs in boyish fashion, lay his hands on his knees, and shaking his head significantly, would send forth his conjectures concerning the weather, or exchange confidences about health, sometimes speaking in Russian, sometimes in very exorable but self-confident French, and then again with the air of a weary man, who is nevertheless bound to fulfill all obligations, he would go to the door with still another departing guest, straightening the thin gray hairs on his bald head, and dutifully proffering the invitations to dinner. Sometimes returning through the entry to the drawing-room, he would pass through the conservatory and butler's room to the great marble hall, where covers were laid for eighty guests, and glancing at the butlers who were bringing the silver and china, setting the tables and unfolding the damask table linen, he would call to him Dmitri Vesalievich, a man of noble family, who had charge of all his affairs, and would say, Well, well, Mitenka, see that everything is all right. That's good. That's good, he would say, glancing with satisfaction on the huge extension table. The principal thing is the service. Very good. Very good. And with a deep sigh of satisfaction, he would go back to the drawing room once more. Maria Lavovna Karagin and her daughter, announced the countess's footman, in a thundering bass voice, coming to the door. The countess was thoughtful for a moment, and took a pinch of snuff from a gold snuff-box ornamented with a portrait of her husband. "'I am tired to death of these callers,' said she. "'Well, this is the last one I shall receive. She is very affected. "'Ask her to come in,' she said to the footman, in a mournful voice, as though her words had been, "'If I must be killed, kill me now.' A tall, portly, haughty-looking lady, in a rustling train, came into the drawing-room, followed by her round-faced, smiling young daughter. "'Dear Countess, it has been such a long time. She has been ill in bed. Le pauvre enfant. Ou belle de raison mousqui. Et la comtesse à praxine. J'ai et si oreza. Such were the phrases spoken by lively feminine voices, and mingling with the rustle of silks and the moving of chairs. That sort of conversation had begun which is, by unanimous consent, maneuvered in such a way that at the first pause the visitor is ready to get up with the rustling garments to murmur, Je sais bien charmé. La santé de maman. À la comtesse à praxine. And again, with rustling garments, to be to retreat into the entry, to throw on the shuba or the cloak, and to depart. The conversation was turning on the chief item of city news at that time, namely, the illness of the famous old Count Bozokoy, one of the richest and handsomest men of Catherine's time, and also about his illegitimate son, Pierre, the same young man who had behaved in such an unseemly manner at Anna Pavlovna's reception. "'I am very sorry for the old Count,' said one of the ladies. "'His health is so wretched, and now to have to suffer this mortification on account of his son— it will be the death of him. What is that? asked the countess, as though she were not aware of what the visitor was talking about, although she had heard fifty times already the cause of Count Bezakoy's mortification. It all comes from the present system of education, sending them abroad, pursued the lady. This young man has been left to shift for himself, and now they say that he has been carrying on so horribly in Petersburg that the police had to interfere and send him out of the city. "'Pray, tell us about it,' urged the countess. "'He made a bad choice of friends,' remarked the Princess Anna Mikhailovna. "'Prince Vasily's son, this Pierre, and a young man named Dolokhov, they say, have been doing, heaven only knows what, but all of them have had to suffer for it. Dolokhov has been reduced to the ranks, and Bezakoy's son has been sent to Moscow, and Anatole Kurigan has been taken in charge by his father.' At all events, he has been sent away from Petersburg. Yes, but what is it, pray, that they did? asked the countess. They acted like perfect cutthroats, especially Dolokhov, said the visitor. 
He is a son of Maria Ivanovna Dolokhova, such an excellent woman. Just think of it. Can you imagine it? The three of them somehow got hold of a bear, took it with them into a carriage, and carried it to the house of some actresses. The police hastened to apprehend them. They seized the officer and tied him back to back to the bear, and then threw the bear into the Moskva. The bear started to swim, with the police officer on his back. Capital, mon cher, what a figure this officer must have cut, cried the Count, bursting with laughter. Oh, how terrible! What can you find to laugh at, Count? But the ladies had to laugh in spite of themselves. It was with difficulty that they rescued the unfortunate man, pursued the visitor, and to think that a son of Count Kirill Vladimirovich Bezakoy should find amusement in such intellectual pursuits, she added sarcastically. But they say that he is so well educated and so clever. That shows what educating young men abroad makes of them. I hope that no one will bring him here, though he is so rich. They wanted to give him an introduction to me. I most decidedly refused. I have daughters, you know. What made you say that this young man was so rich? asked the countess, bending away from the younger ladies, who immediately pretended not to hear what she was saying. You see, he has only illegitimate children, it appears, and Pierre is also illegitimate. The guest waved her hand. I imagine he has a score of them. The Princess Anna Mikhailovna took part in the conversation, with the evident desire of showing off her powerful connections and her acquaintance with all the details of high life. And this is the truth of the matter, said she, significantly, and also in a half-whisper. Count Kirill Vladimirovich's reputation is notorious. As for his children, he has lost count of them, but this Pierre was his favorite. How handsome the old man, said the countess, and only last year, too. I never saw a handsomer man. Now he is very much changed, said Anna Mikhailovna. As I was going to say, on his wife's side, Prince Vasily is the direct heir to all his property, but the old man is very fond of Pierre, has taken great pains with his education, and has written to the emperor about him, so that no one knows if he should die. He is so weak that it may happen any moment, and Dr. Lorraine has come up from Petersburg. No one knows, I say, which will get his colossal fortune, Pierre or Prince Vasily. He has forty thousand souls and millions. I know all about this because Prince Vasily himself told me. Yes, and besides, Kirill Vladimirovich is my great uncle on my mother's side, and he is also Boris's godfather, she added, pretending that she attributed no significance to this circumstance. Prince Vasily came to Moscow yesterday. He is on some official business, I was told, said the guest. Yes, but entre nous, said the princess, it's a mere pretext. He has come principally on account of Count Kirill Vladimirovich, because he knew that he was so sick. At all events, mon cher, that's a splendid joke, said the Count, and perceiving that the elderly visitor did not hear him, he turned his attention to the young ladies. Charming figure, that cut by the police officer. I can imagine it. And as he waved his arms in imitation of the unfortunate police officer, he again burst into a ringing bass laugh which made his portly frame fairly shake, as is the way with men who always live well, and especially those who indulge in generous wines. So glad to have you dine with us, said he. End of chapter 8 Part 1, Chapter 9 of War and Peace by Leo Tolstoy Translated by Nathan Haskell Doyle This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Marianne A silence ensued. The countess looked at the guest, smiling pleasantly, but nevertheless making no pretense of the fact that she would not be sorry if she got up and took her departure. The daughter was already arranging her dress and looking inquiringly at her mother, when suddenly there was heard in the next room the noise of several persons running towards the door, then the catching and upsetting of a chair, and instantly into the drawing-room darted a maiden of thirteen holding something in her short muslin skirt. She halted in the middle of the room, and it was evident that her wild frolic had carried her farther than she had intended. At the same instant there appeared in the door a student with a crimson collar, a young officer of the guard, a maiden of fifteen, and a plump, rosy-faced little boy in a frock. 
The Count jumped up, and swinging his arms, threw them around the little girl who had come running in. "'Ah, here she is!' he cried with a jolly laugh. "'Her name day, mon cher, her name day!' "'Mon cher, il y a un temps pour tout,' said the Countess, feigning severity. "'You are always spoiling her, Elie,' she added, addressing her husband. "'Bonjour, mon cher. Je vois Felicite,' said the visitor. "'Coulez de ses enfants,' she added, turning to the mother. The little maiden, with her black eyes and her large mouth, was not pretty, but was full of life, her childish shoulders still breathlessly rising and sinking from the effort of her exciting running were bare. Her dark locks were thrown back in confusion. She had thin, bare arms, and wore pantalettes trimmed with lace, and low slippers on her dainty feet. She was at that charming age when the girl is no longer a child, but when the child is not yet a young lady. Tearing herself away from her father, she ran to her mother, and giving no heed to her stern reproof, hid her blushing face in the lace folds of her mother's mantilla, and went into a fit of laughter. The cause of her laughter was the doll which she took out from under her skirt, trying to tell some fragmentary story about it. "'Do you see? It's my doll. <laughs> Mimi. You see?' And Natasha was unable to say any more. It seemed to her so ludicrous." She leaned on her mother and laughed so merrily and infectiously that all, even the conceited visitor, in spite of herself, joined in her amusement. "'Now, run away, run away with your monster,' admonished the mother, pushing away her daughter, with pretended sternness. "'She is my youngest,' she added, turning to the visitor. Natasha, for a moment raising her face from her mother's lace mantle, glanced up at the stranger through her tears of laughter, and again hid her face. The visitor, compelled to admire this family scene, felt it incumbent upon her to take some part in it. "'Tell me, my dear,' said she, turning to Natasha, "'what relation is this Mimi to you? She is your daughter, I suppose?' Natasha was offended by the condescending tone in which the lady addressed her. She made no reply, and looked solemnly at her. Meantime, all the young people mentioned, the officer, who was none other than Boris, the son of Princess Anna Mikhailovna, Nikolai, the student, the Count's oldest son, Sonya, the Count's fifteen-year-old niece, and the little Petrusha, his youngest boy, all crowded into the drawing-room, evidently doing their utmost to restrain within the bounds of propriety the excitement and merriment which convulsed their faces. It could be seen that there in the rear rooms, from which they had rushed so impetuously, they had been engaged in much more entertaining conversation than town gossip, the weather, and Comtesse Apraxine. Occasionally they would glance at one another and find it hard to refrain from bursting out laughing again. The two young men, the student and the officer, who had been friends from childhood, were of the same age and were both good-looking, but totally unlike each other. Boris was tall and fair, with regular, delicate features and a placid expression. Nikolai was a short, curly-haired young man, with a frank, open countenance. On his upper lip the first dark down had already begun to appear, and his whole face was expressive of impetuosity and enthusiasm. Nikolai's face had flushed crimson the moment he entered the drawing-room. It was plain to see that he strove in vain to find something to say. Boris, on the contrary, immediately regained his self-possession, and began to relate, calmly and humorously, how he had been acquainted with this Mimi Kolka when she was a fine young lady before her nose had lost its beauty, how since their acquaintance, begun five years before, she had grown aged and cracked as to the whole surface of her cranium. As he said this he looked at Natasha, but she turned away from him and looked at her little brother, who was squeezing his eyes together and shaking with suppressed laughter, and finding that the effort was beyond her power, snickered out loud and darted from the room as fast as her nimble little feet would carry her. Boris managed to preserve his composure. Maman, do you not want to go out? Shall I not order the carriage? he asked, turning to his mother with a smile. Yes, yes, 
Go and order it, please, said she, returning his smile. Boris quietly left the room and went in pursuit of Natasha. The plump little boy trotted sturdily after them, as though he was vexed at heart at the disarrangement made in his plans. End of chapter 9 Part 1, Chapter 10 of War and Peace by Leo Tolstoy Translated by Nathan Haskell Doyle This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Marianne Of the young people, not reckoning Miss Kurajina and the cousin's oldest daughter, who was four years older than her sister and regarded herself as already grown up, only Nikolai and the niece Sonya remained in the drawing-room. Sonya was a miniature little brunette, with a tawny tinted complexion especially noticeable on her neck and bare arms, which were slender but graceful and muscular. She had soft eyes shaded by long lashes, and she wore her black hair in a long braid twined twice about her head. By the easy grace of her movements, by the suppleness and softness of her slender limbs, and by a certain cunning and coyness of manner, she reminded one of a beautiful kitten, which promises soon to grow into a lovely cat. She evidently considered it the right thing to manifest her interest in the general conversation by a smile, but her eyes against her will shot glances of such passionate girlish adoration from under their long, thick lashes at her cousin, who was soon to join the army, that her smile could not for an instant deceive anyone, and it was plain to see that the kitten had only crouched down in order to jump and play all the more merrily with her cousin, as soon as the two followed the example of Boris and Natasha and left the drawing-room. "'Yes, ma chère,' said the old count, turning to Mrs. Kuragina and pointing to Nikolai. "'His friend Boris here has been appointed an officer of the guard, and they are such good friends that they cannot be separated, so he throws up the university and his old father, and is going into the military service, ma chère.' and yet there was a place all ready for him in the department of the archives, and all. That's what friendship is, concluded the Count, with a dubious shake of the head. Yes, there's going to be a war, they say, said the visitor. They have been saying so for a long time, replied the Count, and they will say so again, and keep saying so, and that will be the end of it. Mon cher, that's what friendship is, he repeated. He is going to join the hussars. The visitor, not knowing what reply to make, shook her head. It is not out of friendship at all, declared Nikolai, flushing up and spurning the accusation as though it were a shameful aspersion on his character. It is not from friendship at all, but simply because I feel drawn to a military life. He glanced at his cousin and at the young lady visitor. Both were looking at him with a smile of approbation. Colonel Schubert, of the Pavlogradsky Regiment of Hussars, is going to dine with us tonight. He has been home on leave of absence, and was going to take Nikolai back with him. What's to be done about it? asked the Count, shrugging his shoulders, and affecting to treat as a jest what had evidently occasioned him much pain. I have already told you, Papenka, said the lad, that if you do not wish me to go, I will stay at home— but I know that I am not good for anything except the army. I cannot be a diplomatist or a chinovic. I can't hide what I feel. And as he said this, he glanced, with a handsome young fellow's coquetry, at Sonya and the young lady visitor. The kitten feasted her eyes on him, and seemed ready at a second's notice to play and show all her kittenish nature. "'Well, well, let it go,' said the old count, He's all on fire. This Bonaparte has turned all their heads. They all think what an example he gave them in rising from a lieutenant to be an emperor. Well, good luck to them, he added, not noticing his visitor's sarcastic smile. They began to talk about Napoleon. Julie Karagina turned to young Rostov. How sorry I was that you didn't come last Thursday to the Arkharovs. It was lonesome there without you, said she, giving him an affectionate smile. The young man, much flattered, drew his seat nearer to her and engaged the smiling Julie in a confidential conversation, entirely oblivious that this coquettish smile cut as with a knife the jealous heart of poor Sonya, who flushed and tried to force a smile. 
In the midst of this conversation he happened to glance at her. She gave him a look of passionate anger, and, scarcely able to hold back her tears, and with the pretended smile still on her lips, got up and left the room. All Nikolai's animation deserted him. He availed himself of the first break in the conversation, and with a disturbed countenance left the room in search of Sonya. "'How the secrets of these young folks are sewed with white threads!' exclaimed Anna Mikhailovna, nodding in the direction of the vanishing Nikolai. "'Cousinage dangereux visionage,' she added. "'Yes,' replied the countess, when, as it were, the very light of the sun had departed from the room, together with these young people, and then, as though she were answering a question which no one had asked, but which was constantly in her mind, "'How much suffering!' How much unrest must be gone through with in order that at last we may have some joy in them. And even now, truly, there's more sorrow than joy. You're always in apprehension, always in apprehension. This is the age when there are so many perils for both young girls and for boys. It all depends upon the education, said the visitor. Yes, you are right, continued the countess. So far I have been, thank God the confidant of my children, and enjoy their perfect confidence, declared the countess, repeating the air of many parents who cherish the illusion that their children have no secrets in which they do not share. I know that I shall always be my daughter's chief confidant, and that Nicolina, even with his impetuous nature, if he does play some pranks, as all boys will, still, there is no danger of his being like those Petersburg young men. Yes, they're splendid, splendid children, emphatically affirmed the Count, who always settled every question too complicated for him by finding everything splendid. But what's to be done? He wanted to go into the hussars. What would you have, mon cher? What a charming creature your youngest girl is, said the visitor. Like powder. Yes, like powder, said the Count. She resembles me, and what a voice she has. Although she is my daughter, yet I am not afraid to say that she is going to be a singer, a second Salomini. We have engaged an Italian master to teach her. Isn't she too young yet? They say it is injurious for the voice to study at her age. Oh, no. Why do you consider it too early? exclaimed the Count. Didn't our mothers get married when they were twelve or thirteen? And she's already in love with Boris. Just think of it, said the Countess looking at the princess with a sweet smile. Then, apparently answering a thought that constantly occupied her, she went on to say, Well, now, you see, if I were too strict with her, if I were to forbid her, God knows what they might be doing on the sly. She meant they might exchange kisses. But now I know everything they say. She comes to me herself every evening and tells me all about it. Maybe I spoil her, but indeed this seems to be the best plan. I kept a too strict reign over my eldest daughter. Yes, I was brought up in an entirely different way, said the oldest daughter, the handsome Countess Viera, smiling. But the smile did not add to the beauty of her face, as often happens. On the contrary, it lost its natural expression and therefore became unpleasant. She was handsome, intelligent, well-bred, well-educated. Her voice was pleasant. What she said was right and proper enough, and yet, strange to say, her mother and all the others looked at her as though surprised at her saying such a thing, and regarded it as one of the things that had better have been left unsaid. People always try to be very wise with their eldest children, try to accomplish something extraordinary, said the visitor. How naughty to prevacate, mon cher. The little countess tried to be very wise with Viera, said the count. Well, on the whole, she has succeeded splendidly, he added, winking approvingly at his daughter. The visitors got up and took their departure, promising to return to dinner. What manners! I thought they were going to stay forever, remarked the countess, after she had seen her visitors to the door. End of chapter 10 Part 1, Chapter 11 of War and Peace by Leo Tolstoy Translated by Nathan Haskell Doyle this LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Marianne. When Natasha left the drawing-room, she ran only as far as the conservatory. 
There she paused, listening to the chatter in the drawing-room and expecting Boris to follow her. She was already beginning to grow impatient and stamped her foot, on the very verge of crying because he did not follow her instantly, when she heard the noisy, deliberate steps of a young man. Natasha hastily sprang between some tubs of flowers and concealed herself. It was Boris, who paused in the center of the room, looked around him, brushed the dust from the sleeve of his uniform, and then, going to the mirror, contemplated his handsome face. Natasha, holding her breath, peered out from her hiding place and waited to see what he would do. He stood for some moments in front of the mirror, then, smiling with satisfaction, went toward the entrance door. Natasha was just about to call to him, but then she thought better of it. Let him find me, she said to herself. As soon as Boris had left the conservatory, Sonya came in from the other door, all flushed and angrily muttering to herself. Natasha restrained her first impulse to run to her and kept in her hiding place, as though under an invisible cap, looking at what was going on in the world. She was experiencing a new and peculiar enjoyment. Sonya was still muttering something and looking expectantly towards the drawing-room. Then Nikolai made his appearance. "'Sonya, what is the matter? How can you do so?' asked the lad, going up to her. "'No, no, leave me alone!' and Sonya began to sob. "'Well, I know what the trouble is. "'If you know, so much the better. Go back to her, then.' "'Sonya, one word. How can you torment me and torment yourself for a mere fancy?' asked Nikolai, taking her hand. Sonya did not withdraw her hand and ceased weeping. Natasha, not moving and hardly breathing, peered from her concealment. "'What will they do now, I wonder?' she said to herself. "'Sonya, the whole world is nothing to me. Thou alone art all to me,' said Nikolai. "'And I will prove it to thee. I don't like it when you talk so with—' "'Well, I won't do so any more. Only forgive me, Sonya.' He drew her to him and kissed her. "'Ah, how nice,' thought Natasha, and when Sonya and Nikolai had left the room, she followed them and called Boris to her. "'Boris, come here,' said she, with her face full of mischievous meaning. "'I want to tell you something. Here, come here,' she said, and drew him into the conservatory, to the very place among the tubs where she had been hiding. Boris, smiling, followed her. "'What may this something be?' he inquired. She grew confused, glanced around her, and espying the doll which she had thrown on one of the tubs, she took it up. "'Kiss the doll,' said she. Boris looked down into her eager face with an inquiring, gracious look and made no reply. "'Don't you care to? Well, then come here,' said she, and made her way deeper among the flowers, at the same time throwing away the doll. "'Near, nearer,' she whispered. She seized the officer's coat by the cuff, and her flushed face expressed eagerness and apprehension. "'Then will you kiss me?' she whispered, so low as hardly to be heard, looking up at him and smiling, and almost crying with emotion. Boris reddened. "'How absurd you are!' he exclaimed, but he bent over to her, reddening still more violently, but not quite able to make up his mind whether to do it or not. Natasha suddenly sprang on a tub, so that she was taller than he, threw both slender bare arms around his neck, and by a motion of her head, tossing back her curls, kissed him full on the lips. Then she slipped away between the flower-pots, and hanging her head, stood still on the other side. "'Natasha,' said he, "'you know that I love you, but—' "'Are you in love with me?' asked Natasha, interrupting him. "'Yes, I am.' But please, let us not do this again. In four years, then I will ask for your hand. Natasha pondered. Thirteen, fourteen, fifteen, sixteen, said she, reckoning on her delicate fingers. Good, then it is decided. And a smile of joy and satisfaction lighted up her animated face. Yes, it is decided, said Boris. Forever and ever, said the girl, till death itself and taking his arm, she went with a happy face into the divan room with him. End of chapter 11
Part One, Chapter Twelve of War and Peace by Leo Tolstoy, translated by Nathan Haskell Doyle. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Marianne. The countess was now so tired of receiving that she gave orders not to admit any more visitors, and the Swiss was told to invite any one else who came to return to dinner. The countess was anxious to have a confidential talk with the friend of her childhood, the Princess Anna Mikhailovna. Whom she had scarcely seen since her return from Petersburg, Anna Mikhailovna, with her rather sad but pleasant face, drew her chair nearer to the countess. "I will be perfectly frank with you," said she. "We have very few of our old friends left, and that's why I prize your friendship so highly." She glanced at Viera and paused. The countess pressed her hand, then, turning to her eldest daughter, who was evidently not her favorite, she said. Vera, haven't you any perception at all? Cannot you see that you are in the way? Go to your sisters, or. The handsome Vera smiled scornfully, evidently not feeling the least offended. If you had only told me sooner, Mamenka, I should have gone immediately," said she, and she left the room. But as she was going past the divan room, she saw that two couples were snugly ensconced in the embrasures of the two windows. She paused and smiled satirically. Sonya was sitting close by Nikolai, who was copying some verses in her honor, the first he had ever written. Boris and Natasha were sitting in the other window and stopped talking as Viera passed. Both of the girls looked up at her with guilty yet happy faces. It was both amusing and touching to see these two girls, so head over ears in love. But the sight of them evidently did not rouse pleasant thoughts in Vera's mind. How many times have I asked you not to touch my things? Said she. You have your own room, and she took the inkstand away from her brother. Wait a minute, wait a minute," said he, dipping his pen. You always succeed in doing things at just the wrong time," exclaimed Vera. There you come running into the drawing room so that every one was mortified on your account. In spite of the fact, or perhaps because what she said was perfectly true, no one made her any reply, and all four only exchanged glances among themselves. Viera lingered in the room, holding the inkstand in her hand. And how can such young things as Natasha and Boris and you two have secrets? It's all nonsense. Well, what concern is it of yours, Viera? Asked Natasha in a gentle voice, defending herself. She was evidently more than ordinarily sweet, and well disposed to every one just at the time. It's very stupid," said Viera. "I blush for you. What sort of secrets? Every one has his own. We don't disturb you and Berg," said Natasha hotly. "I suppose you don't disturb me," said Viera, "and because you can't find anything improper in my behavior. But I'm going to tell Mamenka how you behaved to Boris." Natalia Ilyanishna behaves very well to me," said Boris. "I cannot complain of it." Stop, Boris! You are such a diplomat. The word diplomat was in great vogue among the young people, with a special meaning which they gave to it. It's very annoying," said Natasha, in an offended and trembling voice. "Why should she worry me so? He will never understand such things," she added, turning to Viera, "because you never were in love with any one." You have no heart. You are only Madame de Genies. This was a nickname considered very insulting, which had been first applied to Viera by Nikolai. And your chief pleasure is to cause other people annoyance. You may flirt with Berg as much as you please," she said spitefully. Well, at all events, you don't find me running after a young man in the presence of visitors. There, now, you have done what you wanted," interrupted Nikolai. You have said all sorts of unpleasant things and disturbed us all. Let's go to the nursery. All four, like a frightened bevy of birds, jumped up and flew out of the room. It's you who have been saying unpleasant things, but I haven't said anything to anyone," cried Viera. Madame de Genlis, Madame de Genlis, shouted the merry voices from the other room through the open door. The handsome Viera. Who found a sort of pleasure in doing these unpleasant and irritating things, smiled, 
evidently undisturbed by what was said of her, went to the mirror and rearranged her sash and hair. As she caught a glimpse of her pretty face, she became to all appearances cooler and more self-satisfied. Meantime, the ladies in the drawing-room continued their talk. Ah, cher, said the countess, in my life, tu ne paros. I cannot help seeing that at the rate we are going, our property will not hold out much longer. And then his club, and his easy ways. Even if we live in the country, how much rest do we get? Theatricals, hunting, and heaven knows what all. But what's the use of my talking? Now tell me how you manage to get along. I often marvel at you, Annette. How is it that you, at your time of life, fly about so in your carriage, alone, in Moscow, in Petersburg, to all the ministers, to all the notables, and succeed in getting around them all? I marvel at it. Now tell me, how do you do it? I cannot understand it at all. Ah, my dear heart, replied the Princess Anna Mikhailovna, may God forbid that you ever learn by experience what it is to be left a widow, and without any protector, with a son whom you adore. You get schooled to everything, she went on to say, with some pride. My lawsuit has given me a great experience. If I need to see any bigwig, I write a note. Princess Untel desires to see such and such a person, and I myself go in a hired carriage, twice, three times, four times, until I get what I need. It is a matter of indifference to me what they think of me. Well, now, how was it? Whom did you apply to for Borenka? asked the countess. There he is already an officer of the guard, and my Nikolushka is going merely as a yunker. There was no one to work for him. Whom did you ask? Prince Vasily. He was very kind. He immediately consented to do all in his power, and he laid the matter before the emperor said the Princess Anna Mikhailovna, entirely forgetting, in her enthusiasm, all the humiliation through which she had passed for the attainment of her ends. "'Prince Vasily must have aged somewhat,' queried the Countess. "'I have not seen him since our theatricals at the Rumyatsovs. I suppose he has entirely forgotten me.' "'Il m'a fusé la cour,' she added with a smile. "'He is just the same as ever,' replied Anna Mikhailovna, polite and full of compliments. His head hasn't been turned at all by his elevation. I am grieved that it is such a small thing to do for you, my dear princess, said he. You have only to command me. No, he's a splendid man, and a lovely relative to have. But you know, Nathali, my love for my boy, I don't know what I would not do for his happiness. But my means are so small for doing anything." continued the princess, in a melancholy tone, lowering her voice. They are so small that I am really in a most terrible position. My unlucky lawsuit eats up all that I have, and is no nearer to an end. I have nothing, you can imagine it, a la lette. I haven't a kopeck, and I don't know how I shall get Boris his uniform. She drew out her handkerchief and began to weep. I must have five hundred roubles, and all I have is a twenty-five rouble bill. That's the position I am in. I have only one hope now. In Kirill Vladimirovich Buzakoy. If he will not help out his godson, for you see, he stood sponsor to Boris, and grant him something for his support, that all my pains will have been lost. I shall not have enough to pay for his uniform. The countess shed some sympathetic tears, and sat silently pondering. Maybe it's a sin, said the princess, but I often think, there is Count Kira Buzakoy, living alone, that enormous fortune, and why does he live on? Life is a burden for him, while Boris is only beginning to live. He will probably leave something to Boris, said the countess. God only knows, cher ami, these rich men and grandees are so selfish, but, nevertheless, I am going right away to see him with Boris, and I am going to tell him plainly how things are. Let them think what they please of me. It is all the same to me, when my son's fate depends upon it. The princess got up. It is now two o'clock, and you dine at four. 
I shall have plenty of time to go there. And with the decision of the true Petersburg lady of business, who knows how to make the best use of her time, she called her son and went with him to the entry. Good-bye, dear heart, she said to the countess, who accompanied her to the door. Wish me luck, she added in a whisper, so that her son might not hear. So you are going to Count Kirill Vladimirovitch, ma chère, said the count, coming out from the dining-room into the entry. If he is better, ask Pierre to come and dine with me. You see, he used to be here a great deal, and danced with the children. Now we shall see how splendidly Taras will do by us to-day. He declares that Count Orloff never had such a dinner as we are going to have. End of chapter 12 Part 1, Chapter 13 of War and Peace by Leo Tolstoy Translated by Nathan Haskell Doyle This Slippervox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Marianne Mon cher Boris, said the Princess Anna Mikhailovna to her son, as the Countess Rostova's carriage, in which they were riding, rolled along the straw-covered street and entered the wide court of Count Kirill Vladimirovich Buzakoy's residence. Mon cher Boris, said the mother, stretching out her hand from under her old mantle and laying it on her son's with a timid and affectionate gesture. Be amiable and considerate. Count Kirill Vladimirovich is your godfather, and your prospects depend upon him. Remember this, mon cher. Be as nice as you can be. If I knew that anything would come from this except humiliation, replied the son coldly, but I have given you my promise, and I do it for your sake. Though it was a respectable carriage that drove up to the steps, the Swiss, noticing the lady's well-worn mantle, looked askance at mother and son, who without sending the footman to announce them had walked straight into the mirror-lined vestibule between two rows of statues standing in niches, and asked them who they wished to see, the young princesses or the count, and when they said the count, he told them that his excellency was worse and could not receive any one to-day. Then let us go, said the son in French. Mon ami, exclaimed the mother, in a supplicating voice, again laying her hand on his arm, as though her touch had the effect of calming or encouraging him. Boris said no more, but without removing his cloak, looked dubiously at the mother. My dear, said the princess, in a wheedling tone, turning to the Swiss, I know that Count Kirill Vladimirovich is very ill. That is why I came. I am a relative of his. I do not wish to disturb him, my dear. I only wanted to know. See Prince Vasily Sergeyevich. I understand that he is here. Be so good as to announce us. The Swiss gruffly pulled the bell cord and turned away. Princess Dubetskaya for Prince Vasily Sergeyevich he called to the footman in small clothes, pumps, and dress coat, who ran to the head of the stairs and looked over from above. The princess straightened the folds of her dyed silk dress, glanced at the massive Venetian mirror on the wall, and firmly mounted the carpeted staircase in her old worn shoes. Mon cher, vous me va promis, said she, turning round to her son and encouraging him with a touch of her hand. The young man, dropping his eyes, silently followed her. They went into a hall which led into the suite of rooms occupied by Prince Vasily. Just as the mother and son started to walk through this room, and were about to ask the way of an elderly footman, who had sprung to his feet on their approach, the bronze doorknob of one of the heavy doors turned, and Prince Vasily himself, dressed in a velvet fur-trimmed coat with a single star, as though he were at home, came in, escorting a handsome, black-bearded man. This man was the celebrated Petersburg doctor Lorraine. C'est un positif, the prince was saying. Mon prince, errare humanum est, mais, replied the doctor, who swallowed his R's and spoke the Latin words to air is human with a strong French accent. C'est bien, c'est bien. Perceiving Anna Mikhailovna and her son, Prince Vasily dismissed the doctor with a bow, and advanced in silence and with an inquiring look toward them. The son noticed that his mother's eyes suddenly took on an expression of deep concern and grief, and he laughed in his sleeve. 
Under what melancholy circumstances we meet again, Prince. Well, how is our dear invalid? said she, as though she did not notice the cold, insulting glance fastened upon her. Prince Vasily looked questioningly at her, and then at Boris, as though he were surprised to see them there. Boris bowed civilly. Prince Vasily, entirely ignoring it, replied to Anna Mikhailovna's question by a significant motion of his head and lips, giving her to understand that there was very slim hope for the sick man. "'Is it possible?' cried Anna Mikhailovna. "'Ah, oh, this is terrible, fearful to think. "'This is my son,' she added, pointing to Boris. "'He was anxious to thank you in person.' Boris again bowed politely. "'Be assured, Prince, that a mother's heart will never forget what you have done for us.' "'I am glad if I have been able to be of service to you, my dear Anna Mikhailovna,' said Prince Vasily, adjusting his frill and manifesting both in tone and manner here in Moscow before Anna Mikhailovna, whom he had put under deep obligation, a far more consequential air than at Petersburg at Annette Scherer's reception. "'Do your best to serve with credit and prove yourself deserving,' he added, turning to Boris. "'I am glad. Are you here on leave of absence?' he asked in an apathetic tone. "'I am waiting for orders, Your Excellency, before setting out for my new position,' replied Boris, manifesting not the slightest resentment of the prince's peremptory tone, nor any inclination to pursue the conversation, but bearing himself with such dignity and deference that the prince gave him a scrutinizing glance. "'Do you live with your mother?' "'I live at the Countess Rostova's,' said Boris, again taking pains to add, your Excellency. It is that Ilya Rostov, who married Nathalie Shashina, said Anna Mikhailovna. I know, I know, returned Prince Vasily, in his monotonous voice. I could never understand how Nathalia made up her mind to marry that unlicked bear, a perfectly stupid and absurd creature, and a gambler besides, they say. Mais très brave somme, mon prince, remarked Anna Mikhailovna, smiling with a touching smile as though she, too, knew very well that Count Rostov deserved such an opinion of him, but did her best to say a good word for the poor old man. "'What do the doctors say?' asked the princess, after a short silence, and again allowing an expression of deep grief to settle upon her careworn face. "'Very little hope,' said the prince. "'I wanted so much to thank my uncle once more, for all his kindnesses to me and Boris. He's his godson.' she added in French, in such a tone as though this piece of information must be highly delightful to the prince. Prince Vasily sat pondering and knitting his brows. Anna Mikhailovna realized that he was apprehensive, lest she were a rival for the Count's inheritance. She hastened to reassure him. "'If it were not for my true love and devotion to my uncle,' said she, uttering the words, "'my uncle,' with remarkable effrontery and unconcern." I know his noble, straightforward character, but, you see, he has only the young princesses with him. They are both so inexperienced. She inclined her head and added in a whisper, Has he yet fulfilled the last duty, prince? How precious are these last moments! Things couldn't be worse. He should be prepared at once if he is so ill. We women, prince, she smiled with self-importance, always understand how to put these things— it's indispensable that I should see him, however hard it may be for me. But then, I am accustomed to sorrow. The prince evidently knew only too well, just as he had known at Annette Scherer's, that he would have no little difficulty in getting rid of Anna Mikhailovna. This interview might be injurious to him, Cher Anna Mikhailovna. Better wait till evening. The doctors have been expecting a crisis." But it is impossible to wait, prince, at such moments. Pensez, il y avait du salut de son homme. Ah, c'est terrible. Les devoirs d'un chrétien. A door opened, and from an inner chamber appeared one of the count's nieces, a young lady with a sour, cold face, and with a waist disproportionately long for her stature. Prince Vasily went toward her. Well, how is he? "'Just about the same. But what could you expect? "'This noise,' said the princess, staring at Anna Mikhailovna as though she were a stranger. 
Ah, oh, cher, I did not recognize you, exclaimed Anna Mikhailovna, with a beaming smile, and ambling lightly forward toward the Count's niece. I have just come, and I am at your service to help you take care of my uncle. I can imagine how much you have suffered, she added, still in French, and sympathetically turning up her eyes. The Count's niece made no reply, nor did she even smile, but immediately left the room. Anna Mikhailovna took off her gloves and established herself in an armchair as though ready to endure a siege, and motioned to the prince to sit down near her. Boris, she said to her son, with a smile, I am going to see the Count, my uncle. In the meantime, mon ami, you go and find Pierre, and don't forget to give him the invitation from the Rostovs. They asked him to dinner. I think very likely he may not wish to come, she suggested, turning to the prince. On the contrary, returned the prince, evidently very much annoyed. I should be very glad to have him taken off my hands. He stays in his own room. The count has not asked for him once. He shrugged his shoulders. A footman conducted the young man downstairs, and then up, by another flight, to Pierre's quarters. End of chapter 13 Part 1, Chapter 15 of War and Peace by Leo Tolstoy Translated by Nathan Haskell Doyle this LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Marianne. Pierre had not succeeded in choosing a career for himself when he was sent to Moscow on account of his disorderly conduct. The story which had been related at Count Rostov's was correct. Pierre had been one of the young men who had tied the policeman on the bear's back. He had arrived in Moscow a few days previous and taken up his abode as usual in his father's house. Although he foresaw that the story would be noised abroad in Moscow, and that the ladies who formed his father's household, and who were always hostile to him, would take advantage of this occurrence to irritate the Count against him, he nevertheless, on the very day of his arrival, started to go to his father's apartments. As he went into the drawing-room, where the princesses usually sat, he stopped to pay his respects to the ladies, who were there busy with their embroidery frame and in listening to a book which one of them was reading aloud. There were three of them. The oldest, a severely prim old maid with a long waist, the very one who had made the descent upon Anna Mikhailovna, was the reader. The younger ones, both rosy-cheeked and rather pretty, and exactly alike, except that one of them had a little mole on her lip, decidedly adding to her beauty, were engaged at the embroidery frame. Pierre was received like a ghost, or a leper. The oldest princess ceased reading, and silently looked at him with eyes expressive of alarm. The one without the mole did the same. The third, who had the mole, and some sense of the ludicrous, bent over the embroidery to conceal a smile, caused by what she thought promised to be an amusing scene. She drew the thread down, and bent over, as though studying the pattern, but in reality to hide her laugh. "'Bonjour, mon cousine,' said Pierre. "'Vous ne me reconnaissez pas?' "'I know you very well, altogether too well.' "'How is the Count? Can I see him?' asked Pierre, awkwardly as usual, but still not disconcerted. "'The Count is suffering, both physically and mentally, and it seems you have taken pains to cause him the greater part of his moral suffering.' "'Can I see the Count?' repeated Pierre. Hm. "'If you desire to kill him, to kill him out and out, then you can see him. "'Olga, go and see if the bullion is ready for Uncle. It is high time,' she added, "'making Pierre see by this that they were wholly absorbed in caring for his father, "'while he, on the contrary, was palpably bent on annoying him.' "'Olga left the room. Pierre stood still.' looking at the sisters, and then said with a bow, "'Then I will go back to my room. As soon as it is possible you will please tell me.' He went out, and behind his back was heard the young princess's laugh, ringing but not loud. On the next day came Prince Vasily, and put up at the Count's. He called Pierre and said to him, "'Mon cher, si vous vous condescez, ici comme Petersburg. Vous finirez très mal. C'est tout ce que vous dites. The Count is very ill. Very ill. It is imperative that you should not see him. 
From that time Pierre had been left severely alone, and spent his days in solitude, upstairs in his own rooms. At the moment that Boris appeared at the door, Pierre was walking up and down his room, occasionally pausing in the corners and making threatening gestures at the walls, as though trying to thrust through some unknown enemy, and looking savagely over his spectacles, and then again beginning his promenade, muttering indistinct words, shrugging his shoulders, and spreading out his hands. L'Angleterre a vécu, he was declaiming, with a frown and pointing at some imaginary person with his finger. Monsieur Pitt, comme traître à la nation et à droit des jeunes, et comme d'amnia. But he had no time to complete his denunciation of Pitt, spoken by himself, personating his hero Napoleon, in whose company he imagined himself crossing the perilous Dover Straits and already taking London by storm, before he caught sight of a handsome, well-built young officer coming towards him. He stopped short. Boris was a lad of fourteen when he had last seen him, and he did not recognize him at all. But, nevertheless, he seized him by the hand in his impulsive, cordial way, and smiled affectionately. "'Do you remember me?' asked Boris, calmly, with a pleasant smile. "'I came with my mother to see the Count, but it seems he is too ill to receive us.' "'Yes, he is very ill. They keep him stirred up all the time,' returned Pierre, striving to recollect who this young man was. Boris was certain that Pierre did not recognize him, but he did not think it necessary to tell him his name, and without manifesting the slightest awkwardness he looked him full in the face. "'Count Rostov invites you to dine with him this afternoon,' said he, after a rather long silence that made Pierre feel uncomfortable. "'Ah, Count Rostov!' exclaimed Pierre, joyfully. "'Then you are his son, Ilya. At the first instant I did not recognize you, as you can easily imagine. Do you remember how you and I and Madame Jacot used to go out walking on the Sparrow Hills, years ago?' "'You are mistaken,' said Boris deliberately, and with a bold and rather derisive smile. I am Boris, the son of the Princess Anna Mikhailovna Drubetskaya. Rostov's father is named Ilya, and his name is Nikolai, and I never knew Madame Jocot. Pierre made a gesture with his hands and head, as though he were driving away mosquitoes. Ah, it is so indeed. I have mixed everything all up. I have so many relatives in Moscow. So you are Boris? Yes. Well, you and I seem to have begun with a misunderstanding. Well, what do you think of the expedition to Bologna? It will go pretty hard with the English, if only Napoleon crosses the Channel, won't it? I think the expedition is feasible, if only Villeneuve doesn't fail him. Boris knew nothing about the Bologna expedition. He had not read the newspapers and this was the first time he had ever heard of Villeneuve. "'We here in Moscow are more taken up with dinners and gossip than with politics,' said he, in his calm, satirical tone. "'I know nothing about such things. Moscow is given over especially to tittle-tattle,' he went on to say. "'Now you and the Count are the talk.' Pierre smiled his good-natured smile, as though to depreciate anything unpleasant which his companion might be likely to say." but Boris spoke with due circumspection, clearly and dryly, looking straight into Pierre's eyes. "'Moscow likes to do nothing better than talk gossip,' he repeated. "'All are solicitous about knowing to whom the Count is going to leave his property, and yet, very possibly, he will outlive all of us. I hope so with all my heart.' "'Yes, this is all very trying,' interrupted Pierre. "'Very trying.' Pierre all the time was apprehensive lest this young officer should unexpectedly turn the conversation into some awkward channel. "'But it must seem to you,' said Boris, flushing slightly, but not allowing his voice or his manner to vary. "'It must seem to you that all take an interest in this simply because they hope to get something from the estate.' "'Here it comes,' thought Pierre. "'I expressly wish to tell you, lest any misunderstanding should arise,' that you are entirely mistaken if you consider me and my mother in the number of these people. We are very poor, but I at least say this on my own account for the very reason that your father is rich, 
that I do not consider myself a relative of his, and neither I nor my mother would ask or even be willing to receive anything from him. Pierre for some time failed to comprehend, but when the idea dawned on him, he leaped from the sofa, seized Boris under the arm with characteristic impetuosity and clumsiness, and while he reddened even more than the other, he began to speak with a mixed feeling of vexation and shame. Now, this is strange. I, then, indeed, and who would have ever thought? I know very well. But Boris again interrupted him. I am glad that I have told you all. Perhaps it was disagreeable to you. You will pardon me, said he, soothing Pierre, instead of letting himself be soothed by him. I hope that I have not offended you. It is a principle with me to speak right to the point. What answer am I to give? Will you come to dinner to the Rostovs? And Boris, having acquitted himself of a difficult explanation, and got himself out of an awkward position by putting another into it, again became perfectly agreeable. Now, look here, listen, said Pierre, calming down. You are a remarkable man. What you have just said is very good. Very good. Of course you don't know me. We have not met for a long time. We were still children. You might have had all sorts of ideas about me. I understand you. Understand you perfectly. I should not have done such a thing. I should not have had the courage. But it is excellent. I am very glad to have made your acquaintance. Strange, he added, after a short silence and smiling. Strange that you should have had such an idea of me. He laughed. Well, who knows? We shall get better acquainted, I beg of you. He pressed Boris's hand. Do you know, I have not seen the Count yet. He has not asked for me. It is trying to me as a man, but what can I do about it? And do you think that Napoleon will succeed in getting his army across? Asked Boris with a smile. Pierre understood that Boris wanted to change the conversation, and taking his cue, he began to expound the advantages and disadvantages of the Bologna expedition. A footman came to summon Boris to his mother. The princess was ready to start. Pierre, looking affectionately through his spectacles, promised to come and dine with the Rostovs, so as to get better acquainted with Boris, whose hand he pressed warmly as they parted. After he was left alone, Pierre still paced for a long time up and down the room, no longer threatening an invisible enemy with the sword, but smiling at the thought of this likable young man who was so intelligent and clever and decided. As often happens in early youth, and especially when a man is lonesome, he felt an inexplicable affection for the lad, and promised himself that they should become good friends. Prince Vasily escorted the princess to the door. The good lady held her handkerchief to her eyes, and there were traces of tears on her cheeks. "'This is terrible, terrible!' she exclaimed. "'But, so far as in me lay, I fulfilled my duty. I will come back and spend the night. It is impossible to leave him in such a state. Every moment is precious. I cannot understand why the princesses have delayed about it. Perhaps God will enable me to find some means of preparing him. Adieu, mon prince. Que les bon Dieu vous soutienne. Adieu, ma bonne, replied Prince Vasily, as he turned away from her. Ah, he is in a frightful state, said the princess to Boris, after they had again taken their seats in the carriage. He scarcely knows anyone. I cannot understand, mamenka, what his feelings are in regard to Pierre. Can you? asked the son. Everything will be made clear by his will, my dear. Our fate also depends upon that. What makes you think he is going to leave anything to us? Ah, my dear, he is so rich, and we are so poor. Well, that is a most inconclusive reason, Mamenka. Ah, my God, my God, how ill he is, exclaimed the mother. End of chapter 14 Part 1 Chapter 15 of War and Peace by Leo Tolstoy Translated by Nathan Haskell Doyle This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Marianne After Anna Mikhailovna and her son had gone to Count Bezukhoi's, 
The Countess Rostova sat for some time alone, applying her handkerchief to her eyes. At last she rang the bell. "'What is the matter with you, my dear?' she demanded severely of the maid, who had kept her waiting several minutes. "'Don't you care to serve me? If not, I can find another place for you.' The Countess was greatly affected by her old friend's grief and humiliation, and therefore she was out of sorts, as could be told by her speaking to the maid by the formal we, you, and Milia, dear. Beg pardon, said the girl. Ask the Count to come to me. The Count came waddling to his wife with a rather guilty look, as usual. Well, little Countess, what a sauté a Madeira of woodcock we are going to have, ma chère. I have been trying it. Terra's is well worth the thousand roubles that I give for him. It was well spent. He took a seat near his wife, with an affectation of bravery, leaning one hand on his knee and with the other rumpling up his gray hair. What do you wish, little countess? See there, my love, how did you get that spot on you? she said, pointing to his waistcoat. It is evidently some of your sauté, she added with a smile. See here, count, I need some money. His face grew mournful. Ah, little countess, and the Count made a great ado in getting out his pocket-book. "'I want a good deal, Count. I want five hundred roubles.' And she took her cambric handkerchief and began to rub her husband's waistcoat. "'You shall have it at once.' "'Hey there!' cried the Count, in a tone used only by men who are certain that those whom they command will rush headlong at their call. "'Send Matenka to me.' Matenka, the nobleman's son whom the Count had brought up, and had now put in charge of all his affairs, came with soft, noiseless steps into the room. "'See here, my dear,' said the Count, to the deferential young man as he entered the door. "'Bring me—' he hesitated. "'Yes, bring me seven hundred roubles. Yes, and see here, don't bring such torn and filthy ones as you do sometimes, but clean ones. They are for the Countess.' "'Yes, Matenka, please see that they are clean.' said the Countess, with a sigh. "'Your Excellency, when do you wish them?' asked Matenka. "'You will deem to know that—' "'However, don't allow yourself to be uneasy,' he added. Perceiving that the Count was already beginning to breathe heavily and rapidly, which was always a sign of a burst of rage, "'I had forgotten. Will you please to have them this instant?' "'Yes, yes, instantly. Bring them. Give them to the Countess.' What a treasure Matinka is, he added with a smile as the young man left the room. He never finds anything impossible. That is a thing I cannot endure. All things are possible. Ah, money, Count, money. How much sorrow it causes in the world, exclaimed the Countess. But this money is very important for me. Little Countess, you are a terrible spendthrift, declared the Count, and kissing his wife's hand, he disappeared again into his own apartment. When Anna Mikhailovna returned from her visit to Buzukhoi, the money, all in new clean banknotes, was laying on a stand under a handkerchief in the countess's room. Anna Mikhailovna noticed that the countess was excited over something. "'Well, my dear?' asked the countess. "'Oh, he's in such a terrible state. You would never know him. He is so ill, so ill.' I stayed only a short minute, and didn't say two words. "'Annette, for heaven's sake, don't refuse me,' suddenly exclaimed the Countess, taking out the money from under the handkerchief, while her old, thin, grave face flushed in a way that was strange to see. Anna Mikhailovna instantly understood what she meant, and was already bending over so as to embrace the Countess gracefully at the right moment. "'It is from me to Boris, for his outfit,' Anna Mikhailovna interrupted her by throwing her arms around her and bursting into tears. The Countess wept with her. They wept because they were friends, and because they were kind-hearted, and because, having been friends from childhood, they were now occupied with such a sordid matter as money, and because their youth had passed. But theirs were pleasant tears. End of chapter 15 Part 1, Chapter 16 of War and Peace by Leo Tolstoy, translated by Nathan Haskell Doyle.
This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Marianne. The Countess Rostova, with her daughters and a considerable number of guests, were sitting in the drawing room. The Count had taken the men into his cabinet and was showing them his favorite collection of Turkish pipes. Occasionally he would go out and ask, Hasn't she come yet? They were waiting for Maria Dmitrievna Akrosimova, called in society La Terrible Dragon, a lady who was distinguished not for her wealth or her titles, but for the honesty of her character and her frank, simple ways. The imperial family knew her, all Moscow knew her, and all Petersburg, and both cities, while they laughed at her on the sly and related anecdotes of her brusque manners, nevertheless, without exception, respected and feared her. The conversation in the cabinet, which was full of smoke, turned on the war which had just been declared through a manifesto in regard to the recruiting. No one had, as yet, read the manifesto, but all were aware of its appearance. The Count was sitting on a low ottoman between two of his friends, who were talking and smoking. He himself did not smoke and did not talk, but, inclining his head now to one side, now to the other, he looked with manifest satisfaction at those who did, and listened to the conversation of his two friends, whom he had already set by the ears. One of the men was a civilian, with a wrinkled, sallow, lean and cleanly shaven face, Though he was approaching old age, he was dressed in the height of style, like a young man. He was sitting with his feet on the ottoman, like a man thoroughly at home, and holding the amber mouthpiece at one side of his mouth, was sucking strenuously at the smoke, and frowning over the effort. This was the old bachelor, Shinshin, the countess's own cousin, a venomous tongue, as it was said of him in Moscow drawing-rooms. He talked as though it were an act of condescension toward his opponent. The other, a fresh, ruddy young officer of the guard, irreproachably belted, buttoned, and barbered, held the mouthpiece in the middle of his mouth, and gently sucked the smoke through his rosy lips, sending it out in rings from his handsome mouth. This was Lieutenant Berg, an officer of the Semyonovsky regiment, with whom Boris was going to the army the very person about whom Natasha had teased Viera by calling him her lover. The Count was sitting between these two and listening attentively. The occupation that the Count enjoyed most, next to the game of Boston, of which he was very fond, was that of listener, especially when he had a chance to get two good talkers on the opposite sides of an argument. "'Well now, Batyushka, my most honorable Alfonso Kerlich said Shinshin, with a sneer, and, as his custom was when he talked, mixing up the most colloquial Russian expressions with the most refined French idioms. Your idea is to make money out of the state. You expect to get a nice little income from your company, do you? Not at all, Pyotr Nikolaitch. I only wish to prove that the advantages of serving in the cavalry are far less than in the infantry. You can now imagine my position, Pyotr Nikolaitch, Berg always spoke very accurately, calmly, and politely. His conversation invariably had himself as its central point. He always preserved a discreet silence when people were talking about anything that did not directly concern himself, and he could sit that way silently for hours, without feeling or causing others to feel the slightest sense of awkwardness. But as soon as the conversation touched any subject in which he was personally interested, he would begin to talk at length, and with evident satisfaction. Consider my position, Pyotr Nikolaitch. If I were in the cavalry, I should not receive more than two hundred a quarter, even with the rank of lieutenant. But now I get two hundred and thirty, said he, with a pleasant, joyful smile, glancing at Shinshin and the Count, as though it were plain for him that his success would always be an object of interest to everybody else. Moreover, Pyotr Nikolaitch, continued Berg, by being transferred to the guard, I am in sight. Vacancies in the infantry occur far more often. Then, you can see for yourself, on two hundred and thirty roubles a quarter, how well I can live. I can lay up some and send some to my father, too, he went on to say, puffing out a spiral of smoke. That's where the difference lies. A German can grind corn on the butt of his hatchet, as the proverb puts it, said Shinshin, 
shifting the mouthpiece of his pipe to the other side of his mouth and winking at the Count. The Count laughed heartily. The other guests, seeing that Shinshin was engaged in a lively conversation, crowded round to listen. Berg, remarking neither the quizzical nor indifferent looks of the others, proceeded to explain how, by his transfer to the guard, he would attain rank before his comrades of the corpus, how, in time of war, the company commanders were apt to be killed, and he, if left the senior in the company, might very easily become a captain, and how everybody in the regiment liked him, and how proud of him his papenka was. Berg evidently took great delight in telling all this, and he never seemed to suspect that other people had also their interests. But all that he said was so suavely serious, the naivete of his youthful egotism was so palpable, that he quite disarmed his auditors. Well, my lad, whether you are in the infantry or in the guard, you will get on, that I can predict, said Shinshin, tapping him on the shoulder and setting his feet down from the ottoman. Berg smiled with self-satisfaction. The Count, followed by his guests, passed into the drawing-room. It was the time, just before dinner is announced, when the assembled guests, in expectation of being summoned to partake of the Zakuska, are disinclined to entering any detailed conversation and, at the same time, feel that it is incumbent upon them to stir about and say something, in order to show that they are in no haste to sit down. The host and hostess keep watching the dining door and exchange glances from time to time. The guests try to read in those glances for whom or for what they are waiting, some belated influential connection, or for some dish that is not done in time. Pierre came in just before the dinner hour, and awkwardly sat down in the first chair that he saw, right in the middle of the drawing-room, so that he was in everybody's way. The countess tried to engage him in conversation, but he merely answered her questions in monosyllables, and kept looking naively around him through his spectacles, as though in search of someone. It was exceedingly annoying, but he was the only person who did not notice it. The majority of the guests, knowing about his adventure with the bear, looked curiously at this big, tall, quiet-looking man, and found it difficult to believe that such a burly, unassuming creature could have played such a trick on a police officer. "'Have you only just come?' asked the Countess. "'Oui, madame,' replied he, glancing around. "'You have not seen my husband?' "'No, madame.' and he smiled at absolutely the wrong time. "'You were in Paris lately, I believe. "'I think it is very interesting. "'Very interesting.' The countess exchanged glances with Anna Mikhailovna, who perceived that she was wanted to take charge of this young man. She took a seat by his side and began to talk to him about his father, but he answered her, just as he had the countess, merely in monosyllables. The other guests were all engaged in little groups, Le Razumonsky. That was charming. You are very good. La Comtesse Aprocassine were the broken phrases that were heard on all sides. The Countess got up and went into the hall. Is that you, Maria Dmitrievna? rang her voice through the hall. My own self, was the answer in a harsh voice, and immediately after, Maria Dmitrievna entered the room. All the young ladies, and even the married women, except those who were aged, rose. Maria Dmitrievna paused in the doorway. She was tall and erect, fifty years old, and wore her gray hair in ringlets. Under the pretext of turning back and adjusting the wide sleeves of her dress, she took a deliberate survey of all the guests. Maria Dmitrievna always spoke in Russian. "'Congratulations to the dear ones,' said she, in her loud, deep voice, which drowned all other sounds. "'Well, you old sinner, how are you?' she said, addressing the Count, who kissed her hand. "'I suppose you are bored to death in Moscow, eh? No chance to let out the dogs. Well, what's to be done, Batyushka, when you have these birds already grown up?' She waved her hand toward the young ladies. "'Whether you wish it or no, you have got to find husbands for them.' "'Well, my Cossack,' said she. Maria Dmitrievna always called Natasha the Cossack, smoothing Natasha's hair as she came running up to kiss her hand gaily and without any fear. 
I know that this little girl is a madcap, but I am fond of her all the same. She took out of a monstrous reticule a pair of pear-shaped amethyst earrings and gave them to the blushing Natasha in honor of her name-day. Then she turned immediately upon Pierre. He, he, my dear, come here, right here, she cried in a pretended gentle voice. Come here, my dear fellow, and she threateningly pulled her sleeve still higher. Pierre went to her, ingenuously looking at her through his spectacles. Come here, come, my dear fellow, I have been the only one who dared tell your father the whole truth when he required it, and now I shall do the same in your case. It's God's will. She paused. All held their breath, waiting for what was to come, and feeling that this was but the prologue. He's a fine lad, I must say, a fine lad, his father lying on his deathbed, and this young man amuses himself by tying a policeman on a bear's back. For shame, Batyushka, for shame! You would better have gone to the war. She turned away from him and gave her hand to the Count, who found it difficult to keep from laughing outright. Well, then, to dinner. It is ready, I believe, said Marya Dmitrievna. The Count led the way with Marya Dmitrievna, followed by the Countess, escorted by the Colonel of Hussars, a man to be made much of, since Nikolai was to join his regiment. Anna Mikhailovna went in with Shinshin. Berg gave his arm to Viera. The smiling Julie Karagina went with Nikolai to the table. Behind them followed the rest of the couples, making a long line through the hall, and the rear was brought up by the tutors and governesses, each leading one of the children. The waiters bustled about, chairs were noisily pushed back, an orchestra was playing in the gallery, and the guests took their places. The sounds of the Count's private band were soon drowned in the clatter of knives and forks, the voices of the guests, and the hurrying steps of the waiters. At the head of the table sat the Countess, Marya Dmitrievna at her right, Anna Mikhailovna at her left, then the other ladies. At the other end of the table sat the Count, with the Colonel of Hussars at his left, and Shinshin and the other men at his right. At one side of the long table were the young gentlemen and ladies, Viera next to Berg, Pierre and Boris together, all facing the children and their guardians on the other side. The Count, through the long line of decanters and vases with fruits, looked across to his wife and her towering headdress with its blue ribbons, and zealously helped his neighbors to wine, not forgetting himself. The Countess also, not neglecting the duties of a hostess, cast significant glances at her husband over the tops of the pineapples, and it seemed to her that his bald forehead and face were all the more conspicuously rubicund from the contrast of his grey hair. On the ladies' side there was an unceasing buzz of conversation. On the side of the men the voices grew louder and louder. And loudest of all talked the colonel of hussars, who ate and drank all that he could, his face growing more and more flushed, so that the Count felt called upon to hold him up to the other guests as an example. Berg, with an affectionate smile, was talking with Viera on the theme of love being not an earthly but a heavenly feeling. Boris was enlightening his new friend Pierre as to the guests who were at the table, and occasionally exchanged glances with Natasha, who was seated on the opposite side. Pierre himself said little, but he ate much, while he scanned the faces of the guests, Having been offered two kinds of soups, he had chosen turtle, and from the fish kulabyaka to the sauté of woodcock he did not refuse a single dish, or any of the wines which the butler offered him, thrusting the bottle mysteriously wrapped in a white napkin over his neighbor's shoulder, murmuring, dry Madeira, or Hungarian, or Rhine wine. He held up the first that he had happened to lay his hand upon, of the four wine glasses, engraved with the Count's arms, that stood before each guest, and drank rapturously, and the face that he turned upon the guests grew constantly more and more friendly. Natasha, sitting opposite, gazed at Boris, as young girls of thirteen only can on the lad with whom they have just exchanged kisses and are very much in love. Occasionally she let her eyes rest on Pierre, and this glance of the ridiculous little maiden, so lively in all her ways, almost made him feel like laughing, he could not tell why. Nikolai was seated at some distance from Sonya, and next to Julie Karagina, and was again talking with her with the same involuntary smile. 
Sonya also had a smile on her lips, but it was not natural, and she was evidently tortured with jealousy. First she turned pale, then red, and was trying with all her might to imagine what Nikolai and Julie were talking about. The governess was looking around nervously, as though ready to make resistance should anyone presume to injure her young charges. The German tutor was endeavoring to fix in his memory all the different courses, desserts, and wines, so as to give a full description of it when he rode home to Germany. He felt sorely grieved because the butler who had the bottle wrapped in the napkin passed him by. He frowned and tried to make it appear that he had no wish to taste that wine, and was only affronted because no one was willing to see that he needed the wine not for allaying his thirst, or from greediness, but from motives of mere curiosity. End of chapter 16 Part 1, Chapter 17 of War and Peace by Leo Tolstoy, translated by Nathan Haskell Doyle. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Marianne. At the men's end of the table, the conversation was growing more and more animated. The colonel was telling that the manifesto in regard to the declaration of war had already appeared in Petersburg, and that he had seen a copy of it, which had been brought that day by a courier to the commander-in-chief. "'Why the deuce should it behoove us to fight with Bonaparte?' exclaimed Shinshin. "'He has already made Austria talk very mild. I fear that now it will be our turn.' The colonel was a stout, tall German of sanguine temperament, but a thorough soldier and a patriot nevertheless. He felt affronted at what Shinshin said. "'But a vie, my dear sir,' said he, mispronouncing every word, "'inasmuch as the emperor knows that. In his manifest he says that he cannot look with indifference on the dangers threatening Russia, and that the safety of the empire and the sanctity of the allies,' and he put special emphasis on the word allies, as though it contained the whole essence of the matter. And then, with his infallible memory, trained by official life, he began to repeat the introductory clause of the manifesto. And as the emperor's wish and constant unalterable aim is to establish peace in Europe on lasting foundations, he has determined to move a portion of his army across the frontier and make every effort for the attainment of this design. And that is the reason, my dear sir, said he in conclusion, edifyingly draining his glass of wine and glancing at the count for encouragement. Do you know the proverb? Eurema, Eurema, you'd better stay at home and twirl the spindle, said Shinshin, frowning and smiling. That fits us to a tea. Even Surarov was cut all to pieces. And where shall we find a Surarov nowadays? What do you think about it? asked he incessantly changing from Russian to French. "'We must fight the last drop of our blood,' said the colonel, thumping on the table. "'We must be willing to perish for our emperor, and then all will be well. "'Und argue as little as possible, as little as possible,' he repeated, giving a strong stress to the word possible, and looking again at the count. "'That's the way the old hussars look at it. "'Und how do you look at it, young man?' and young hussar, he added, turning to Nikolai, who, quite neglecting his fair companion, now that the talk turned on the war, was looking with all his eyes at the colonel, and drinking in all that he had to say. "'I agree with you entirely,' returned Nikolai, in a glow, and turning his plate round and rearranging his wine-glasses, with a resolute and desperate face, as though at that very instant he were going to be called upon to face a great peril." I am convinced that we Russians must either conquer or die, said he, and then instantly felt just as the rest did after the words were out of his mouth, that he had spoken more enthusiastically and bombastically than the occasion warranted, and had, therefore, been guilty of a solecism. What you just said was splendid, said Julie, with a sigh. Sonya was all of a tremble, and blushed to her ears and even to her shoulders while Nikolai was speaking. Pierre listened to the colonel's speeches, and nodded his head in approval. "'Here, that's splendid,' said he. "'You're a real hussar, young man,' cried the colonel, again thumping on the table. "'What are you making such a noise about there?' suddenly spoke up Marya Dmitrievna, her deep voice ringing across the table. "'Why are you pounding on the table?' she demanded of the hussar. 
"'What are you getting so heated about, pray? "'One would really think that the French were right here before you.' "'I am telling the truth,' said the hussar, smiling. "'Always talking about the war,' cried the Count, across the table. "'You see, I have a son who is going. "'Maria Dmitrievna, my son is going. "'Well, I have four sons in the army, but I don't mourn over it. "'God's will rules all.' You may die at home lying on your oven, or God may bring you safe out of battle, rang Maria Dmitrievna's loud voice without any effort from the further end of the table. That is so. And the conversation was again confined among the ladies at their end of the table and among the men at theirs. You won't dare to ask it, said Natasha's little brother to her. I tell you, you won't dare. Yes, I will too, replied Natasha. Her face suddenly kindled and expressed a desperate and mischievous resolution. She started up with a glance, causing Pierre, who was sitting opposite to her, to listen, and addressing her mother. Mamma rang her childish chest voice across the table. "'What is it you wish?' asked the countess. Alarmed, but seeing by her daughter's face that it was some prank, she shook her finger sternly at her and shook her head warningly. There was a lull in the conversation. Mamma. "'What sort of pastry is coming?' cried the little voice, even more clearly and without any hesitation. The countess tried to look severe, but could not. Maria Dmitrievna shook her stout finger at the little girl. "'Cossack!' said she. The majority of the guests looked at the old ladies and did not know what to make of this freak. "'You will see what I shall do to you,' said the countess. "Mamma, tell me what pastry we are going to have,' cried Natasha again all in a giggle, and assured in her own merry little heart that her prank would not be taken amiss. Sonya and the stout little Petya were struggling with suppressed laughter. "'There, I did ask,' whispered Natasha to her little brother and to Pierre, on whom she again fastened her eyes. "'Ices, but you are not to have any,' said Marya Dmitrievna. Natasha saw that there was nothing to be afraid of, and therefore she had no fear of Marya Dmitrievna. Maria Dmitrievna, what kind of ices? I don't like ice cream. Carrot. No, what kind? Maria Dmitrievna, tell me what kind? She almost screamed. Maria Dmitrievna and the countess laughed, and the rest of the guests did the same. All laughed, not so much at Maria Dmitrievna's repartee as at the incomprehensible bravery and cleverness of the little girl who could and dared treat Maria Dmitrievna so. Natasha was made to hold her tongue only when she was told that they were to have pineapple sherbet. Before the ices were brought, champagne was handed around. Again the orchestra played. The Count exchanged kisses with his little countess, and the guests standing drank a health to the hostess, clinking their glasses across the table with the Count, with the children, and with each other. Again the waiters bustled about. There was the noise of moving chairs, and in the same order, but with more flushed faces, the guests returned to the drawing room and to the Count's cabinet. End of chapter 17. Part 1, Chapter 18 of War and Peace by Leo Tolstoy, translated by Nathan Haskell Doyle. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Marianne. The card tables were brought out, partners were selected, and the Count's guests scattered through the two drawing rooms, the divan room, and the library. The Count, having arranged his cards in a fan shape, found it difficult to keep from indulging in his usual after-dinner nap, and laughed heartily at everything. The young people, at the countess's instigation, gathered around the clavichord and the harp. Julie, first, by general request, played a piece with variations on the harp, and then she joined with the rest of the girls in urging Natasha and Nikolai, whose musical talent was known to all, to sing something, Natasha was evidently very much flattered by this request, and at the same time it filled her with trepidation. "'What shall we sing?' she asked. "'The fountain?' suggested Nikolai. "'Well, give me the music, quick. "'Boris, come here,' said Natasha. "'But where is Sonya?' She looked around, and seeing that her cousin was nowhere in the room, she started to find her. She ran into Sonya's room, and not finding her there, hastened to the nursery." but she was not there. 
Natasha then came to the conclusion that Sonya might be in the corridor on the great chest. The great chest in the corridor was the place of mourning for all the young women of the house of Rostov. There, in fact, Sonya was found in her airy pink frock, all crumpled, lying flat on her face on a dirty striped pillow that belonged to the nurse, and, hiding her face in her hands, was crying as though her heart would break, while her poor, bare shoulders shook under her sobs. Natasha's face, which had been so radiant all through her name day, suddenly changed. Her eyes grew fixed, then her throat contracted, and the corners of her mouth drew down. Sonya, what is the matter? Tell me what it is. What is the matter with you? Oh, oh. And Natasha, opening her large mouth and becoming perfectly ugly, cried like a child, without knowing any reason for it, except that Sonya was crying. Sonya tried to lift up her head, tried to answer, but found it impossible and hid her face again. Natasha sat down on the blue cushion and threw her arms around her dear cousin. At length Sonya put forth an effort, sat up, and began to wipe away her tears, saying, Nikolenka is going away in a week. His papers have come. He himself told me so. But I should not have wept. She held out a little piece of paper which she had been reading. It contained the verses which Nikolai had written for her. I should not have wept for that. But you cannot understand, no one can understand, what a noble heart he has. And once more her tears began to flow at the thought of what a noble heart he had. You are happy. I do not envy you. I love you, and Boris, too, she said, composing herself by an effort. He is good. For you there are no obstacles. But Nikolai is my cousin. We should have to the archbishop himself, else it would be impossible, and that if Mamenka, Sonya always regarded the countess as her mother and called her so, she will say that I am spoiling Nikolai's career, that I am heartless and ungrateful, and she would be right, too. But God is my witness. Here she crossed herself. I love her so, and all of you, except only Viera. And why is it? What have I done to her? I am so grateful to you that I would gladly make any sacrifice for you. But it's no use. Sonya could say no more, and again she buried her face in the cushion and her hands. Natasha tried to calm her, but it could be seen by her face that she understood all the depth of Sonya's woe. Sonya, she exclaimed, suddenly, as though surmising the actual reason of her cousin's grief. Truly, didn't Viera say something to you after dinner? Tell me. Nikolai wrote these verses himself, and I copied off some other ones, and she found them on my table, and said that she was going to show them to Mamenka, and she said, too, that I was ungrateful, that Mamenka would never let him marry me, and that he was going to marry Julie. You saw how he was with her all the time, Natasha. Why should it be so? And again she began to sob, more bitterly than before. Natasha tried to lift her up, threw her arms around her, and smiling through her tears, began to console her. Sonia, don't you believe her, dear heart? Don't believe her. Don't you remember we three and Nikolenka talked together in the divan room after lunch? Why we thought it all out, how it should be. I don't exactly remember how it was, but you know it will be all right, and everything can be arranged. There was Uncle Shinshin's brother married his own cousin, and we are only second cousins and Boris said that that was perfectly possible. You know I tell him everything, for he is so very clever and so kind, said Natasha. Now, Sonia, don't cry any more, dear dove, sweetheart, Sonia. And she kissed her and laughed merrily. Viera is spiteful, I'm sorry for her, but all will be well, and she won't say anything to Mamenka. Nikolenka himself will tell her, and then again, he doesn't care anything about Julie. And she kissed her on her hair. Sonya jumped up, and again the kitten became lively. Its eyes danced, and it was ready, waving its tail, to spring down on its soft little paws and to play with the ball again, as was perfectly natural for it to do. Do you think so? Truly? 
Do you swear it? said she quickly, smoothing her crumpled dress and hair. Truly, I swear it, replied Natasha, tucking an unruly tuft of curly hair back under her cousin's braid. Well, now, let us go and sing the fountain. Come on. But do you know, that stout Pierre who sat opposite me is so amusing, suddenly exclaimed Natasha, stopping short. Oh, it is such fun, and the girl danced along the corridor. Sonya, shaking off some down, and hiding the verses in her bosom, her face all aglow, followed Natasha with light, merry steps along the corridor into the divan room. According to the request of the guests, the young people sang the quartet, entitled The Fountain, which was universally acceptable. Then Nikolai sang a new song which he had just learned. The night is bright, the moon is sinking. How sweet it is to tell one's heart that someone in the world is thinking, My own true only love thou art. That she, her lovely hand is laying upon the golden harp tonight, while passionate harmonies are swaying her soul and thine to new delight. One day, two days, then paradise. Alas, thy love on her deathbed lies. He had hardly finished singing the last word, when preparations began to be made for dancing, and the musicians made their way into the gallery with a tramping of feet and coughing. Pierre was sitting in the drawing-room with Shinshin, who, knowing that he had recently returned from abroad, was trying to induce a political conversation that was exceedingly tedious to the young man. Several others had joined the group. When the music struck up, Natasha went into the drawing-room, and going straight up to Pierre, said, laughing and blushing, "'Mama told me to ask you to join the dancers.' "'I am afraid of spoiling the figures,' said Pierre, "'but if you will act as my teacher,' and he offered his big arm to the dainty damsel, though he was obliged to put it down very low. While the couples were getting their places, and the musicians were tuning up, Pierre sat down with his little lady. Natasha was perfectly delighted. She was going to dance with a big man who had just come from abroad. She sat out in front of everybody, and talked with him, exactly as though she were grown up. In her hand she had a fan which some lady had given her to hold, and with all the self-possession of an accomplished lady of the world, God knows when and where she had learned it, she talked with her cavalier, flirting her fan and smiling behind it. Well, well, do look at her, do look at her, said the countess, as she passed through the ballroom and caught sight of Natasha. The girl reddened and laughed. Now what is it, Mamma? What would you like? What is there extraordinary about me? In the midst of the third, Ecouzes, the chairs in the drawing-room, where the Count and Maria Dmitrievna were playing cards, were moved back, and a large number of the distinguished guests and the older people, stretching their cramped limbs after long sitting, and putting their portemonnaies and wallets into their pockets, came into the ballroom. First of all came the Count and Maria Dmitrievna, both with radiant faces. The Count with farcical politeness, as though in ballet fashion, offered the lady his bended arm. Then he straightened himself, and his face lighted with a peculiarly shrewd and youthful smile, and as soon as the last figure of the Ecouzes was danced through, he clapped his hands at the musicians and called out to the first violin, Semyon, do you know Daniel Cooper? This was the Count's favorite dance, which he had danced when he was a young man. More particularly, it was one of the figures of the Anglaise. Look at Papa! cried Natasha, loud enough to be heard all over the ballroom. She forgot entirely that she was dancing with a grown-up man. She bent her curly head over her knees and let her merry laugh ring out unchecked. Indeed, all who were in the hall gazed with a smile of pleasure at the jolly man standing with the dignified Marya Dmitrievna, who was considerably taller than her partner, holding his arms in a bow, straightening his shoulders, and turning out his toes, slightly beating time with his foot while a beaming smile spread more and more over his round face, and gave the spectators an inkling of what was to follow. As soon as the merry, fascinating sounds of Daniel Cooper were heard, reminding one of the national dance, the trepaca, all the doors of the ballroom were suddenly filled, on one side by the serving men belonging to the household, on the other with the women, 
all with smiling faces coming to look at their merry-hearted baron. "'Ah, our little father, an eagle!' exclaimed an old nurse, in a loud staccato, in one of the doors. The Count danced well, and he knew it, but his partner had absolutely no wish or ability to dance well. Her pretentious form was erect, her big hands hung down by her side. She had handed her reticule to the Countess. Only her stern but handsome face danced. What was expressed in the whole rotund person of the Count was expressed in Marya Dmitrievna merely in her ever more and more radiantly smiling face and loftier lifted nose. But while the Count, growing ever more and more lively, captivated the spectators by the unexpectedness of his graceful capers and the light gambols of his lissom legs, Marya Dmitrievna, by the slightest animation on her part, by the motion of her shoulders, or the bending of her arms in turning about or beating time, produced the greatest impression, for the very reason that everyone always felt a certain awe before her dignity of bearing and habitual severity. The dance grew livelier and livelier. The other dancers could not for an instant attract attention to themselves, and did not even try. All eyes were fastened on the Count and Marya Dmitrievna. Natasha kept pulling at the sleeves and dresses of all who were near her to make them look at her papenka, but even without this reminder— they would have found it hard to take their eyes off the two dancers. The Count, in the intervals of the dance, made desperate efforts to get his breath, waved his hands, and cried to the musicians to play faster. Quicker, quicker, and ever quicker, lighter, lighter, and even more lightly, gambled the Count, now on his toes, now on his heels, pirouetting around Marya Dmitrievna, and, at last, having conducted the lady to her place, he made one last paw, lifting his fat leg up from behind in a magnificent scrape, and bowing his perspiring head low, at the same time with a smiling face sweeping his arm round amid rapturous applause and laughter, especially on the part of Natasha. Both of the dancers paused, breathing heavily and wiping their heated faces with cambric handkerchiefs. "'That's the way we used to dance in our time, mon cher,' said the Count. "'Good for Daniel Cooper,' exclaimed Marya Dmitrievna, drawing a long breath and tucking back her sleeves. End of chapter 18 Part 1, Chapter 19 of War and Peace by Leo Tolstoy, translated by Nathan Haskell Doyle. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Marianne. At the very time when in the Rostov's ballroom they were dancing the sixth Anglaise, and the musicians from weariness were beginning to play out of tune, and the tired servants and cooks were preparing for the supper, Count Bezukhoi received his sixth stroke of apoplexy. The doctors declared that there was not the slightest hope of his rallying from it. The form of confession and communion was administered to the dying man, and preparations were making for extreme unction, while the mansion was filled with the bustle and expectation usual in such circumstances. Outside the house, around the doors, hidden by the throngs of carriages, gathered the undertakers, hoping to reap a rich harvest from the Count's obsequies. The military governor of Moscow, who had been assiduous in sending his adjutant to inquire for the Count, this evening came himself to bid farewell to the famous grandee of Catherine's time. The magnificent reception room was crowded. All stood deferentially, when the governor, who had been closeted for half an hour with the sick man, came out, slightly bowing in reply to the salutations, and endeavoring to pass as rapidly as possible by the doctors, priests, and relatives who fixed their eyes upon him. Prince Vasily, grown a trifle thinner and paler under the strain, accompanied the military governor, and was repeating something in an undertone. Having seen the distinguished caller to the door, Prince Vasily sat down alone in the hall, threw one leg over the other, resting his elbow on his knee, and covering his eyes with his hand. Having sat that way for some little time, he got up and with hasty, irregular steps, looking around with startled eyes, he passed through the long corridor that led to the rear portion of the house, to the room occupied by the oldest of the three princesses. The visitors in the dimly lighted reception room talked among themselves in low whispers, and relapsed into silence. Looking with eyes full of curiosity or expectation, 
when the door that led to the death chamber opened to let anyone pass in or out. The limit of his life, said a little old man, a priest, to a lady sitting near him and listening earnestly, the limit is fixed, he will not live beyond it. It seems to me it is late for extreme unction, is it not? asked the lady, adding the name of the priest. She affected to be unenlightened on this point. It is a great mystery, gentle lady, replied the priest, passing his hand over his bald forehead, on which still lay a few carefully brushed locks of grayish hair. Who is that? The governor of Moscow? someone asked at the other end of the room. What a young-looking man! But he's seventy years old. They say, don't they, that the Count doesn't recognize anyone any longer. Are they going to give him extreme unction? All I know is, he's had seven strokes. The second niece just came out of the sick chamber with weeping eyes, and sat down by Dr. Lorraine, who had assumed a graceful position under the portrait of the Empress Catherine, and sat with his elbow resting on the table. "'Beautiful weather, Princess, and this being in Moscow is like being in the country,' said the doctor in French. "'It is, indeed,' said the Princess with a sigh. "'Can he have a drink?' Lorraine pondered a moment. "'Has he taken his medicine?' "'Yes. "'Take a glass of boiled water, and add a pinch,' he indicated with his slender fingers what he meant by a pinch, "'of cream of tartar. "'I never heard of a gaze where a man survived more than a third stroke,' said a German doctor to an adjutant. "'What a constitution the man must have had,' said the adjutant. "'And who will get all his wealth?' he added in a whisper. Some one will be found to take it, replied the German with a smile. Again they all looked at the door. It opened to let the young princess pass with the drink which Lorraine had suggested for the sick man. The German doctor went over to Lorraine. Do you think he will last till tomorrow morning? he asked, in atrocious French. Lorraine thrust out his lips and made a motion of severe negation with his fingers in front of his nose. Tonight, at latest, said he in a low voice, with a slight smile of self-satisfaction at being able to understand and express the state of his patient. Then he went out. Meantime, Prince Vasily had opened the door to the princess's apartment. It was almost dark in the room. Two little lamps were burning before the holy pictures, and there was a pleasant odor of incense and flowers. The whole room was furnished with small articles of furniture, chiffoniers, cabinets, and little tables. Behind a screen could be seen the white curtain of a high-post bedstead. A little dog came running out and barking. "'Ah, is it you, mon cousin?' She got up and smoothed her hair, which, as always, was so extraordinarily smooth that one would have thought it made of one piece with her head, and then covered with varnish. "'What is it? What has happened?' she asked. "'You startled me so.' "'Nothing. There is no change.' I only came to have a talk with you, Katish, about business, said the prince, wearily sitting down in the chair from which she had just risen. How warm you are here, he exclaimed. However, sit down there. Let us talk. I thought something must have happened, said the princess, and she took a seat in front of him, with her face hard and stony as usual, and prepared to hear what he had to say. I was trying to get a nap, mon cousin, and I could not. "'Well, my dear,' said Prince Vasily, taking the princess's hand and doubling it over in a way peculiar to himself. It was evident that this, well, my dear, referred to a number of things, which, though unspoken, were understood by both of them. The princess, with her long, thin waist, so disproportionate to the rest of her body, looked at the prince full in the face from her prominent gray eyes. Then she shook her head and— with a sigh, glanced at the holy pictures. This action might have been taken as an expression of grief and resignation, or as an expression of weariness and hope of a speedy respite. Prince Vasily explained this action as an expression of weariness. "'That's the way with me,' said he. "'Do you suppose it's any easier for me? I am as played out as a post-horse. But still, I must have a talk with you, Katish, and a very serious one.' Prince Vasily became silent, and his cheeks began to twitch nervously, first on one side, then on the other, giving his face an unpleasant look 
such as it never had when he was in company. His eyes, also, were different from usual. At one moment they gleamed, impudently malicious, at the next a sort of fear lurked in them. The princess, holding the little dog in her dry, thin hands in her lap, scrutinized the prince sharply, but it was plain to see that she did not intend to break the silence by asking any question, even though she sat till morning. "'Do you not see, my dear princess and cousin, Katerina Sebyanovna, continued Prince Vasily, evidently bringing himself, not without an inward struggle, to attack the subject. At such moments as this, we must think about all contingencies. We must think about the future, about yourselves. I love all of you as though you were my own children. You know that. The princess gazed at him immovably, betraying no sign of her feelings. In a word, it is necessary, also, to think of my family, continued Prince Vasily, testily giving the stand a push. You know, Katish, that you three Mamontov sisters and my wife are the Count's only direct heirs. I know, I know how hard it is for you to speak and think about such things, and it is no easier for me. But, my dear, I am sixty years old. I must be ready for anything. Do you know that I have had to send for Pierre? The Count pointed directly at his portrait, signifying that he wanted to see him. Prince Vasily looked questioningly at the princess, but he could not make out whether she had comprehended what he had said to her or was simply looking at him. "'I do not cease to pray God for him, mon cousin,' she replied, "'that he will pardon him and grant his noble soul a peaceful passage from this—' "'Yes, of course,' hastily interposed Prince Vasily, rubbing his bald forehead and again testily drawing toward him the table that he had just pushed away. But, but, to make a long story short, this is what I mean. You yourself know that last winter the Count wrote a will by which all his property was left to Pierre, and all the rest of us were left out in the cold. But think how many wills he has made, replied the princess, calmly. Besides, he can't leave, make Pierre his heir, Pierre is illegitimate. Mon cher, said Prince Vasily, suddenly clutching the table in his excitement and speaking more rapidly. But supposing a letter has been written to the Emperor in which the Count begs to have Pierre legitimatized, do you understand that in view of the Count's services his petition would be granted? The Princess smiled that smile of superiority peculiar to people who think they know more about any matter than those with whom they are talking. I will tell you, moreover, pursued Prince Vasily, seizing her by the hand. The letter has been written, but it has not yet been sent, but the Emperor knows about it. The question is merely this, has it been destroyed or not? If not, then, as soon as all is over, Prince Vasily sighed, giving to understand what he meant to convey by the words, all is over, then the Count's papers will be opened, the will and the letter will be handed to the Emperor, and the petition will be undoubtedly granted. Pierre, as the legitimate son, would inherit all. But our share? demanded the princess, smiling ironically, as though all things except this were possible. But, my poor Katish, it is as clear as day. Then he will be the only legal heir, and will have the whole, and you will simply get nothing. You ought to know, my dear, whether the will and the letter have been written or whether they have been destroyed. And if they have been forgotten, then you ought to know where they are, and to find them, so that— That's the last feather, interrupted the princess, smiling sardonically, and not varying the expression of her eyes. I am a woman, and according to your idea, all of us women are stupid. But I know well enough that an illegitimate son cannot inherit. Un pitar, she added, with the intention of showing the prince, by this French term, conclusively how inconsistent he was. Why can't you understand, Katish? You are so clever. Why can't you understand that if the Count has written a letter to the Emperor begging him to legitimize his son, of course Pierre will not be Pierre any longer, but Count Bouzoukoy, and then he will inherit the whole according to the will. And if the will and letter are not destroyed, then you will get nothing— except the consolation of knowing that you were dutiful, a tout ce qui s'en suit. That is one sure thing. 
I know that the will has been made, but I know also that it is not good for anything, and it seems to me that you take me for a perfect fool, mon cousin, said the princess, with that expression that women assume when they think they have said something sharp and insulting. My dear Princess Katerina Semyonovna, impatiently reiterated Prince Vasily, I did not come with the intention of having a controversy with you, but to talk with you about your own interests as with a relative, a kind, good, true relative. I tell you for the tenth time that if this letter to the Emperor and the will in Pierre's favor are among the Count's papers, then you, my dear little friend, will not inherit anything, nor your sisters either. If you don't believe me, then ask somebody who does know. I have just been talking with Dmitri Onufryitch, that was the Count's lawyer, and he says the same thing. A change evidently came over the Countess's thoughts. Her thin lips grew white, her eyes remained the same, and her voice when she spoke evidently surprised even herself by the violence of its gusty outburst. That would be fine, said she. I have never desired anything, and I would not now. She brushed the dog from her lap and straightened the folds of her dress. Here is gratitude. Here is recognition for all the sacrifices that people have made for him, cried she. Excellent. Very fine. I don't need anything, prince. Yes, but it is not you alone. You have sisters, replied Prince Vasily. The princess, however, did not heed him. Yes, I have known for a long time, but I had not realized it, that I had nothing to expect in this house except baseness, deception, envy, intrigue, except ingratitude, the blackest ingratitude. Do you know or do you not know where the will is? asked Prince Vasily, his cheeks twitching even more than before. Yes, I was stupid. I have always had faith in people and loved them and sacrificed myself. But those only are successful who are base and low. I know through whose intrigues this came about. The princess wanted to get up, but the prince detained her by the arm. The princess's face suddenly took on the expression of one who has become soured against the whole human race. She looked angrily at her relative. There is still time enough. You must know, my dear Katish, that all this may have been done hastily, in a moment of pique, of illness, and then forgotten. Our duty, my dear, is to correct his mistake, to soothe his last moments, so that he cannot in decency commit this injustice. We must not let him die with the idea that he was making unhappy those who— Those who sacrificed everything for him, interrupted the princess, taking the words out of his mouth. Again she tried to get up, but still the prince would not allow her and he has never had the sense to perceive it. No, mon cousin, she added with a sigh. I shall yet live to learn that in this world it is idle to expect one's reward, and that in this world there is no such thing as honor or justice. In this world one must be shrewd and wicked. Well, Voyon, calm yourself. I know your good heart. No, I have a heart full of wickedness. I know your heart, repeated the prince, I prize your friendship, and I could wish that you had as high an opinion of me. Now calm yourself, and parlons raison. Now is the golden time, a few hours at most, perhaps a few moments. Now tell me all you know about this will, and above all where it is. You must know. He has probably forgotten all about it. Now we must take it and show it to the Count. Probably he has forgotten all about it, and would wish it to be destroyed." You understand that my sole desire is sacredly to carry out his wishes. That is why I came here. I am here only to help him and you. Now I understand all. I know whose intrigues it was. I know, said the princess. That is not the point, my dear heart. It is your protege, your dear Princess Drubitskaya, Anna Mikhailovna, whom I would not take for my chambermaid. Filthy, vile woman. Let us not lose time, said the prince, in French. Ah, oh, don't speak to me. Last winter she sneaked in here, and she told the Count such vile things, such foul things about all of us, especially about Sophie. I cannot repeat them. 
so that the Count was taken ill, and for two weeks would not see any of us. It was at that time, I know, that he wrote that nasty, vile paper, but I suppose that it did not mean anything. That is just the point. Why haven't you told me before? In the mosaic portfolio which he keeps under his pillow. Now I know, again went on the princess. Yes, if I have any sins on my soul, the greatest sin is my hatred of that horrid woman. Almost cried the princess, her face all convulsed. And why did she sneak in here? But I will tell her my whole mind. That I will. The time will come. End of chapter 19 Part 1, Chapter 20 of War and Peace by Leo Tolstoy Translated by Nathan Haskell Doyle This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Marianne At the time that these various conversations were going on in the reception room and in the princess's apartment, the carriage with Pierre, who had been sent for, and with Anna Mikhailovna, who found it essential to accompany him, drove into Count Buzukoy's courtyard. When the carriage wheels rolled noiselessly upon the straw scattered under the windows, Anna Mikhailovna turned to her companion with consoling words, but was surprised to find him asleep in the corner of the carriage. She wakened him, and, as he followed her from the carriage, it dawned upon him for the first time that a meeting with his dying father was before him. He noticed that they had drawn up not at the state entrance but at the rear door, just as he left the carriage, two men in merchant garb skulked down from the doorway and hid in the shadow of the wall. Stopping a moment to look around, he saw several other similar figures on both sides in the shadow. But neither Anna Mikhailovna, nor the lackey, nor the coachman, though they could not have helped seeing these men, paid any attention to them. "'Why, of course it must be all right,' said Pierre to himself, and followed Anna Mikhailovna. Anna Mikhailovna, with hurried steps, tripped up the dimly lighted narrow stone stairway and beckoned to Pierre, who loitered behind her. He could not seem to realize why it was necessary for him to go to the Count, and still less why they had to enter by the rear door, but concluding by Anna Mikhailovna's assurance and haste that it was absolutely necessary, he decided to follow her. Halfway up the stairs they almost ran into some men with buckets, who came clattering down and pressed up close to the wall to let them pass, but showed not the slightest surprise to see them there. "'Is this the way to the princess's apartments?' she inquired of one of them. "'Yes,' replied the lackey, in a loud, insolent voice, as though now anything were permissible. "'The door at the left, Matushka.' "'Perhaps the Count did not call for me,' said Pierre, when they reached the landing. "'I would better go to my room.' Anna Mikhailovna waited till Pierre overtook her. "'Ah, mon ami,' said she, laying her hand on his arm, just as she had done that morning to her son. "'Believe that I suffer as much as you. But be a man.' "'Really, hadn't I better go?' asked Pierre, looking affectionately at Anna Mikhailovna through his spectacles. "'Ah, mon ami,' she said, still in French, "'forget the wrongs that may have been done you.' "'Remember he is your father, perhaps even now dying,' she sighed. "'I have loved you from the very first, like my own son. "'Trust in me, Pierre. I will not forget your interests.' "'Pierre did not in the least comprehend, but again with even more force. "'It came over him that all this must necessarily be so, "'and he submissively followed Anna Mikhailovna, who had already opened the door.' The door led into the entry of the rear apartments. In one corner sat an old manservant of the princesses, knitting a stocking. Pierre had never before been in this part of the house. He was not even aware of the existence of such rooms. Anna Mikhailovna hailed a maid whom she saw hurrying along with a carafe on a tray, and calling her by various familiar terms of endearment, asked how the princesses were, and at the same time beckoned Pierre to follow her along the stone corridor. The first door on the left led into the princess's private rooms. The chambermaid with a carafe, in her haste, everything was done in haste at this time in this mansion, failed to close the door, and as Pierre and Anna Mikhailovna passed by, they involuntarily glanced into the room where sat the oldest of the nieces in close conference with Prince Vasily. Seeing them passing, Prince Vasily made a hasty movement and drew himself up. 
The princess sprang to her feet, and in her vexation slammed the door to with all her might. This action was so unlike the princess's habitual serenity, the apprehension pictured on the princess's face was so contrary to his ordinary expression of self-importance, that Pierre paused and looked inquiringly at his guide through his spectacles. Anna Mikhailovna manifested no surprise. She merely smiled slightly and sighed, as though to signify that all this was to be expected. Soyons, mon ami, I will watch over your interests, said she, in answer to his glance, and tripped along the corridor even more hastily than before. Pierre did not comprehend what the trouble was, and still less her words, watch over your interests, but he came to the conclusion that all this must be so. They went from the corridor into a dimly lighted hall which adjoined the Count's reception room. It was one of those cold and magnificent apartments in the front of the house which Pierre knew so well. But even in this room, right in the middle stood a forgotten bathtub from which the water was leaking into the carpet. A servant and a clergyman carrying a censer came toward them on their tiptoes but paid no attention to them. Then they entered the reception room with its two Italian windows its door leading into the winter garden, and adorned with a colossal bust and full-length portrait of the Empress Catherine. The room was filled with the same people in almost the same attitudes, sitting and whispering together. They all stopped talking and stared at Anna Mikhailovna as she entered with her pale, tear-stained face, followed by the stout, burly Pierre, submissively hanging his head. Anna Mikhailovna's face expressed the consciousness that a decisive moment was at hand, and with the bearing of a genuine Petersburg woman of affairs, she marched into the room, not allowing Pierre to leave her, and showing even more boldness than in the morning. She knew that as she was bringing the person whom the dying Count desired to see, her reception was assured. With a quick glance she surveyed all who were in the room, and perceiving the Count's priest, she, without exactly bowing, but suddenly diminishing her stature, sailed with a mincing gait up to the confessor and respectfully received the blessing first of one and then of the other priest. "'Thank God, we are in time,' said she to the priest. "'We are his relatives, and were so much alarmed lest we should be too late. This young man here is the Count's son,' she added in a lower tone. "'A terrible moment.' After speaking these words, she went over to the doctor. Cher docteur, she said to him, ce jeune homme est la face du comte. Il est de l'espoir. Is there any hope? The doctor, silently, with a quick movement, shrugged his shoulders and cast his eyes upward. Anna Mikhailovna, exactly imitating him, also raised hers, almost closing them, and drew a deep sigh. Then she turned from the doctor to Pierre. Her manner was respectful and affectionate, with a shade of sadness. Have confidence in his mercy, said she in French, pointing him to a small sofa where he should sit and wait for her while she noiselessly directed her steps toward the door which was the attraction for all eyes, and noiselessly opening it disappeared from sight. Pierre, making up his mind in all things to obey his guide, went to the little sofa which she pointed out to him. As soon as Anna Mikhailovna was out of sight, he noticed that the eyes of all who were in the room were fastened upon him with more curiosity than sympathy. He noticed that all were whispering together, nodding toward him with a sort of aversion and even servility. He was shown a degree of respect which he had never been shown before. A lady whom he did not know, the one who had been talking with the two priests, got up from her place and motioned to him to sit down. The adjutant picked up a glove which he had dropped and gave it to him. The doctors preserved a respectful silence as he passed by them, and fell back to make way for him. At first Pierre was inclined to sit down in another place so as not to disturb the lady, was inclined to pick up his own glove, and to turn out for the doctors, though they were not at all in his way, but, on second thought, it suddenly occurred to him that this would not be becoming. He felt that this night he was a person expected to fulfill some terrible and obligatory ceremony and therefore he was in duty bound to accept the services of all these people. He silently received the glove from the adjutant, and took the lady's place, laying his huge hands on his evenly plated knees in the naive poise of an Egyptian statue, and saying to himself that all this was just as it was meant to be, and that, 
lest he should lose his presence of mind and commit some absurdity, it behooved him this evening above all to give up all idea of self-guidance, but commit himself wholly to the will of those who assumed the direction of him. Not two minutes had passed when Prince Vasily, in his kaftan, with three stars on his breast, carrying his head majestically, came into the room. He seemed thinner than when Pierre had last seen him. His eyes opened larger than usual when he glanced about the room and caught sight of Pierre. He went straight up to him, took his hand, a thing which he had never done before, and bent it down as though trying by experiment whether it had any power of resistance. Courage! Courage, mon ami, he has asked to see you. That is good. And he started to go away. But Pierre felt that it was suitable to ask. How is he? He stammered, not knowing exactly how to call the dying count. He was ashamed to call him father. He had another stroke half an hour ago. Courage, mon ami. Pierre was in such a dazed condition of mind that at the word coupe he imagined that someone had hit him. He looked at Prince Vasily in perplexity, and it was only after some time that he was able to gather that coupe meant an attack of apoplexy. Prince Vasily, as he went by, said a few words to Lorraine and went into the bedroom on his tiptoes. He was not used to walking on his tiptoes, and his whole body jumped as he walked. He was immediately followed by the oldest princess. Then came the confessor and priests. Some of the house servants also joined in the procession and passed into the sleeping room. There was heard some stir, and finally Anna Mikhailovna, with the same pale countenance, firmly bent on the fulfillment of her duties, came running out and touching Pierre on the arm said, The goodness of God is inexhaustible. The ceremony is about to begin. Come. Pierre passed into the room treading on the soft carpet, and noticed that the adjutant and the strange lady and one of the servants all followed him, as though now it were no longer necessary to ask permission to go in. End of chapter 20 Part 1, Chapter 21 of War and Peace by Leo Tolstoy, translated by Nathan Haskell Doyle. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Marianne. Pierre well knew this great room, divided by columns and an arcade, and all hung with Persian tapestries. The part of the chamber behind the columns, where on one side stood a huge mahogany bedstead with silken curtains, and on the other a monstrous kyot, or shrine with images, was all brightly and beautifully lighted, just as churches are usually lighted for evening service. Under the glittering decorations of this shrine stood a long Voltaire reclining chair, and in the chair, supported by snowy white, unruffled cushions, Apparently only just changing lay the majestic form of Pierre's father, Count Buzikoy, with his hair heaped up on his lofty forehead like a lion's mane, as Pierre remembered it so well, and the same strong, deep wrinkles on his handsome, aristocratic face, reddish-yellow in color. He was wrapped to the waist in a bright green quilt, and lay directly under the holy pictures. Both of his great stout arms were uncovered and lay on the quilt. In his right hand, which lay palm down, a wax taper was placed between the thumb and forefinger, and an old servant bending over the chair held it upright. Around the chair stood the clergy in their magnificent glittering robes, with their long locks streaming down over their shoulders, with lighted tapers in their hands, performing their functions with slow solemnity. A little back from them stood the two younger princesses, with handkerchiefs in their hands, pressed to their eyes, and just in front of them was the oldest sister, Katish, with a spiteful, resolute face, not for a moment letting her eyes wander from the icon, as though she were saying to all that she would not be responsible for her actions if she looked around. Anna Mikhailovna, with an expression of sanctified grief and universal forgiveness on her face, stood near the door with the strange lady. Prince Vasily, on the other side of the door, near the Count, stood behind a carved chair, upholstered in velvet, which he had turned back to, and was leaning on it his left hand with a taper, and crossing himself with his right hand, raising his eyes each time that his fingers touched his forehead. His face expressed calm devoutness and submission to the will of God. If you cannot comprehend these feelings, so much the worse for you, his countenance seemed to say. Behind him stood the adjutant, the doctors, and the men-servants, just as in church, 
the men and women took opposite sides. No one spoke. All kept crossing themselves. The only sound was the reading of the service, the low, subdued chanting of the priest's deep bass, and during the intervals of silence, the restless movement of feet and deep sighs. Anna Mikhailovna, with that significant expression of countenance that showed she knew what she was doing, crossed the whole width of the chamber to where Pierre was, and gave him a taper. He lighted it, and then, growing confused under the glances of those around him, began to cross himself with the hand which held the taper. The youngest of the sisters, the rosy and fun-loving Princess Sophie, the one with the mole, was looking at him. She smiled and hid her face in her handkerchief, and did not expose it for some time. When she caught sight of Pierre again, her amusement again overcame her. Then, evidently feeling that she had not the self-control sufficient to allow her to look at him without smiling, and that she could not keep from looking at him, she quietly fled from temptation by retreating behind a column. In the midst of the service, the voices of the clergy suddenly ceased. The priest whispered something to each other. The old waiting man, who held the candle in the Count's hand, straightened up and went over to the lady's side. Anna Mikhailovna stepped forward, and bending over the sick man, beckoned to Dr. Lorraine without turning around. The French doctor had been standing without a lighted taper, leaning against one of the pillars, in that reverent attitude by which one who, though a stranger and belonging to a different creed, shows that he appreciates all the solemnity of the ceremony and even assents to it. With the noiseless steps of a man possessed of perfect vigor, he answered Anna Mikhailovna's call, went over to the sick man, lifted in his white, slender fingers the hand that lay on the green quilt, and bending over, began to count the pulse and grew grave. Something was given to the invalid to drink. There was a slight stir about him. Then once more they all took their places, and the service proceeded. At the time of this interruption, Pierre noticed that Prince Vasily left his position behind the carved chair, and, with an expression of countenance that seemed to say that he knew what he was doing, and that it was so much worse for others if they did not understand him, went, not to the sick man, but past him, and being joined by the oldest of the princesses, retired with her into the depths of the alcove, to the high bedstead under the silken hangings. From there both the prince and the princess disappeared through a rear door, but before the end of the service both resumed their places, one after the other. Pierre gave this strange action no more thought than to anything else, having once for all made up his mind that all that took place that evening was absolutely essential. The sounds of the church chant ceased, and the voice of the priest was heard respectfully congratulating the sick man on his having received the mystery. The count lay as before, motionless and as though lifeless. Around him was a stir. Footsteps and a whispering were heard. Anna Mikhailovna's voice could be distinguished above the rest. Pierre listened and heard her say, he must be carried instantly to bed. It will never do in the world for him here to— The doctors, princesses, and servants crowded around the invalid so that Pierre could no longer see that reddish-yellow face with the gray mane of hair, which ever since the service began had constantly filled his vision to the exclusion of everything else. He surmised by the guarded movements of those who crowded around the armchair that they were lifting and carrying the dying man. Hold by my arm— "'You'll drop him so,' said one of the servants in a frightened whisper. "'Take him lower down. One more,' said different voices, and the labored breathing and shuffling of feet growing more hurried seemed to indicate that the load that these men were carrying was beyond their strength. As the bearers, among their number Anna Mikhailovna, came opposite the young man, he caught a momentary glimpse over their heads and backs of his father's strong, full chest uncovered, his stout shoulders lifted above the people carrying him under their arms, and his leonine head with its curly mane. The face, with its extraordinary high forehead and cheekbones, handsome, sensitive mouth, and majestic, cold eyes, was undisfigured by the nearness of death. It was just the same as when Pierre had seen it three months previously, when the Count had sent him to Petersburg. But the head rolled helplessly under the uneven steps of the bearers, and the cold, indifferent eyes gave no sign of recognition. There followed a few moments of bustle around the high bedstead. Those who had been carrying the sick man withdrew. Anna Mikhailovna touched Pierre on the arm and said, Vini. 
Pierre went with her to the bed, whereon the sick man had been placed in solemn attitude, evidently in some manner connected with the sacrament just accomplished. He lay with his head propped high on pillows. His hands were placed side by side, palm downward, on the green silk quilt. As Pierre went to him, the Count was looking straight at him, but his look had that meaning and significance which it is impossible for a man to read. Either that look had simply nothing to say, and merely fastened upon him because those eyes must needs look at something, or they had too much to say. Pierre paused, not knowing what was expected of him, and glanced inquiringly at his guide. Anna Mikhailovna made him a hasty motion with her eyes toward the sick man's hand, and with her lips signified that he should kiss it. Pierre bent over carefully so as not to disturb the quilt, and in accordance with her advice touched his lips to the broad, brawny hand. Neither the hand nor a muscle of the Count's face moved. Pierre again looked questioningly at Anna Mikhailovna to find what he should do next. She signed to him with her eyes to sit down in an armchair which stood near the bed. Pierre submissively sat down, his eyes mutely asking if he were doing the right thing. Anna Mikhailovna approvingly nodded her head. Pierre again assumed the symmetrically simple attitude of the Egyptian statue, and evidently really suffered because his awkward, huge frame took up so much space, though he strove with all his might to make it seem as small as possible. He looked at the Count. The Count was staring at the spot where Pierre had just been standing. Anna Mikhailovna showed by her actions that she realized the pathetic importance of this final meeting of father and son. This lasted two minutes, which seemed an hour to Pierre. Suddenly a tremor appeared in the deep, powerful muscles and lines of the Count's face. It grew more pronounced. The handsome mouth was drawn to one side. This caused Pierre for the first time to realize how near to death his father was, and from the drawn mouth proceeded an indistinguishable hoarse sound. Anna Mikhailovna looked anxiously into the sick man's eyes and tried to make out what he wanted, pointing first at Pierre, then at the tumbler. Then she asked in a whisper if she should call Prince Vasily, then pointed at the quilt. The sick man's face and eyes expressed impatience. He mustered force enough to look at the manservant who never left his master's bedside. He wants to be turned over on the other side whispered the servant, and proceeded to lift and turn the Count's heavy body face to the wall. Pierre got up to help the servant. Just as they were turning the Count over, one of his arms fell back helplessly, and he made a futile effort to raise it. Did the Count notice the look of terror on Pierre's face at the sight of that lifeless arm, or did some other thought flash across his dying brain at that moment? At all events, he looked at his disobedient hand, then at Pierre's terror-stricken face, and back to his hand again, and over his lips played a martyr's weak smile out of character with his powerful features, and seeming to express a feeling of scorn for his own lack of strength. At the sight of the smile Pierre unexpectedly felt an oppression around the heart, a strange pinching in his nose, and the tears dimmed his eyes. The sick man lay on his side toward the wall. He drew a long sigh. He is going to sleep, said Anna Mikhailovna to one of the nieces who returned to watch. Allons. Pierre left the room. End of chapter 21 Part 1, Chapter 22 of War and Peace by Leo Tolstoy Translated by Nathan Haskell Doyle This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Marianne There was no one in the reception room except Prince Vasily and the oldest princess, and these two were sitting under the empress's portrait, talking eagerly about something. As soon as they caught sight of Pierre and his guide, they stopped, and it seemed to the young man that the princess hid something, and whispered, I cannot abide the sight of that woman. Katish has made tea in the little drawing-room, said Prince Vasily in French, addressing Anna Mikhailovna. Come, ma pauvre Anna Mikhailovna, you had better take something to eat, else you might be the worse for it. He said nothing to Pierre, but gave his arm a sympathetic pressure just below the shoulder. Pierre and Anna Mikhailovna went into what he called Le Petit Salon. "'There is nothing so refreshing as a cup of this excellent Russian tea after a sleepless night,' said Dr. Lorraine, with an expression of restrained liveliness, as he stood in the small, circular drawing-room, 
sipping his tea from a delicate porcelain cup. Just back of him was a table with the tea service and a cold supper. Around the table were gathered for refreshments all those who were spending this night in Count Buzakoy's mansion. Pierre well remembered this little circular drawing-room, with its mirrors and small tables. In days gone by, when the Count gave balls, Pierre, who did not know how to dance, liked to sit in this little room of mirrors and watch the ladies in their ball toilets, with diamonds and pearls on their bare necks, as they passed through, glance at themselves in the brightly illuminated mirrors, which reflected back their beauties. Now the room was dimly lighted by a pair of candles, and at this midnight hour there stood on one of the small tables a disorderly array of tea-things, while a motley throng of people in anything but ball-dresses were scattered about it, talking in whispers, by every motion, every word, evincing how little they could forget what was now taking place or going to take place in that chamber of death. Pierre did not care to eat, though he was very hungry. He glanced inquiringly at his guide, and saw that she was tiptoeing back to the reception-room where they had left Prince Vasily and the oldest niece. Pierre took it for granted that this also was as it should be, and after waiting a little while he followed her. Anna Mikhailovna was standing in front of the young lady, and both were talking at once in angry undertones. "'Permit me, princess, to decide what is necessary and what is not necessary,' the princess Katish was saying, evidently still in the same angry frame of mind that she had been in when she slammed the door of her room. "'But, my dear young princess,' said Anna Mikhailovna, in a sweet but conclusive manner, barring the way to the Count's chamber and not allowing the young lady to pass, "'will this not be too great an effort for your uncle at this time, when he so much needs rest? At this time any conversation about worldly matters, when his soul has already been prepared—' Prince Vasily still sat in the armchair, in his familiar posture, with one leg thrown over the other. His cheeks twitched violently, and seemed to grow flabbier than usual, but he preserved the attitude of a man to whom the altercation of the two women was of no consequence. Voyon, ma bonne Anna Mikhailovna, let Katish have her way. You know how fond the Count is of her. I don't even know what is in this paper, said the young princess, turning to Prince Vasily and pointing to the mosaic portfolio which she had in her hand. I only know that his last will is in his bureau, but this is a paper which he has forgotten. They tried to pass by Anna Mikhailovna, but Anna Mikhailovna springing forward again barred her way. I know, my good, dear princess, said Anna Mikhailovna, grabbing the portfolio and so firmly that it was evident she would not let go in a hurry. My dear princess, I beg of you, I beseech you, have pity on him. Je vous en conjure. The young princess said not a word. All that was heard was the noise of the struggle for the possession of the portfolio. It was plain to see that if she had opened her mouth to speak, what she said would not have been flattering for Anna Mikhailovna. The latter clung to the portfolio unflinchingly, but, nevertheless, her voice was soft, sweet, and gentle as ever. Pierre, my dear, come here. I think he will not be in the way in this family council, will he, Prince? Why don't you speak, mon cousin? suddenly cried the young princess, so loud that those in the little drawing-room heard it and were startled. Why don't you speak, when here God knows who permits herself to meddle in matters that don't concern her, and make scenes on the very threshold of the death-chamber? Intrigantka! she hissed in a loud whisper, and snatched at the portfolio with all her force but Anna Mikhailovna took two or three steps forward so as not to let go her hold of it, and succeeded in keeping it in her hand. "'Oh!' cried Prince Vasily reproachfully, and rising in surprise. "'C'est ridicule, veillons. Let go, I tell you.' The Princess Katish obeyed. "'You also.' Anna Mikhailovna paid no attention to him. "'Drop it, I tell you. I will assume the whole responsibility. I will go and ask him. I will.' That ought to satisfy you. May, mon prince, said Anna Mikhailovna, after this great mystery, allow him a moment to rest. Here, Pierre, give us your opinion, said she, turning to the young man, who, coming close to them, looked in amazement at the princess's angry face, from which all the dignity had departed, and at Prince Vasily's twitching cheeks. Remember that you will answer for all the consequences, 
said Prince Vasily angrily. You don't know what you are doing. You vile woman! screamed the young princess, unexpectedly darting at Anna Mikhailovna and snatching away the portfolio. Prince Vasily hung his head and spread open his hands. At this juncture, that terrible door at which Pierre had been looking so long, and which was usually open so gently, was hastily and noisily flung back, so that it struck against the wall, and the second sister rushed out wringing her hands. "'What are you doing?' she cried in despair. "'He is dying, and you leave me alone!' The Princess Katerina dropped the portfolio. Anna Mikhailovna hastily bent over, and picking up the precious object, hastened into the death-chamber. The Princess Katerina and Prince Vasily, coming to their senses, followed her. In a few moments, Princess Katerina came out again, the first of all, with a pale, stern face and biting her lower lip. At the sight of Pierre, her face expressed uncontrollable hatred. "'Yes, now you can swell round,' said she. "'You have been waiting for this!' And beginning to sob, she hid her face in her handkerchief and ran from the room." The princess was followed by Prince Vasily. Reeling a little, he went to the sofa on which Pierre was sitting and flung himself on it, covering his face with his hands. Pierre noticed that he was pale, and that his lower jaw trembled and shook as though he had an ague attack. "'Ah, my friend,' said he, taking Pierre by the elbow, and there was in his voice a sincerity and gentleness which Pierre had never before noticed in it. "'How we sin!' and how we cheat, and all for what? I am sixty years old, my dear. Look at me. Death is the end of all. All. Death is horrible. And he burst into tears. Anna Mikhailovna came out last of all. She went straight up to Pierre with slow, quiet steps. Pierre, said she. Pierre looked at her inquiringly. She kissed the young man on the forehead, which she wet with her tears, then, after a silence, she added, Il n'est pas, he is dead. Pierre looked at her through his glasses. Come, I will lead you away. Try to weep. Nothing is so consoling as tears. She led him into the dark drawing room, and Pierre was relieved that no one was there to see his face. Anna Mikhailovna left him there, and when she returned, he was sound asleep, with his head resting on his arm. The next morning, Anna Mikhailovna said to Pierre in French, Yes, my dear, it is a great loss for all of us. I am not speaking of you, but God will give you support. You are young and at the head of an immense fortune, I hope. The will has not been opened yet. I know you well enough to believe that this will not turn your head, but new duties will devolve upon you, and you must be a man. Pierre made no reply. Perhaps later I will tell you, mon cher, that if I had not been here, God knows what might have happened. You know, mon oncle, only the day before, promised me that he would not forget Boris. But he did not have the time. I hope, mon cher ami, that you will fulfill your father's desire. Pierre entirely failed to see what she was driving at, and without saying anything and reddening with mortification, looked at Anna Mikhailovna. Having thus spoken with Pierre, she drove back to the Rostovs and lay down to rest. After her nap, that same morning, she began to tell the Rostovs and all her acquaintances the particulars of the death of Count Buzakoy. She declared that the Count had died as she herself would wish to die, that his end had not only been pathetic but even edifying. The last meeting of father and son had been so touching that she could not think of it without tears— and that she could not tell which had borne himself with the more composure during these dreadful moments. The father, who had had a thought for everything and every one during those last hours, and had spoken such affectionate and touching words to his son, or Pierre, whom it was pitiful to see, he was so overcome, and yet, in spite of it, struggled so manfully to hide his grief so as not to pain his dying father. Such scenes are painful, but they do one good. It is elevating to the soul to see such men as the old count and his noble son. As to the actions of Princess Katerina and Prince Vasily, she spoke of them also, but in terms of reprobation, and under the promise of strictest secrecy. End of chapter 22 Part 1, Chapter 23 of War and Peace by Leo Tolstoy 
Translated by Nathan Haskell Doyle. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Marianne. The arrival of the young Prince Andre and his wife at Luisia Gori, Bald Hills, Prince Nikolai Andreyevich Bolkonsky's estate, was daily expected. But this did not make any break at all in the strenuous routine according to which life in the old prince's mansion was regulated. Prince Nikolai Andreyevich, a former general-in-chief, popularly called Le Roi de Prusse, had been banished to his estates during the reign of the Emperor Paul, and had lived like a hermit there ever since with his daughter, the Princess Maria, and her hired companion, Mademoiselle Burine. Even after the death of Paul, although he was free to go wherever he pleased, he still continued to live exclusively in the country, saying that if anyone wanted him, it was only half a hundred verse from Moscow to Luisia Guri, while as far as he was concerned, he wanted nothing and nobody. He declared that there were only two sources of human vice, idleness and superstition, and only two virtues, activity and intelligence. He himself undertook his daughter's education, and in order to inculcate both these virtues, he had given her lessons up to the age of twenty in algebra and geometry, and had apportioned her life into an uninterrupted system of occupations. He himself was constantly engaged in writing his memoirs, or in solving problems in the higher mathematics, or in turning snuff-boxes on a lathe, or in working in his garden and superintending the erection of buildings which were always going up on his estate. As the chief condition of activity is order, therefore order in his scheme of life was carried to the last degree of minuteness. His appearance at meals invariably took place under the same circumstances, and at not only the same hour, but the same moment each day. The prince was sharp and scrupulously exacting with the people around him, from his daughter to the humblest menial, and therefore, while he was not cruel, he inspired an awe and deference such as it would have been difficult for even the cruelest man to exact. Although he was living in seclusion, and had now no influence in matters of state, every nachalnik of the government in which he lived considered it his duty to pay his respects to him, and, precisely the same as the architect or the gardener or the Princess Maria, waited at the designated hour for the princess's appearance in the lofty hall." and each one of those waiting in this hall experienced the same feeling of awe and fear as soon as the massive door of his cabinet swung open, and the form of the little old man appeared, in his powdered wig, with his small, dry hands and pendulous gray eyebrows, which sometimes when he frowned concealed the gleam of his keen and youthfully glittering eyes. On the morning of the day when the young couple were expected, Princess Maria, as usual, at the regular hour, came down into the hall to wish her father good morning, and with fear and trembling crossed herself and repeated an inward prayer. Each morning she came the same way, and each morning she prayed that their daily meeting might be propitious. The old servant in a powdered wig, who was sitting in the hall, got up quietly and addressed her in a respectful whisper. Beyond the door could be heard the monotonous hum of the lathe. The princess timidly opened the door, which moved easily and noiselessly on its hinges, and stood at the entrance. The prince was working at his lathe. He looked round and then went on with his work. The great cabinet was full of things, apparently in constant use, a huge table whereon lay books and plans, the lofty bookcases with keys in the mirror-lined doors, a high reading desk, a cabinet-maker's lathe, with various kinds of tools and shavings and chips scattered about. All this indicated a constant, varied, and regular activity. By the motion of his small foot, shod tartar fashion in a silver-embroidered boot, by the firm pressure of his sinewy, thin hand, it could be seen that the prince had still the tenacious and not easily impaired strength of a green old age. Having made a few more turns, he took his foot from the treadle of the lathe, wiped his chisel, put it in a leather pocket attached to the lathe, and going to the table called his daughter to him. He never wasted blessings on his children, and therefore— merely offering his bristly cheek, which had as not yet been shaven for the day, he said, with a severe and at the same time a keenly affectionate look, "'Are you well? Now then, sit down.' He took a copy-book of geometrical work written out in his own hand, 
and pushed his chair along with his foot. For tomorrow, said he, briskly, turning to the page and marking the paragraphs with his stiff nail. The princess leaned over the table toward the notebook. Wait, a letter for you, said the old man abruptly, taking an envelope addressed in a feminine hand from the pocket fastened to the table and tossing it to her. The princess's face colored in blotches at the sight of the letter. She hastily picked it up and examined it intently. "'From your Heloise,' asked the prince, with a chilling smile that showed his teeth that were still sound, though yellow. "'Yes, from Julie,' said the princess, timidly glancing up and timidly smiling. "'I shall allow two more letters to pass, but I shall read the third, said the prince severely. "'I fear you pen much nonsense. I shall read the third. "'You may read this, mon père,' replied the princess, with a still deeper flush, and holding the letter toward him. "'The third. I said the third, rejoined the prince, laconically, pushing away the letter. Then, leaning his elbow on the table, he laid the notebook with the geometrical designs before her. "'Well, young lady,' began the old man, bending over toward his daughter and laying one arm in the back of her chair, so that the young princess felt herself surrounded by that peculiar acrid odor of tobacco and old age, which she had so long learned to associate with her father. "'Well, young lady, these triangles are equal, if you will observe the angle A, B, C.' The princess gazed in dismay at her father's glittering eyes so near to her. The red patches again overspread her face, and it was evident that she had not the slightest comprehension of what he said, and was so overcome with fear that it really prevented her from comprehending any of her father's instructions, no matter how clearly they were expressed. The teacher may have been at fault, or the pupil may have been, but each day the same thing recurred. The princess's eyes pained her. She could not see anything or hear anything. All that she felt was the consciousness of her stern father's withered face, the consciousness of his breath and peculiar order, and her single thought was to escape as soon as possible from the cabinet and solve the problem by herself in peace. The old man would lose all patience, noisily push back the chair in which he was sitting, and then draw it forward again. Then he would exert his self-control so as not to break out into a fury, but rarely succeeded, and sometimes he would fling the notebook upon the floor. The princess made a mistake in her answer. "'Now how can you be so stupid?' stormed the prince, throwing aside the notebook and hastily turning away. Then he rose to his feet, walked up and down, laid his hand on her hair, and again sitting down, drew close to her and proceeded with his instructions. "'No use, princess, no use,' said he, as the young lady took the lesson book and closing it started to leave the room. "'Mathematics is a great thing, my girl, and I don't wish you to be like our stupid, silly women. By dint of perseverance one learns to like it, he patted her on the cheek. The dullness will vanish from your brain. She started to go. He detained her by a gesture and took down from the high table a new book with uncut leaves. Here, your Heloise has sent you something else, some key to the mystery, a religious work. I don't interfere with anyone's belief. I looked it over. Take it. Now be off. Be off. He patted her on the shoulder and closed the door himself after she had gone out. The young princess, Maria returned to her chamber with the pensive, scared expression which rarely left her and which rendered her plain, sickly face still more unattractive. She sat down at her writing-table covered with miniature portraits and cluttered with notebooks and volumes. The princess was just as disorderly as her father was systematic. She threw down her book of problems and hastily broke the seal of the letter, which was from the most intimate friend of her childhood— this was no other than the Julie Karagina who was at the Rostovs on the day of the fete. Julie read as follows. Chérie excellente en me. What a terrible and frightful thing is distance. It is in vain that I tell myself that half of my existence and happiness is in you, that, in spite of the distance which lies between us, our hearts are bound to each other by indissoluble ties. Mine rebels against my fate, and— Notwithstanding all the pleasures and attractions that surround me, I cannot overcome a certain lurking sadness which I have felt in the depths of my heart ever since our separation. Why are we not together, as we were this past summer, in your great cabinet, on the blue sofa, 
la canopée aux confidences. Why can I not now, as I did three months ago, draw fresh moral strength from your eyes, so sweet, so calm, so penetrating, the eyes which I loved so much and which I imagine I see before me as I write? Having read to this point, the Princess Maria sighed and glanced at the pier-glass that stood over against her, reflecting her slight, homely form and thin face. Her eyes, which were generally melancholy, just now looked with a peculiarly helpless expression at her image in the glass. "'She is flattering me,' said the princess to herself, turning away and continuing her reading of the letter. Julie, however, had not flattered her friend. In reality, the princess's eyes were large, deep, and luminous. Sometimes whole sheaves, as it were, of soft light seemed to gleam forth from them, and then they were so beautiful that they transformed her whole face, notwithstanding the plainness of her features, and gave her a charm that was more attractive than mere beauty. But the young princess had never seen the beautiful expression of her own eyes, the expression which they had at times when she was not thinking of herself. Like most people, her face assumed an affectedly unnatural and ill-favored expression as soon as she looked into the glass. She went on with the letter. All Moscow is talking of nothing but the war. One of my two brothers has already gone abroad. The other is with the guard, which is just about to set out for the frontier. Our beloved emperor has left Petersburg, and, according to what they say, is intending to expose his precious life to the perils of war. God grant that the Corsican monster, who is destroying the peace of Europe, may be laid low by the angel whom the Almighty, in his mercy, has sent to rule over us. Now, to speak of my brothers, this war has deprived me of one who is nearest and dearest to my heart. I mean the young Nikolai Rostov, who was so enthusiastic that he was unable to endure inactivity, and has left the university to join the army. A bien, ma chère Marie, I will confess to you that, notwithstanding his extreme youth, his departure for the army is a great grief to me. The young man, I told you about him last summer, has so much nobility, so much of that genuine youthfulness, which we meet with so rarely in this age of ours, among our men of twenty. He has really so much candor and heart, he is so pure and poetic, that my acquaintance with him, slight as it has been, must be counted as one of the sweetest enjoyments of my poor heart, which has already suffered so keenly. Some day I will tell you of our parting and what passed between us. As yet, it is still too fresh in my memory." Ah, cher ami, how happy you are not to experience these joys and these pangs so keen. You are fortunate, because the latter are usually the keenest. I know very well that Count Nikolai is too young ever to be anything to me more than a friend, but this sweet friendship, these relations, so poetic and so pure, have become one of the necessities of my heart. But enough of this. The chief news of the day, which all Moscow is engaged in talking about, is the death of the old Count Buzakoy and his inheritance. Just imagine, the three princesses get very little, Prince Vasily nothing, and it is Monsieur Pierre who has inherited everything. He has, moreover, been declared legitimate, and is, therefore, Count Buzakoy, and the possessor of the finest fortune in Russia. It is claimed that Prince Vasily has played a very poor part in this whole business, and that he has gone back to Petersburg very much crestfallen. I confess I have very little understanding of this matter of the bequests and the will. All I know is, that since this young man, whom we knew under the name Monsieur Pierre, pure and simple, has become Count Bozokoy, and master of one of the greatest fortunes of Russia, I am greatly amused to notice the changed tone and behavior of mamas burdened with marriageable daughters, and even the young ladies themselves, toward this individual, who, parenthetically, has always seemed to me to be a poor specimen. As it has been the amusement of many people for the past few years to marry me off, and generally to men whom I do not even know, la chronique matrimoniale of Moscow now makes me out Countess Buzakova. You know perfectly well that I have no desire of acquiring that position. A propos de mariage, do you know that quite recently, la tante en général, Anna Mikhailovna, has confided to me, under the seal of strictest secrecy, a marriage project for you. This is neither more nor less than Prince Vasily's son, Anatole, whom it is proposed to bring to order by marrying him to a young lady of wealth and distinction, 
and you are the one upon whom the choice of the relatives has fallen. I know not how you will look upon the matter, but I felt that it was my duty to inform you. They say he is very handsome, and a great scapegrace. That is all that I have been able to find out about him. But a truce to gossip like this, I am at the end of my second sheet, and Mamma is calling me to go to dine at the Apraxkins. Read the mystic book which I send you, and which is all the rage with us. Although there are things in this book difficult for the feeble mind of man to fathom, it is an admirable work, the reading of which soothes and elevates the mind. Adieu. My respects to your father and my compliments to Mademoiselle Burine. I embrace you with all my heart. Julie. P.S. Tell me the news about your brother and his charming little wife. The princess sat thinking, a pensive smile playing over her lips. Her face, lighted up by her luminous eyes, was perfectly transfigured. Then, suddenly jumping up, she walked briskly across the room to her table. She got out some paper, and her hand began to fly rapidly over it. This was what she wrote in reply. Cherie excellente en me. Your letter of the thirteenth caused me great delight. So, then, you still love me, my poetic Julie. And absence, of which you say such hard things, has not had its usual effect upon you. You complain of absence. What should I have to say if I dared complain, bereft as I am of all those who are dearest to me? Ah, if we had not religion to console us, life would be very sad. Why should you suspect me of looking stern when you speak to me of your affection for this young man? In this respect I am lenient to all except myself. I appreciate these sentiments in others, and if I cannot approve of them, never having myself experienced them, I do not condemn them. It only seemed to me that Christian love, love for our neighbor, love for our enemies, is more meritorious and, therefore, sweeter and more beautiful than those sentiments inspired in a poetic and loving young girl like you by a young man's handsome eyes. The news of Count Buzakoy's death reached us in advance of your letter, and my father was very much moved by it. He says that he was the last representative but one of the Grand Secule, and that now it is his turn, but that he shall do his best to put it off as long as possible. God preserve us from such a terrible misfortune. I cannot agree with you in your judgment of Pierre, whom I knew as a boy. He always seemed to me to have an excellent heart, and that is the quality which I most value in people. As to his inheritance and the role played by Prince Vasily, it is very sad for both of them. Ah, dear friend, our divine Saviour's saying that it is easier for a camel to pass through the eye of a needle than for a rich man to enter the kingdom of God is terribly true. I pity Prince Vasily, and I am still more sorry for Pierre. So young, and to be loaded down with this wealth, what temptations will he not have to undergo? If I were asked what I should desire most in this world— it would be to be poorer than the poorest of beggars. A thousand thanks, cher ami, for the work which you send me and which is so much the rage with you in Moscow. However, as you say that while there are many good things in it, there are others which the feeble mind of men cannot fathom, it seems to me quite idle to waste one's time in reading what is unintelligible and which, therefore, can be productive of no good fruit. I have never been able to understand the passion which some people have for disturbing their minds by devoting themselves to mystical books that only arouse doubts, kindling their imaginations and giving them a love for exaggeration utterly contrary to Christian simplicity. Let us read the Apostles and the Gospels. Let us give up trying to penetrate the mysteries they contain, for how should we, miserable sinners that we are, presume to investigate the terrible secrets of Providence while we carry with us this garment of flesh, which forms an impenetrable veil between us and the Eternal. Then let us confine ourselves to a study of the sublime principles which our Divine Saviour has left for our guidance here below. Let us seek to conform to them and follow them, being persuaded that the less rein we give to our feeble human minds, the more pleasing it is to God, who repudiates all knowledge not proceeding from Him, that the less we seek to explore what it has seemed best to him to hide from our comprehension, the sooner he will grant us to discover it by his divine spirit. My father has not said anything to me of a suitor. He has merely told me of having received a letter and of expecting a visit from Prince Vasily. As far as the project of marriage concerns me, 
I will tell you, chérie excellente en me, that in my opinion, marriage is a divine institution to which it is necessary to conform. However painful it might be to me, if the Almighty should ever impose upon me the duties of a wife and mother, I shall endeavor to fill them as faithfully as I can, without disturbing myself by inquiring into the nature of my feelings toward him whom he shall give me as a husband. I have had a letter from my brother announcing his speedy arrival at Louisia Gorey with his wife. This will be a joy of short duration, for he will leave us to take part in this unhappy war, into which we are dragged God knows why and how. Not alone with you, at the center of business and society, is the war the only topic of conversation, but here amid the labors of the field, and that calm of nature which the inhabitants of cities ordinarily imagine to be peculiar to the country, the rumors of the war make themselves painfully heard and felt. My father can talk of nothing else but marches and countermarches, things of which I have no comprehension, and the day before yesterday, while taking my usual walk down the village street, I witnessed a heart-rending scene. It was a party of recruits, enlisted on our estate and on their way to the army. You ought to have seen the state in which were the mothers, wives, and children of the men who were off, and to have heard their sobs. You should think that humanity had forgotten the precepts of their divine Savior, who taught love and the forgiveness of offenses. One would think that they imputed their greatest merit to the art of killing each other. Adieu, cher bon ami. May our divine Savior and His Holy Mother keep you in their holy and powerful keeping. Marie. Ah, you are dispatching a courier, Princess. I have already sent mine. I have written to my poor mother, said the smiling Mademoiselle Burine, speaking rapidly and swallowing her R's, and altogether bringing into the Princess Maria's concentrated and melancholy atmosphere what seemed like the breath of another world, where reigned gaiety, light-heartedness, and complacency. Princess, I must warn you, she added, lowering her voice. The prince has had a quarrel with Mikhail Ivanov. He is in a very bad humor, very morose. I warn you, you know. Ah, cher ami, replied the Princess Maria, I have asked of you never to speak to me of the humor in which my father happens to be. I do not allow myself to make remarks about him, and I do not wish others to. The princess glanced at her watch, and noticing that she was already five minutes behind the time when it was required of her to practice on the harpsichord, she hurried from the room with dismay pictured on her face. Between twelve o'clock and two the prince took his nap, and it was the immutable rule of the house that the princess should then practice. End of chapter 23 Part 1, Chapter 24 of War and Peace by Leo Tolstoy Translated by Nathan Haskell Doyle This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Marianne The gray-haired manservant was sitting in the cabinet, dozing and listening to the prince's snoring. From a distant part of the house, through the closed doors, came the notes of a difficult phrase of a Dussek sonata, repeated for the twentieth time. At this time, a coach and britchka drove up to the entrance door, and from the coach descended Prince André, who handed his little wife down and allowed her to pass ahead of him. The gray-haired Tikhon, in a wig, thrust his head out of the hall door and informed them in a whisper that the prince was asleep, and then softly closed the door. Tikhon was well aware that not even the arrival of the sun, nor any other event, however uncommon, should be allowed to interrupt the order of the day. Prince André knew this as well as Tikhon. He looked at his watch, as though to convince himself that there had been no change in his father's habits since he had seen him, and having satisfied himself on that score, turned to his wife. "'He will be awake in twenty minutes. Let us go to the Princess Maria,' said he. The little princess had grown stouter, but her eyes and her short, downy lip and her sweet smile were just the same as ever. "'Mosset un palais!' she exclaimed, glancing around with an expression as such people have in congratulating a host on a ball. "'Come along, quick, quick!' And she glanced with a smile at Tacon and her husband, and the footman who was leading the way. "'It is Marie practicing. Let us go softly so as to surprise her.' Prince André followed her with a polite but bored expression. "'You have grown older, Tikhon, he said to the old man-servant, who, as he passed by, kissed his hand. Just as they reached the room where the harpsichord was heard, the pretty, fair-haired Frenchwoman came tripping out. Mademoiselle Bourienne seemed overjoyed to see them. "'Ah, 
Quel bonheur pour la princesse, cried she. You are here at last. I must go and tell her. Non, non, I beg of you. You are Mademoiselle Bourline. I know you already from the friendship which my sister-in-law has for you, said the princess, kissing her. She is not expecting us. They went to the door of the sitting-room, where the phrase was being repeated again and again. Prince Andre paused and frowned, as though he were expecting a disagreeable scene. The princess went in. The phrase was broken off in the middle. A cry was heard, followed by the sound of hasty footsteps and kisses. When Prince Andre went in, the two sisters-in-law, who had only met once for a short time at Prince Andre's wedding, were still locked in a fond embrace, just as at the first moment of their meeting. Mademoiselle Burine was standing near them, with her hand on her heart and a beatific smile on her lips, evidently as ready to cry as to laugh. Prince Andre shrugged his shoulders and frowned, just as lovers of music frowned when they hear a discord. Both the women stood apart. Then once again, as though time were precious, they seized each other's hand and began to kiss them, and not satisfied with kissing their hands, they began to kiss each other in the face, and to Prince Andre's unqualified surprise, they both burst into tears and again began to kiss each other. Mademoiselle Burine was also melted. It was awkward enough for Prince Andre, but to the women it seemed perfectly natural to weep. Indeed, they could never have dreamed of a meeting without such an accompaniment. Ah, cher! Ah, Marie! they kept exclaiming, amid laughter and tears. I dreamed about you last night. Ah, Marie, you have grown so thin, and you have grown so stout. Je tout de suite reconnu, Madame la Princesse, put in Mademoiselle Brunine. And here I was not thinking of such a thing, cried the Princess Maria. Ah, André, I did not see you. Prince André kissed his sister's hand, and told her that she was as great a crybaby as ever. The Princess Maria turned to her brother, and through her tears, her eyes, now large and beautiful and luminous, rested on him with a fond, gentle, and sweet expression. The young wife chattered incessantly. Her short, downy upper lip, every instant drew down and touched the rosy underlip, and then curled again with a brilliant smile that made her eyes and her teeth shine. She related about an accident that happened at Spaskaya Gora, which threatened to be seriously dangerous in her condition, and then she apprised them that she had left all her dresses in Petersburg, and God knew what she would have to wear while here, and that Andre had greatly changed, and that Kitty Odunistova had married an old man, and that she had a husband for Marie, pour tout de bon, but that they would talk about that afterwards. The Princess Maria stood looking silently at her brother, and her lovely eyes beamed with affection and melancholy. It was evident that she was now following her own course of thought, quite independent of her sister-in-law's prattle. Right in the midst of the description of the last fete at Petersburg, she turned to her brother. "'And are you really going to the war, André?' she asked with a sigh. Lise also sighed. Yes, and I must be off by tomorrow, replied her brother. He leaves me, and God knows why, when he might have been promoted. The Princess Maria paid no attention to this remark, but following the thread of her thoughts gave her sister-in-law a significant glance from affectionate eyes. You are sure of it? The young wife's face changed. She sighed again. Certainly I am, said she. Ah, it is terrible. Her lip went down. She brought her face near to the young princess's, and again unexpectedly burst into tears. "'She needs to rest,' said Prince Andre, scowling. "'Don't you, Lisa? Take her to her room, and I will go to my batushka. How is he? Just the same as ever?' "'Just the same. But perhaps your eyes will see some change in him,' replied the princess cheerfully. "'The same regular hours, the same promenades in the garden, the lathe,' said Prince Andre with a barely perceptible smile, which proved that notwithstanding all his love and reverence for his father, he was not blind to his weaknesses. Yes, just the same hours, and the lathe, and the mathematics, and my geometry lessons, replied the princess merrily, as though her geometry lessons were among the most delightful reminiscences of her life. When the twenty minutes which remained for the princess' nap were over, Tikhon came to summon the young man to see his father, the old man allowed a variation in his mode of life in honor of his son. He commanded to have him come to him in his own room while he was dressing before dinner. The prince dressed in the old-time costume of a kafkan and powdered wig. When Prince Andre, 
not with the peevish face and manners which he assumed in society, but with a lively expression, such as he had when he was talking with Pierre, went into his father's room. The old man was at his toilet, sitting in a wide Morocco upholstered armchair in a wrapper, while Tikhon was putting on the last touches to his head. Ah, my soldier, so you are going to conquer Bonaparte, cried the old prince, and he shook his powdered head so far as he was allowed by the pigtail which Tikhon was busily plaiting. You do well to go against him, otherwise he would soon be calling us his subjects. Are you well? And he offered his son his cheek. The old man awoke from his noon nap in an excellent frame of mind. He was accustomed to say that a nap after dinner was silver, but one before dinner was golden. He squinted cheerily at his son from under his thick, beetling brows. Prince Andrei went and kissed his father on the spot designated. He made no reply to his father's favorite topic of conversation, and his sarcasms on the military men of the present time, and especially on Napoleon. "'Yes, I have come to you, Batyushka, with my wife, who soon expects to be a mother,' said Prince Andrei, watching with eager and reverent eyes all the play of his father's features. "'How is your health?' "'Only fools and rakes ever need to be unwell, my boy, and you know me, busy from morning till night, and temperate, and of course I'm well.' Thank God for that, said the son, smiling. God has nothing to do with it. Well, continued the old man, returning to his favorite hobby, tell us how the Germans and Bonaparte have taught us to fight, according to this new science of yours, that you call strategy. Prince Andrei smiled. Let me have time to collect my wits, Batushka, said he, and his expression showed that his father's foibles did not prevent him from reverencing and loving him. Why— you see I have not even been to my room yet. Nonsense! Nonsense! cried the old man, pulling at his little pigtail to assure himself that it was firmly plated, and grasping his son by the arm. The quarters for your wife are all ready. The Princess Maria will take her there and show them to her, and they will chatter their three basketfuls. That's their women's way. I'm glad to have her here. Sit down and talk. I understand Michelson's army, and Tolstoy's too. It's a simultaneous descent— but what's the southern army going to do? Prussia remains neutral, I know that. But how about Austria? he asked, as he got up from his chair and began to walk up and down the room, with Tikhon running after him to give him the various parts of his attire. What's Sweden going to do? How will they get across Pomerania? Prince Andrei, perceiving the urgency of his father's inquiries, began, at first unwillingly, but gradually warming up more and more, to explain the plan of operations determined upon for the campaign. As he spoke, he involuntarily, from very force of habit, kept dropping from Russian into French. He explained how the army of ninety thousand was to threaten Prussia and force her to abandon her neutrality and take part in the war, how a portion of this army was to go to Strassund and unite with the Swedish forces, how two hundred and twenty thousand Austrians, with a hundred thousand Russians, were to engage in active operations in Italy and on the Rhine, and how 50,000 Russians and 50,000 English were to disembark at Naples, and how this army, with a total of 500,000 men, was to make an attack simultaneously from different sides upon the French. The old prince did not manifest the least interest in the description any more than if he had not heard it, and continued to dress himself as he walked up and down, though three times he unexpectedly interrupted him, once he stopped him, crying, "'The white one! The white one!' That meant Tikhon had not given him the waistcoat that he wished. The second time he stopped him and asked, "'And is the baby expected soon?' And reproachfully shaking his head, said, "'That's too bad. Go on, go on.' The third time, when Prince Andrei had finished his description, the old man sang in a high falsetto, with a cracked voice of age, "'Marburg, sauve en Douce compte reviendra. The son merely smiled. I don't say that I approve of this plan, said he. I'm only telling you what it is. Napoleon, of course, has his plan, which is probably as good as ours. Well, you haven't told me anything that is in the least new, and the old man thoughtfully continued to hum the refrain, Douce compte il reviendra. Go into the dining room. End of chapter 24. Part 1, chapter 25 of War and Peace by Leo Tolstoy. Translated by Nathan Haskell Doyle. 
This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Marianne. At the appointed hour, the prince, powdered and shaved, went to the dining room, where his daughter-in-law, the Princess Maria, and Mademoiselle Burine, and the architect were waiting for him. The latter was allowed at the table through an old caprice of the prince, though his insignificance of position would naturally have precluded him from being shown such an honor. The prince, who was a great stickler for differences of rank, and rarely admitted to his table even the important functionaries of the province, suddenly selected Mikhail Ivanovitch, who blew his nose in the corner of a checked handkerchief, as a living example of the theory that all men were equal, and more than once assured his daughter that the architect was as good as they were. At the table the prince was very apt to address his conversation mainly to the speechless Mikhail Ivanovitch. In the dining-room, tremendously lofty, like all the rest of the rooms in the mansion, the prince's butlers and serving-men, each standing behind a chair, were waiting his coming. The major-domo, with a napkin over his arm, glanced to see that the table was properly set, beckoned to the waiters, and constantly let his troubled eyes wander from the clock to the door where the prince was expected to enter. Prince Andrei was looking at a huge gilded frame, which he had never before seen, containing a representation of the genealogical tree of the Bolkonskys, which hung opposite a similar frame with a badly executed painting, evidently perpetrated by some domestic artist, and meant to be a portrait of a reigning prince, in a crown, showing that he was descended from Rurik, and was the originator of the house of Bolkonsky. Prince Andrei was studying the genealogical tree, and shaking his head and laughing, as though the portrait struck him as something ludicrous. "'How like him this all is!' he was saying to the Princess Maria, as she came up to him. The Princess Maria looked at her brother in amazement. She could not understand what he could find to amuse him, all that her father did inspired in her a reverence that removed it beyond criticism. "'Every man has his Achilles' heel,' continued Prince Andrei. "'With his tremendous intellect, the idea of going to this absurdity, donné dans ce ridicule.' The Princess Maria could not approve of this audacious judgment of her brother's, and was just about to reprove him when the steps which they were awaiting were heard coming from the cabinet. The prince came in briskly even gaily, as was his universal custom, as though he meant by his lively ways to make a contrast with the stern routine of the house. Just at the instant that the great clock struck two, and was answered by a feebler tone of another in the reception room, the prince made his appearance. He paused. From under his thick, overhanging brows, his keen, flashing, stern eyes surveyed all who were present, and then rested on his son's young wife. The young princess instantly experienced that feeling of fear and reverence which this old man inspired in all those around him, a feeling akin to that experienced by courtiers at the coming of the Tsar. He smoothed the princess's head, and then, with a clumsy motion, patted her on the back of the neck. "'I am glad to see you, glad to see you,' said he, and, after looking into her face steadily once more, he turned away and sat down in his place." "'Sit down, sit down. Mikhail Ivanovitch, sit down.' He signed his daughter-in-law to the place next him. The waiter pushed the chair up for her. "'Ho, ho,' said the old man, looking at her critically. "'Your time is coming. Too bad.' He smiled dryly, coldly, disagreeably, with his lips alone, as usual, and not with his eyes. "'You must walk, walk, as much as possible, as much as possible.' said he. The little princess did not hear, and did not wish to hear, his words. She said nothing, and seemed dispirited. The prince asked after her father, and she replied and smiled. He asked about common acquaintances. The princess grew more animated, and began to deliver messages, and tell the prince the gossip of the town. The Countess Apratskina, poor woman, has lost her husband, and quite cried her eyes out, said she growing still more lively. The livelier she became, the more sternly the prince looked at her, and suddenly, as though he had studied her enough, and had formed a sufficiently clear idea of her mental caliber, 
he turned abruptly away and began to talk with Mikhail Ivanovitch. Well, now, Mikhaila Ivanovitch, it is going to go hard with our Bonaparte. As Prince Andrei has been telling me, he always spoke of his son in the third person, great forces are collecting against him. But then you and I have always considered him to be a windbag. Mikhail Ivanovitch really did not know when he and the prince had ever said any such thing about Bonaparte, but perceiving that this was necessary as a preliminary for the prince's favorite subject of conversation, looked in surprise at the young prince, and wondered what would be the outcome of it. "'He is great at tactics,' said the old prince to his son, referring to the architect, and again the conversation turned on the war, on Bonaparte, and the generals of the present day, and the great men of the reign. The old prince, it seemed, was persuaded in his own mind that all the men at the head of affairs at the present day were mere schoolboys, who did not know even the A, B, C's of war and civil administration, and that Bonaparte was an insignificant Frenchman who had been successful simply from the fact that there were no Potemkins or Suvorovs to meet him. But he was persuaded, also, that no political complications, of any account, existed in Europe, that the war did not amount to anything, but was a sort of puppet show at which the men of the present day were playing while pretending to do something great. Prince Andrei took his father's sarcasms at the new men in good part and with apparent pleasure led him on and heard what he had to say. The past always seems better than the present, said the young man, yet didn't that same Servorov fall into the trap which Moreau laid for him, fell in and hadn't the wit to get himself out of it? "'Who told you that? Who told you?' cried the prince. Suvorov, And he flung away his plate, which Tikhon was quick enough to catch. Suvorov, Consider, Prince Andrei. Friedrich and Suvorov were a pair. Morio. Morio would have been taken prisoner if Suvorov's hands had been free. But he had his hands on a Hofskrieg's Wirtschnapsroth. The devil himself could not have done anything.' Now, if you go on, you will find out what these Hofskriegs Wirtz Schnapsros are like. Suvorov was no match for them. What chance do you suppose Mikhail Kurtisov will have? No, my dear young friend, he went on to say, there's no chance for you and your generals against Bonaparte. You must needs take Frenchmen, so that birds of a feather may fight together. You have sent the German Phelan to New York, to America, after the Frenchman Rouraud said he, referring to the overtures that had been made that same year to Moreau to enter the Russian service. It's marvelous. Were the Potemkins, Suvorovs, Orlovs, Germans, pray? No, brother, either all of you have lost your wits, or I have gone into my second childhood. God give you good luck. But we shall see. Bonaparte, a great general, on their side. Hm. I don't say at all that all our arrangements are wise, returned Prince Andrei. Only I can't understand how you have such a low opinion of Bonaparte. Laugh as much as you please, but Bonaparte is, nevertheless, a great general. Mikhail Ivanovitch, cried the old prince to the architect, who was giving his attention to the roast, and devoutly hoping that he was quite forgotten. I have told you, have I not, that Bonaparte was a great tactician, and he says so, too. How, your illustriousness, replied the architect. The prince again laughed his chilling laugh. Bonaparte was born with a silver spoon in his mouth. His soldiers are excellent. And then, again, he had the good luck to fight with the Germans first. Only a lazy man would fail to whip the Germans. Ever since the world began, the Germans have always been whipped, and they have never whipped anyone. Oh, yes, each other. He made his reputation by fighting them. And the prince began to expatiate on all the blunders that Napoleon, in his opinion, had made in all his wars, and even in his act of administration. His son did not dispute what he said, but it was evident that whatever arguments were employed against him, he was just as little inclined to alter his opinion as the old prince himself. Prince Andrei listened refraining from engaging in any discussion, 
and only smiling as he involuntarily wondered how it was possible for this old man, who had lived for so many years like a hermit in the country, to know so thoroughly and accurately all the military and political occurrences that had taken place in Europe during the last years, and was able to form such an opinion of them. "'You think, do you, that I am too old to understand the present state of affairs? Well, this is all there is of it. I can't sleep o' nights. Now, wherein is this general of yours so great? Where has he shown it?' "'It would take too long to tell,' replied the son. "'Well, then, go off to your Bonaparte. Mademoiselle Bourine, here is another admirer of your clodhopper of an emperor,' he cried in excellent French. "'You know that I am not a Bonapartist, prince.' "'Du c'est quoi il revendra,' hummed the prince, in his falsetto, and with a smile that was still more falsetto, he got up and left the table. The little princess, during the whole time of the discussion and the rest of the meal, sat in silence, looking in alarm, now at her husband's father, now at the Princess Maria. After they left the table, she took her sister-in-law's arm and drew her into the next room. "'How bright your father is,' said she. "'That's probably the reason that he makes me afraid of him.' "'Ah, he is so good,' exclaimed the princess. End of chapter 25 Part 1, Chapter 26 of War and Peace by Leo Tolstoy Translated by Nathan Haskell Doyle This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Marianne The next evening, Prince Andre was about to take his departure. The old prince, not making any change in his routine, had gone to his room immediately after dinner. The young wife was with the Princess Maria. Prince Andre, having put on a travelling coat without epaulets, was engaged in his room, with his valet, in packing up. He himself had personally looked after the carriage, and the arrangements of his luggage, and ordered the horses to be put in. In the chamber remained only those things which Prince Andre always took with him, his dressing-case, a huge silver bottle-holder, two Turkish pistols, and a sabre which his father had captured at Okchakov and presented to him. All these appurtenances had been put in the most perfect order. All were bright and clean, in woolen bags, carefully strapped. If men are ever inclined to think about their actions, the moment when they are about to go away and enter upon some new course of life is certain to induce a serious frame of mind. Generally at such moments, the past comes up for review and plans are made for the future. Prince Andre's face was very thoughtful and tender. With his hands behind his back, he was walking briskly, from corner to corner, up and down the room, with his eyes fixed and occasionally shaking his head. Was it terrible for him to be going to the war, or was he a little saddened at the thought of leaving his wife? Perhaps there was a trifle of each feeling. However, hearing steps in the entry, and evidently not wishing to be seen in any such state, he hurriedly dropped his hands and paused by the table, as though engaged in fastening the cover of his dressing-case, and his face became, as usual, serene and impenetrable. The steps he heard were those of the Princess Maria. "'I was told that you had ordered the horses put in,' said she, panting, she had evidently been running, "'and I did so want to have a little talk with you, all alone. God knows how long it will be before we see each other again. You are not angry with me for coming. You have changed very much, Andrusha.' she added, as though an explanation of such a question. She smiled as she called him by the pet diminutive, Andrusha. Evidently, it was strange for her to think that this stern, handsome man was the same Andrusha, the slender, frolicsome lad who had been the playmate of her childhood. "'Where's Lise?' he asked, merely replying to her question with a smile. "'She was so tired that she fell asleep on the sofa in my room. Oh, Andre!' "'What a treasure of a wife you have,' she said, as she sat down on the sofa, facing her brother. "'She's a perfect child, such a sweet, merry-hearted child. I have learned to love her dearly.' Prince Andre made no reply, but the princess noticed the ironical and scornful expression which her words called forth on his face. "'But you must be indulgent to her little weaknesses. Who is there that is without them, Andre?' You must not forget that she was educated and brought up in society. 
and besides, her position is now not all roses. We ought always to put ourselves in the place of another. To understand is to forgive. Just think how hard it is on the poor little woman, after the gay life to which she is accustomed, to be parted from her husband, and to be left alone in the country, and in her condition. It is very hard. Prince Andrei smiled and looked at his sister, as we smile when we look at people whose motives are perfectly transparent to us. You live in the country, and don't find this life so horrible, do you? I? But that's another thing. Why should you speak about me? I have no desire for any other life, because I have never known any other life. But you think, André, what it is for a healthy young woman to be buried for the best years of her life in the country, alone, too, for Papenka is always busy, and I, you know what poor company I am for a woman who has been accustomed to the best society, there is only Mademoiselle Bourine. Your Bourine does not please me very much, said Prince André. Oh, how can you say so? She is very kind and good, and, what is more, is greatly to be pitied. She has no one, no one at all. To tell you the truth, she is not at all necessary, but if anything she is in my way. You know that I have always been somewhat a misanthrope, and now, more than ever, I love to be alone. Mon père is very fond of her. She and Mikhail Ivanitch are two people for, to whom he is always polite and kind, because both of them are under obligations to him. As Stern says, we do not love men so much for the good that they do us, as for the good that we do them. Mon père took her in as an orphan from the street, and she is very good, and Mon père loves her way of reading. She always reads aloud to him in the evening. She reads beautifully. Now tell the truth, Marie. I am afraid my father's temper must be very trying to you sometimes. Isn't it so? suddenly demanded Prince André. The Princess Maria was at first dumbfounded, then terrified at this question. To me? Me? Trying? she stammered. He has always been harsh, but now he has become desperately trying, I should think, said Prince André, speaking lightly of his father, apparently, for the sake of perplexing or testing his sister. You're good to everyone, André, but you have such pride of intellect— said the princess, following the trend of her own thoughts rather than the course of the conversation. All that is a great sin. Have we any right to judge our father? And even if we had, what other feeling besides veneration could such a man as mon père inspire? I am so happy and content to live with him. I only wish that all were as happy as I am. Her brother shook his head incredulously. There is only one thing that is hard for me, I will tell you the truth about it, André. It is father's ways of thinking of religious things. I cannot understand how a man with such a tremendous intellect can fail to see what is as clear as day, and can go so far astray. This is the one thing that makes me unhappy. But even in this I have noticed lately a shade of improvement. Lately his sarcasms have not been quite so pronounced, and there is a monk whom he has allowed to come in and have a long talk with him. "'Well, my dear, I am afraid that you and the monk wasted your powder,' said Prince André, in a jesting but affectionate way. "'Ah, oh, mon ami, all I can do is to pray to God and hope that he will hear me. "'André,' she said timidly, after a moment's silence, "'I have one great favor to ask of you. "'What is that, my dear? "'Promise me that you will not refuse me. "'It won't be any trouble to you at all.' and nothing unworthy of you in doing it, but it will be a great comfort to me. Promise me, Andrushka, said she, thrusting her hand into her reticule and holding something in it, but not yet showing it, as though what she held constituted the object of her request, and she were unwilling to take this something from the reticule until she were assured of his promise to do what she desired. She looked at her brother with a timid, beseeching glance. Even if it required great trouble, I would— replied Prince André, evidently foreseeing what the request was. "'Think whatever you please. I know you are exactly like mon père. Think whatever you please, but do this for my sake. Please do. My father's father, our grandfather, wore it in all his battles. Not even now did she take from the reticule what she held in her hand. So, will you promise me?' "'But what is it?' 
Andre, I give you this little picture with my blessing, and you must promise me that you will never take it off. Will you promise? If it does not weigh two poots, and won't break my neck, I will do it if it will give you any pleasure. But at that instant, noticing the pained expression which passed over his sister's face at this jest, he regretted it. With pleasure, really with pleasure, my dear, he added. He will save and pardon you in spite of your hardness of heart, and he will bring you to himself, because in him alone is truth and peace, said she, in a voice trembling with emotion, and with a gesture of solemnity held up before her brother an ancient oval medallion of the Saviour, with a black face in a silver frame, attached to a silver chain of delicate workmanship. She made a sign of the cross, kissed the medallion, and held it out to André. Please, André, for my sake. Her large eyes were kindled by the rays of a soft and kindly light, which transfigured her thin, sickly face and made it beautiful. Her brother was about to take the medallion, but she stopped him. He understood what she meant, and crossed himself, and kissed the image. His face was both tender, for he was touched, and, at the same time, ironical. Thanks, my dear. She kissed him on the brow, and again sat down on the sofa. Both were silent. As I was saying to you, André, be kind and magnanimous, as you always used to be. Don't judge Lise harshly, she began after a little. She is so sweet, so good, and her position is very hard just now. Why, Masha, I have not said that I found any fault with my wife or have been vexed with her. Why do you say such things to me? The Princess Maria flushed, and she was silent as though she felt guilty. I have not said anything to you, but someone has been talking to you, and I am sorry for that. The red patches flamed still more noticeably on the Princess Maria's forehead, neck, and cheeks. She tried to say something, but speech failed her. Her brother had guessed right. His little wife after dinner had wept, and confessed her forebodings about the birth of her baby, and how she dreaded it, and poured out her complaints against her father-in-law and her husband. And after she had cried, she fell asleep. Prince André was sorry for his sister. I wish you to know this, Masha, that I find no fault with my wife. I never have found fault with her, and never shall, and there is nothing for which I can reproach myself. And this shall always be so, no matter in what circumstances I find myself. But if you wish to know the truth, if you wish to know whether I am happy, I tell you, no. Is she happy? No. Why is it? I don't know. As he said this, he got up, went over to his sister, and bending down, kissed her on the forehead. His handsome eyes showed an unwanted gleam of sentiment and kindliness, though he looked not at his sister, but over her head at the dark opening of the door. Let us go to her. It is time to say good-bye. Or rather, you go ahead and wake her, and I will follow you. Petrushka, he called to the valet, come here. Pick up those things. This goes under the seat, this at the right. The Princess Maria got up and directed her steps toward the door. Then she paused. André, said she, in French, if you had faith, you would have implored God to give you the love which you do not feel, and your prayers would have been heard. Yes, perhaps so, said Prince André. Go on, Masha. I will follow immediately. On the way to his sister's room, in the gallery which connected one part of the house with the other, Prince André met the sweetly smiling Mademoiselle Bourine. It was the third time that she had crossed his path that day in the corridor, and with the same enthusiastic and naive smile. "'Ah, I thought you were in your own room,' said she, blushing a little and dropping her eyes. Prince André looked at her sternly. His face suddenly grew wrathful. He gave her no answer, but looked at her with such a scornful expression that the little Frenchwoman flushed scarlet and turned away without another word. When he reached his sister's room, the princess, his wife, was already awake, and her blithe voice was heard through the open door. She was chattering as fast as her tongue would let her, as though she were anxious to make up for lost time after long repression. No, Marie, but just imagine the old Countess Zubova, with her false curls and a mouthful of fake teeth, as though she were trying to cheat old age. Ha <laughs> ha! 
Prince Andrei had heard his wife get off exactly the same phrase about the Countess Zubova and the same joke at least five times. He went quietly into the room. The princess, plump and rosy, was sitting in an easy chair, with her work in her hands, and was talking an incessant stream, repeating her Petersburg reminiscences and even the familiar Petersburg phrases. Prince Andrei went up to her, smoothed her hair, and asked if she felt rested. She answered him and went on with her story. A coach with a six in hand was waiting at the front entrance. It was a dark autumn night. The coachman could not see the pole of the carriage. Men with lanterns were standing on the doorsteps. The great mansion was alive with lights, shining through the lofty windows. The domestics were gathered in the entry to say goodbye to the young prince. All the household were collected in the hall. Mikhail Ivanovitch, Mademoiselle Berlin, the Princess Maria, and her sister-in-law. Prince Andrei had been summoned to his father's cabinet, where the old prince wanted to bid him goodbye privately. All were waiting for their coming. When Prince Andrei went into the cabinet, the old prince, with spectacles on his nose and in his white dressing gown, in which he never received any one except his son, was sitting at the table and writing. He looked around. Are you off? And he went on with his writing. I have come to bid you goodbye. Kiss me here, he indicated his cheek. Thank you, thank you. Why do you thank me? Because you don't dilly-dally, because you don't hang on to your wife's petticoats. Service before all. Thank you. Thank you. And he went on with his writing so vigorously that the ink flew from his sputtering pen. If you have anything to say, speak. I can attend to these two things at once, he added. About my wife. I am so sorry to be obliged to leave her on your hands. What nonsense is that? Tell me what you want. When it is time for my wife to be confined, send to Moscow for an accoucheur. Get him here. The old prince paused, and pretending not to understand, fixed his eyes on his son. I know that no one can help if nature does not do her work, said Prince Andrei, evidently confused. I am aware that out of millions of cases only one goes amiss. But this is her whim and mine. They have been talking to her. She had a dream, and she is afraid. Hmm. <laughs> growled the old prince, taking up his pen again. I will do so. He wrote a few more lines, suddenly turned upon his son, and said with a sneer, Bad business, eh? What is bad, Batushka? Wife, said the old prince, with laconic significance. I don't understand you, said Prince Andrei. Well, there's nothing to be done about it, my young friend, said the prince. They're all alike. There's no way of getting unmarried. Don't be disturbed. I won't tell anyone, but you know tis so. He seized his son's hand in his small, bony fingers and shook it, looking him straight in the face with his keen eyes, which seemed to look through a man, and then once more laughed his cold laugh. The son sighed, thereby signifying that his father read him correctly. The old man continued to fold and seal his letters with his usual rapidity and when he had finished he caught up and put away the wax, the seal, and the paper. What can you do? She's a beauty. I will see that everything is done. Be easy on that score, said he abruptly, as he sealed the last letter. Andre made no reply. It was both pleasant and disagreeable to have his father understand him so well. The old man stood up and handed a letter to his son. Listen, said he, don't worry about your wife. Whatever can be done, shall be done. Now listen, give this letter to Mikhail Ilarionovitch. I have written him to employ you in the good places and not keep you too long as adjutant. It's a nasty position. Tell him I remember him with affection and write me how he receives you. If all goes well, stay and serve him. Nikolai Andreitch Bolkonsky's son must not serve anyone from mere favoritism. Now, come here. He spoke so rapidly that he did not finish half his words, but his son understood him. He led him to a desk, threw back a lid, opened a little box and took out a notebook, written in his own large, angular, but close hand. I shall probably die before you do. Remember, these are my memoirs. They are to be given to the emperor after my death. Now, see here. Take this banknote and this letter. 
This is a prize for the one who shall write a history of the wars of Suvorov. Send it to the Academy. Here are my remarks. After I am gone, you may read them. You will find them worth your while. Andre did not tell his father that he would probably live a long time yet. He felt it was not necessary to say that. I will do it all, Petushka, said he. Well, then, good-bye. He offered him his hand to kiss, and then gave him an embrace. Remember one thing, Prince Andre. If you are killed, it will be hard for me to bear. I am an old man. He unexpectedly paused, and then as suddenly proceeded, in a tempestuous voice, but if I should hear that you have behaved unworthy of a son of Nikolai Bolkonsky, I should be ashamed, he hissed. You should not have said that to me, Batyushka, replied the son with a smile. The old man was silent. I have still another request to make of you, Prince Andrei went on to say. If I should be killed, and if a son should be born to me, don't let him go from you, as I was saying last evening. Let him grow up under your roof please? Not let your wife have him, asked the old man, and tried to laugh. Both stood in silence for some moments, facing each other. The old man's keen eyes gazed straight into his son's. There was a slight tremor in the lower part of the old prince's face. We have said good-bye. Now go, said he suddenly. Go, he cried in a stern, loud voice, opening his cabinet door. What is it? What's the matter? asked Prince Andrei's wife and sister, as the young man came out, and they caught a momentary glimpse of the old prince, in his white dressing-gown, and without his wig, and in his spectacles, as he appeared at the door, screaming at his son. Prince Andrei sighed, and made no answer. Well, said he, turning to his wife, and this well, new, sounded chillingly sarcastic, as though he had said, Now begin your little comedy. Andrei, already? said the little wife, turning pale, and fixing her terror-stricken eyes on her husband. He took her in his arms. She gave a cry and fell fainting on his shoulder. He carefully disengaged himself of her form, looked into her face, and tenderly laid her in an armchair. Adieu, Marie, said he, gently to his sister, kissed her hand, and hastened out of the room. The fainting princess lay in the chair. Mademoiselle Burine chafed her temples, the Princess Maria, holding her up, was still looking, with her lovely eyes dim with tears, at the door through which Prince Andre had disappeared, and her blessing followed him. In the cabinet the old prince was heard repeatedly blowing his nose, with sharp, angry reports, like pistol shots. Prince Andre had hardly left the room when the cabinet door was hurriedly flung open, and the prince's stern figure appeared in the white dressing gown. "'Has he gone?' he asked. Well, it is just as well, said he. Then, looking angrily at the unconscious little princess, he shook his head reproachfully and clapped the door to after him. End of chapter 26 and end of part 1 of War and Peace by Leo Tolstoy Volume 1, part 2, chapter 1 of War and Peace This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Marianne Spiegel. War and Peace by Leo Tolstoy. Translated by Nathan Haskell Doyle. Volume 1, Part 2, 1805. Chapter 1. In October 1805, the Russian army were cantoned in certain villages and towns in the Archduchy of Austria, making a heavy burden for the inhabitants, and still new regiments were on the way from Russia, and concentrating around the fortress of Brunau, where Kutuzov, the commander-in-chief, had his headquarters. On the 23rd of October, one of the many regiments of infantry that had just arrived stopped about a half-mile from the city, waiting to be reviewed by the commander-in-chief. Notwithstanding the un-Russian landscape, orchards, stone walls, tiled roofs, and mountains on the horizon, and the un-Russian aspect of the people, who gathered to look with curiosity at the soldiers, this regiment presented exactly the same appearance as every other Russian regiment getting ready for inspection anywhere in the center of Russia. The evening before, during their last march, 
word had been received that the commander-in-chief would review the regiment. The words of the order had not seemed altogether clear to the regimental commander, and the question having arisen, how it was to be taken, were they to be marching in order or not, he called a council of officers, at which it was decided that the regiment should be presented in parade dress, on the principle that it is always better to go beyond than not come up to the requirements. And the soldiers, after a march of three hundred verse, during which they had not once closed their eyes, were kept all night mending and cleaning up. The aides and captains classified and enrolled their men, and by morning the regiment, instead of a straggling, disorderly mob, such as it had been during the last stage of their march, presented a compact mass of two thousand men, each one of whom knew his place and his duty. Every button and every strap were in order, and shining with neatness. Not only were all the externals put in perfect order, but if the commander-in-chief should take it into his head to look under the uniforms, then he would have found that each man had on a clean shirt, and that in each knapsack were the required number of things, shiltsi imiltsi, all and soap, as the soldiers express it. There was only one particular in regard to which no one could be satisfied. This was footwear. The shoes of more than half of the men were in tatters. But this lack was not the fault of the regimental commander, since, notwithstanding his repeated demands, the necessary goods had not been furnished by the Austrian commissariat, and, moreover, the regiment had marched a thousand verse. The regimental commander was an elderly general, of sanguine complexion, with grey brows and side whiskers, stout and broad. The distance from his chest to his back was greater than across his shoulders. He wore a brand new uniform, which showed the creases caused by having been folded, and on his shoulders were heavy gold epaulets, which raised his fat shoulders still higher. The regimental commander had the aspect of a man who had happily accomplished one of the most important functions of life. He marched up and down in front of the line, and as he marched he shook at every step, slightly bending his back. It could be seen that the regimental commander was very fond of his regiment, and felt happy at the idea that all his mental faculties were absorbed in it. But, nevertheless, his pompous gait seemed to insinuate that over and above his military interests there was still left no small room in his heart for the affairs of society and the feminine sex. "'Well, Batushka, Mikhailo Miltrik, said he, turning to one of the majors, who stepped forward with a smile. It was evident that all were happy. We had a pretty tough tussle last night, didn't we? However, according to my idea, our regiment isn't one of the worst, eh? The major appreciated the jocund irony and laughed. No, we should not be driven off from the Empress's field. What is it? asked the commander, catching sight of two horsemen galloping along the road to the city, lined with signalmen. It was an adjutant, with a Cossack riding behind him. The adjutant had been sent from headquarters to explain what had been enigmatical in the last evening's order, and especially to insist upon it that the commander-in-chief wished to review the regiment in exactly the condition in which it had arrived, in cloaks, gun covers, and without any preparations whatever. The evening before, it had happened that a member of the Hofkriegsrath had arrived from Vienna, asking and urging that Kutuzov should make all haste to join the Allied armies under the Archduke Ferdinand and General Mack. And Kutuzov, considering that this junction was not advantageous, desired to exhibit in support of his own theories, and to have the Austrian general see for himself the pitiable state in which the army of Russia had arrived. With this end in view, he was anxious to find the regiment in marching order, and therefore the worse the situation of the men, the more agreeable it would be to him. The adjutant knew nothing about these reasons, but he transmitted to the regimental commander the general-in-chief's urgent desire that the men should be in marching order, and added that if it were otherwise the commander-in-chief would be very much offended. On hearing these words, the regimental commander hung his head, silently shrugged his shoulders, and spread his hands with a despairing gesture. This is great doings, he cried. It's what I told you, Mikhailo Mitrich, in marching order, in cloaks, said he, turning reproachfully to the major. Ah, my God, 
he exclaimed, and stepped resolutely forward. Gentlemen, captains, he cried, in a voice accustomed to command. Sergeants, will they be here soon, he asked, turning to the adjutant with an expression of deferential politeness, evidently proportioned to the dignity of the personage of whom he was speaking. Within an hour, I think. Shall we have time to make the change? I don't know, General. The regimental commander, hastening into the ranks, made the dispositions for changing back into marching costume again. The captains ran to their companies, the sergeants bustled about, the cloaks were not altogether in order, and in an instant the solid squares which had just been standing silently and orderly stirred, stretched out, and began to buzz with busy voices. Soldiers were running this way and that, getting their knapsacks on their shoulders and over their heads, taking down their cloaks and lifting their arms high in the air, trying to get them into their sleeves. Within half an hour the whole regiment was in the same order as before. Only the squares were transformed from black to gray. The regimental commander was again walking up and down in front of the regiment, with the same tottering gait and inspecting it from a distance. "'What does that mean? What is that?' he cried, suddenly halting. "'Captain of the Third Company!' The general wants the captain of the third company. The general wants the third captain. The general wants the third company, cried various voices along the ranks, and an aide hastened to discover the missing officer. Even while the sounds of gruff voices commingling, and some even crying the company wants the general, rang along the lines, the missing officer appeared from behind his company, and although he was well on in years, and not used to running, he came toward the general at an awkward dog-trot on his tiptoes. The captain's face expressed such anxiety as a schoolboy feels when he is called upon to recite a lesson that has not been learned. His nose was red and covered with blotches, evidently caused by intemperance, and his mouth twitched nervously. The regimental commander surveyed the delinquent captain from head to foot as he came up panting, and slackened his pace as he approached. "'Do you let your men wear women's seraphans? "'What does that mean?' cried the regimental commander, thrusting out his lower jaw, and pointing to a soldier in the ranks of the third company, who wore a colored capote of broadcloth in violent contrast with the cloaks of the other soldiers. "'Where have you been? "'The commander-in-chief is expected, and here you are out of your place, eh?' I will teach you to dress your men in Cossack coats for review. Hey! The captain, not taking his eyes from his chief, kept his two fingers at his visor, as though he found his salvation now in this one position alone. Well, why don't you speak? Whom have you there, in that Hungarian costume? sternly demanded the regimental commander, with grim fastidiousness. Your Excellency... Well, what of your excellency? Your excellency, and your excellency. But what does... What do you mean by your excellency? Nobody knows what you mean. Your excellency, that is Dolokhov, cashiered, stammered the captain. Well, was he cashiered to be a field marshal or a private? If as a private, then he ought to be dressed like the others, in uniform. Your excellency... You yourself allowed him to dress so on the march. Allowed him? Allowed him? That's always the way with you young men, said the general, cooling down a little. Allowed him? We tell you one thing and you... The general paused. We tell you one thing and you... Well, he said with a fresh access of temper, be good enough to have your men dress decently and the regimental commander glanced at the adjutant and proceeded along the line with his faltering gait. It could be seen that his outburst of temper had given him great satisfaction, and that as he passed along the line he wanted to find some excuse for further violence. Berating one officer for not having a clean gorget, and another for having his company dressed unevenly, he proceeded to Company 3. "'How are you standing? Where is your leg?' "'Your leg! Where is it?' screamed the regimental commander, with a suggestion of keen suffering in his voice, passing by half a dozen men to come to Dolokhov, who was dressed in a bluish capote. 
Dolokhov slowly straightened his bended leg and, with his keen, bold eyes, stared into the general's face. Why is that blue capote? Off with it. Sergeant, strip him. The blun— He did not have time to finish. General, I am bound to fulfill orders, but I am not bound to put up— began Dolokhov hastily. No talking in the ranks. No talking. No talking. I am not bound to put up with insults, cried Dolokhov in a loud ringing voice. The eyes of the general and the private met. The general said no more, but angrily pulled down his tight belt. Have the goodness to change your coat, I beg of you, said he, as he turned away. End of chapter 1 Part 2 Chapter 2 of War and Peace by Leo Tolstoy Translated by Nathan Haskell Doyle This Slippervox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Marianne He is coming, cried one of the signal men. The regimental commander, flushing scarlet, ran to his horse, seized the stirrup with trembling hands, threw himself into the saddle, straightened himself up, drew his saber, and with a radiant, resolute face drew his mouth to one side, ready to shout his order. A shiver ran through the regiment, as though it were a great bird about to spread its wings. Then it became motionless. "'Eyes front cried the regimental commander, in a voice trembling with emotion. Pleasant as it sounded to himself, it was peremptory toward the regiment and suggestive of welcome to the approaching chief. Along the broad highway, unpaved, shaded with trees, came a high Viennese calash, painted blue and swinging easily on its springs, as its six horses trotted briskly along. Behind it galloped the suite and an escort of Croatians. Next Kutuzov sat the Austrian general, in white uniforms, which made a peculiar contrast with the dark Russian ones. The calash drew up near the regiment. Kutuzov and the Austrian general were engaged in conversation in low tones, and Kutuzov smiled slightly as he slowly and heavily stepped down from the carriage, exactly as though the two thousand men who were breathlessly gazing at him and the regimental commander did not exist. The word of command rang out, and again the regiment stirred into life and presented arms. In the dead silence the undertone of the commander-in-chief was heard. The regiment shouted, Long life to your highness, and again all was still. At first Kutuzov stood where he was and watched the regiment go through this evolution, then side by side with the general in the white uniform, and accompanied by his suite, he started to walk down the line. By the way in which the regimental commander had saluted his chief and kept his eyes fastened upon him, and now followed behind the two generals as they walked down the lines, and as he drew himself up and bent forward to listen to every word that fell from their lips, it was evident that he fulfilled his duties as a subordinate with even greater satisfaction than he did those of a commander. The regiment, thanks to the commander's stern discipline and strenuous endeavors, was in excellent condition compared to the others which had come to Brunau at the same time. There were only two hundred and seventeen sick and stragglers, and all things were in excellent order, with the exception of the shoes. Kutuzov proceeded down the ranks occasionally stopping to say a few friendly words to officers or even privates whom he had known during the war with Turkey. Glancing at their shoes, he more than once shook his head mournfully and directed the Austrian general's attention to them with an expression that meant to imply that no one was to blame for it, but it was a pity, all the same, to see such a state of things. The regimental commander, at each time that he did so, pushed forward fearing to lose a single word that his chief might speak regarding his regiment. Behind Kutuzov, just near enough to be able to catch every word, however lightly spoken, that might fall from his lips, followed the twenty men of his suite, talking among themselves and occasionally laughing. Nearest to the commander-in-chief walked a handsome adjutant. This was Prince Bolkonsky. Next him went his messmate, Nesvitsky, a tall and remarkably stalwart staff officer, with a kindly, smiling, handsome face and liquid eyes. Nesvitsky could hardly refrain from laughing at the antics of a dark-complexioned officer of the hussars who was walking near him. 
The hussar officer, without smiling, and not changing the serious expression of his eyes, gazed at the regimental commander's back, and was mimicking his every motion. Every time that the general tottered and pushed forward, the young hussar officer would, in almost precisely the same way, totter and push forward. Nesvitsky was amused, and nudged the others to look at the mimic. Kutuzov walked slowly and lazily in front of the thousands of eyes that were starting from their sockets to follow the motions of the chief. As he came along to Company 3, he suddenly halted. The suite, not anticipating this halt, involuntarily crowded up close to him. "'Ah, Timokin!' cried the commander-in-chief, recognizing the red-nosed captain, the one who had been obliged to suffer on account of the blue capote. It would seem as though it were impossible for him to draw himself up higher than he had done during the scolding administered by the regimental commander. But now that the commander-in-chief stopped to speak to him, the captain put such a strain upon himself that it seemed as though he could not stand it should the commander-in-chief stay a moment longer, and accordingly Kutuzov, evidently appreciating his position and being anxious to show every kindness to the captain, hastened to turn away, a scarcely perceptible smile flitting over his plump, scarred face. "'Another comrade of Ismailo, said he. "'A brave officer. Are you satisfied with him?' asked Kutuzov of the regimental commander. The regimental commander, who, unknown to himself, was mimicked as in a mirror by the officer of hussars, started as if stung, sprang forward, and replied, "'Very well satisfied, your high excellency.' We all of us have our weaknesses, continued Kutuzov, smiling and turning away. His used to be his devotion to Bacchus. The regimental commander was alarmed lest he were to blame for this and found no words to reply. The hussar at this instant caught sight of the captain with the red nose and rounded belly and perpetrated such an exact imitation of his face and pose that Nesvitsky laughed outright. Kutuzov turned around. It was evident that the young officer had perfect command of his features, for at the instant that Kutuzov turned round the officer's face had assumed the most serious, deferential, and innocent of expressions. The third company was the last, and Kutuzov paused, evidently trying to recollect something. Prince Andrei stepped out from the suite and said in French in an undertone, "'You ordered me to remind you of Dolokhov, who was cashier to this regiment.' Where is this Dolokhov? Dolokhov, who now wore the grey military capote, did not wait to be summoned. Kutuzov saw a well-built soldier with light curly hair and bright blue eyes come forth from the ranks and present arms. A grievance? asked Kutuzov, slightly frowning. That is Dolokhov, said Prince Andrei. Ah? exclaimed Kutuzov. I hope that you will profit by this lesson. Do your duty— the emperor is merciful, and I will not forget you, if you deserve well. The clear blue eyes looked into the chief's face, with the same boldness as at the regimental commander's, their expression seeming to rend the veil of rank that so widely separated the commander-in-chief from the private soldier. "'I should like to ask one favor, your high excellency,' said he deliberately, in a firm, ringing voice. I beg that you give me a chance to wipe out my fault and show my devotion to His Majesty, the Emperor, and to Russia. Kutuzov turned away. The same sort of smile flashed over his face and through his eyes, as at the time when he turned away from Captain Timokhin. He turned away and frowned, as though he wished to express by this that all that Dolokhov had said to him, and all that he could possibly say to him, he had known long, long ago, and that it was all a bore to him, and that it was so much wasted breath. He turned away and went back to the calash. The regiment broke up into companies, and marched to the quarters assigned them not far from Bernau, where they hoped to get shoes and clothes and rest after their long marches. "'You will not complain of me, will you, Prokhor Ignatyich?' asked the regimental commander, galloping after the third company and overtaking Captain Timokhin, who rode at their head. The general's face shone with unrestrained delight at the successful outcome of the review. The service of the Tsar. Can't help. One flies off. I am the first to apologize. You know me. Thank you very much. And he held out his hand to the captain. 
I beg of you, General, how could I think such a thing? replied the captain. His nose grew scarlet, and he smiled, the smile betraying the lack of two front teeth which had been knocked out by the butt end of a gun under Ismailo. And assure Mr. Dolokhov that I shall not forget him, to rest easy on that score. And tell me, please, I have been wanting for some time to ask you, how does he behave? And always, he is very regular in his duty, Your Excellency, but his temper, said Dimulgan. Well, what of his temper? demanded the regimental commander. Some days, Your Excellency, he goes it, said the captain, but otherwise he is intelligent and well informed and quiet, and then again he is a wild beast. In Poland he almost killed a Jew. You will have the grace to know. Yes, yes, said the regimental commander. We must always be easy on a young man in misfortune. You see he has influential connections, so you had better... I understand, Your Excellency, rejoined Timokhin, with a smile that showed that he understood his chief's desires. Yes, yes, just so. The regimental commander sought out Dolokhov in the ranks and reined in his horse. Epilots at the first engagement, said he. Dolokhov looked up but made no answer and did not alter the expression of the ironical smile that curled his lips. "'Well, this is very good,' continued the regimental commander. "'A glass of vodka to the men from me,' he added, loud enough to be heard by the soldiers. "'I thank you all. Slava Brohu. Glory to God.' And he rode on and overtook the next company. "'Well, it's a fact. He's a good man and not hard to serve under,' said Timokhin to a subaltern riding next him. In a word, very hearty, said the subaltern officer, laughing at his own joke. The regimental commander was nicknamed the King of Hearts. The cheerful frame of mind felt by the officers after the review was shared also by the men. The regiment marched along merrily. On all sides were heard the voices of the soldiers talking. How is it? They say Kutuzov is blind in one eye. Well, so he is, quite blind. Nay, brother, he can see better than you can. He inspected our boots and leg wrappers and everything. My, when he looked at my legs, I didn't know what I was standing on. And that other one, the Avstriak who was with him, I should think he was whitewashed, white as flour. Think what a job to clean that uniform. Say, Fetishow, did he say when we should begin to be on our guard? You were in the front. I was told that Bonaparte himself was at Brunova. Bonaparte here? What a lie, you fool! Don't you know anything? Now the Prusk is up in arms, and the Avstriak, of course, have got to put him down, and when he's put down, then there'll be war with Bonaparte, and yet they say Bonaparte is here at Brunova. Anybody can see you was a fool. Keep your ears peeled, you idiot. The devil! What sort of quartermasters these are! See, there's the fifth company turning off into the village. They'll have their kasha pots boiling before we get in. Give me a biscuit, you devil. Didn't I give you some tobacco last evening? Too thin, brother. Well, then, God be with you. Oh, I wish they'd call a halt. The idea of marching five verses more on an empty stomach. What you'd like to be for those Germans to give us a lift in their carriages. Then you'd go easy enough. That would be fine. But here, brother, see all these beggarly people come out. The Polyaks, back there, belong to the Russian crown. But here, brother, there's nothing but Germans come out. Singers to the front, cried the captain. A score of men from the different companies ran to their places at the head of the column. The drummer who led the singing faced the singers and waved his arms, and struck up the drawling soldier's song, beginning with the words, Is it the dawn, and has the red sun risen? and ending, Well, boys, what glory we shall win with Father Kamensky. This song had been composed in Turkey, and was now sung in Austria, with simply this variation, that in place of Father Kamensky, Father Kutuzov was substituted. The drummer, a stalwart, handsome fellow, forty years old, having sung these last words in staccato, soldier style, made a gesture with his hands as though he were throwing something to the ground, looked sternly at his singers, and frowned. Then, feeling the consciousness of all eyes being fastened upon him, he lifted his arms high above his head, 
as though he were carrying with the greatest care some invisible and precious object, and holding them so for several moments, he suddenly flung it down with a despairing gesture, singing, Ach, voiceni, moiseni, Ah, my cottage, my cottage. While twenty voices took up the refrain, and a spoon-maker, disregarding the weight of his equipment, friskily danced ahead and walked backwards before the company, shrugging his shoulders and making gestures of defiance with his spoons. The soldiers, clapping their hands in time with the measure of the song, marched in step. Behind them were heard the rattle of wheels, the creaking of springs, and the trampling of horses' feet. It was Kutuzov and his suite, on their way back to the city. The commander-in-chief signified that the men should keep on as they were, and he and all his suite showed by their faces how much they enjoyed the music of the songs, the sight of dancing soldier, and the bold and buoyant appearance of the company. Conspicuous in the second file of the right flank, near which the calash passed, was Dolokhov, the blue-eyed private, as he marched along with an extraordinarily bold and graceful gait, keeping time to the song and looking into the faces of the passing officers with an expression that seemed to smack of pity for all that did not march with his company. The cornet of hussars in Kutuzov's suite, who had mimicked the regimental commander, fell behind the calash and drew up along Dolokhov. Zerkarf, this cornet of hussars, had at one time belonged to the same wild set in Petersburg, of which Dolokhov was the leader. Here abroad, Zerkov met Dolokhov in the ranks, but did not find it expedient to recognize him at first. Now, however, since Kutuzov had set the example by talking with the degraded officer, he went to him with all the cordiality of an old friend. "'My dear fellow, how are you?' said he, right in the midst of the song, as he walked his horse abreast of the company. "'How am I?' replied Dolokhov. "'As you see.' The military song gave special significance to the tone of easy good fellowship in which Zerkov spoke, and the pronounced coolness of Dolokhov's answer. "'And how do you get along with your chiefs?' asked Zerkov. "'All right. Good fellows. How did you manage to get on the staff?' "'I am attached. On duty.' Neither spoke. "'Vieux Puskala Sokolt. Da is pravava rukad. She unleashed the falcon, and from the right sleeve, rang out the song, involuntarily inspiring a bold, blithe feeling. Their talk would probably have been different if they had not spoken while the singing was in progress. Is it true that the Austrians are beaten? asked Dolokhov. The devil only knows, so they say. I'm glad of it, exclaimed Dolokhov curtly, as though the song demanded it of him. "'Say, come to us this evening. You'll have a chance at Faro,' said Zerkov. "'Did you bring a good deal of money with you?' "'Come.' "'I can't. I've sworn off. I neither drink nor play till I'm promoted.' "'Well, that'll come first engagement. We shall see.' Again they relapsed into silence. "'Look in, anyway, if you need anything. The staff will help you.' Dolokhov laughed. "'Don't make yourself uneasy.' If I need anything, I shall not ask for it. I'll take it. Well, I mean... Well, and so do I mean. Goodbye. Farewell. Ivwizako ivdalako, norodomu storanu. High and far in our fatherland. Zerkov put spurs to his horse, which pranced and danced, not knowing with which foot to start, and then, with a spring galloped off, leaving the company far behind, and overtook the calash, while still the rhythm of the song seemed to wing its feet. End of chapter 2 Part 2, Chapter 3 of War and Peace by Leo Tolstoy Translated by Nathan Haskell Doyle This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Marianne On his return from the review, Kutuzov, accompanied by the Austrian general, went into his private room, and calling his adjutant, bade him bring certain papers relating to the state of the troops, and some letters received from the Archduke Ferdinand, the commander of the army of the van. Prince Andrei Bokonsky came into the commander-in-chief's office with the desired papers. Kutuzov and the member of the Hofkriegsroth were sitting at a table on which was spread a map. Ah, said Kutuzov, with a glance at Bokonsky, signifying by his exclamation that the adjutant was to wait, 
while at the same time he went on in French with the conversation that he had begun. I have only one thing to say, General, proceeded Kutuzov, with a pleasing elegance of diction and accent which constrained one to listen to each deliberately spoken word. It was evident that Kutuzov took pleasure in hearing himself. I have only one thing to say, General. If the matter depends solely on me, then the desire of His Majesty, the Emperor of France, would long ago have been fulfilled. I should long ago have joined the Archduke, and I assure you, on my honor, that for me personally, I should have rejoiced to give over the supreme command of the armies to a general so much more learned and more experienced than myself, and such men abound in Austria, and to be relieved of the heavy responsibility. But circumstances are often beyond our control, General. And Kutuzov smiled with an expression that seemed to say, You are at perfect liberty not to put any confidence in what I say, and it is absolutely of no consequence to me whether you believe me or not, but you have no need to tell me so, and that's all there is of it. The Austrian general looked dissatisfied, but could not do otherwise than reply in the same tone. On the contrary, said he, in a querulous and angry tone, that to put the lie to the flattering intention of his words. On the contrary, His Majesty highly appreciates the part that you have taken in the common cause, but we think that the present delay will rob the brave Russian army and their generals of those laurels which they are in the habit of winning in war, he rejoined, in a phrase evidently prepared beforehand. Kutuzov bowed, but still continued to smile. Well, such is my idea of it, and relying upon the last letter which His Highness the Archduke Ferdinand has done me the honor of writing me, I have no doubt that the Austrian army, under the command of such an experienced coadjutor as General Mack, has already won a decisive victory and no longer needs our aid, said Kutuzov. The general frowned. There was indeed no accurate information about the condition of the Austrians, yet there was a prepondering weight of circumstantial evidence in favor of the unfavorable rumors that were in circulation, and therefore Kutuzov's assumptions of an Austrian victory seemed very much like a jest. But Kutuzov smiled blandly, with an expression that seemed to affirm his right to make this assumption. In fact, the last letter that he had received from Mack's army informed him of a probable victory and of the very advantageous strategical position of his army. Give me that letter, said Kutuzov, addressing Prince Andrei. Have the goodness to listen to this. And Kutuzov, with an ironical smile hovering on his lips, read in German to the Austrian general the following passage from the Archduke Ferdinand's letter. We have our forces perfectly concentrated, nearly seventy thousand strong, so that we can attack and defeat the enemy should he attempt to cross the Lech. Since we are masters of Ulm, we cannot lose the advantage of having control of both banks of the Danube. Moreover, should the enemy not cross the Lech, we can at any moment take the other side of the Danube, attack his line of communication, and, by recrossing the Danube lower down, instantly nullify his plans, if he should think of turning the main body of his forces against our faithful allies. Thus we can confidently wait the moment when the Imperial Russian army is ready to join us, and then easily find an opportunity in common to inflict upon the enemy the fate that he deserves. Kutuzov drew a long breath when he had finished this passage, and looked with a sympathetic and kindly expression at the member of the Hofkriegsroth. But you know, Your Excellency, that the law of courage advises you to be prepared for the worst, said the Austrian general, evidently anxious to have done with jokes and take up serious business, he involuntarily glanced at the adjutant. "'Excuse me, General,' exclaimed Kutuzov, interrupting him and also turning to Prince Andrei. "'See here, my dear fellow. Get from Kozlovsky all the reports from our spies. Here are two letters from Count Nostich, and here's a letter from the Archduke Ferdinand, another still,' said he, handing him a quantity of papers. "'Have an abstract of these made out neatly in French, as a memorandum,' so that we can see at a glance all the facts that we have in regard to the doings of the Austrian army. Now then, when it is done you will hand it to His Excellency. 
Prince Andrei inclined his head as a sign that he comprehended from the very first word not only all that Kutuzov had said, but all that he meant to say to him. He gathered up the papers, and with a general salutation went into the reception room, stepping noiselessly over the soft carpet. Notwithstanding the fact that not much time had elapsed since Prince Andrei had left Russia, he had greatly changed. In the expression of his face, in his motions, in his gait, there was almost nothing to be recognized of his former affectation, lassitude, and laziness. He had the appearance of a man who had no time to think about the impression that he produced upon others, but who was occupied with pleasant and interesting work. His face showed more of contentment with himself and his surroundings. His smile and glance were more cheerful and attractive. Kutuzov, whom he joined in Poland, had received him very warmly and promised not to forget him, treated him with more distinction than his other adjutants, and had taken him to Vienna with him and entrusted him with the most important duties. From Vienna, Kutuzov sent a letter to his old comrade, Prince Andrei's father. Your son, he wrote, bids fair to become an officer who will be distinguished for his quickness of perception, his firmness and his faithfulness. I count myself fortunate in having such a helpmeet. Among the officers of Kutuzov's staff, and in the army generally, Prince Andrei bore two diametrically opposite reputations, just the same as in Petersburg society. One party, the minority, regarded Prince Andrei as in some way different from themselves and all other people, and expected him to achieve the most brilliant success. They listened to him, praised him, and imitated him, and Prince Andrei was on pleasant and easy terms with these men. The other party, the majority, were not fond of Prince Andrei. They considered him haughty, cold, and disagreeable. But Prince Andrei had succeeded in winning their respect and even their fear. Coming into the reception room from Kutuzov's cabinet, Prince Andrei took his papers to one of his colleagues, the adjutant Kozlovsky, who was on duty and was sitting with a book at the window. "'Well, what is it, Prince?' asked Kozlovsky. "'You are ordered to draw up a memorandum to account for our not advancing. "'But why?' Prince Andrei shrugged his shoulders. "'Any news of Mac?' "'No. "'If it were true that he is defeated, we should have heard of it by this time.' "'Probably,' rejoined Prince Andrei, and started for the outer door. But at that very instant the door was flung almost into his face, and a tall Austrian general, in an overcoat, and with his head swathed in a dark handkerchief, and with the order of Maria Theresa around his neck, hurried into the room, having evidently just arrived from a journey. Prince Andrei paused. "'General-in-chief Kutuzov,' hurriedly demanded the newly arrived general, with a strong German accent, and looking anxiously on all sides, started without delay for the door of the general's private room. "'The general-in-chief is engaged,' said Kozlovsky, hastening toward the unknown general and barring the way to the cabinet. "'Whom shall I announce?' The unknown general looked scornfully down on the diminutive Kozlovsky, and seemed to be amazed that he was not recognized. "'The general-in-chief is engaged,' repeated Kozlovsky, calmly. The general's face contracted, his lips drew together and trembled. He drew out a notebook, quickly wrote something in pencil, tore out the leaf and handed it to the adjutant. Then, with quick steps, he walked over to the window, threw himself into a chair, and surveyed those in the room, as though asking why they stared at him so. Then the general lifted his head, stretched out his neck as though he were about to say something, and then, affecting to hum to himself, produced a strange sound, instantly swallowed. The office door opened, and Kutuzov himself appeared on the threshold. The general, with the bandaged head, who had apparently escaped from some peril, bowed and hastened with long, swift strides across the room toward Kutuzov. "'Vous voyez la maharud mach,' said he in a broken voice. Kutuzov's face, as he stood at his office door, remained perfectly unchangeable for several moments. Then a frown ran like a wave across his brow and passed off leaving his face as serene as before. He respectfully bent his head, shut his eyes, silently allowed Mac to pass in front of him into the office, and then closed the door behind him. The rumor, already spread abroad, as to the defeat of the Austrians and the surrender of the whole army at Ulm, was thus proved to be correct. 
Within half an hour, adjutants were flying about in all directions with orders for the Russian army, till now inactive, to prepare immediately to meet the enemy. Prince Andre was one of those uncommon staff officers whose interest is concentrated on the general operations of the war. On seeing Mac, and learning the particulars of his defeat, he realized that half of the campaign was lost, and appreciated the painfully difficult situation of the Russian army, while his imagination vividly pictured the fate that was awaiting the army, and the part which he was about to play in it. In spite of himself, he experienced a strong feeling of delight at the thought of the shame that Austria had brought upon herself, and that perhaps within a week he would have a chance to witness and take part in an encounter between the Russians and the French, the first since the time of Suvorov. But he feared lest Bonaparte's genius should show itself superior to the valor of the Russian troops, and at the same time he could not bear the thought of his hero suffering disgrace. Agitated and stirred by these thoughts, Prince Andrei started for his room to write his father, to whom he sent a daily letter. In the corridor he fell in with his roommate, Nesvitsky, and the buffoon, Zirkov. As usual, they were laughing and joking. "'Why are you so down in the mouth?' asked Nesvitsky, noticing Prince Andrei's pale face and flashing eyes. "'There's nothing to be gay about,' replied Bolkonsky. Just as Prince Andrei joined Nesvitsky and Zirkov, there came toward them from the other end of the corridor the Austrian general, Strauch, who was attached to Kutuzov's staff to look after the commissariat of the Russian army. He was with the member of the Hofkriegsroth, who had arrived the evening before. There was plenty of room in the wide corridor for the general to pass without incommoding three officers, but Zirkov, giving Nesvitsky a push, exclaimed in a hurried voice, they are coming, they are coming. Stand aside, please. Please make room. The generals came along, evidently desiring to avoid embarrassing etiquette. A stupid smile spread over the buffoon Zirkov's face. Your Excellency, said he in German, as he stepped forward and addressed the Austrian general, I have the honor of congratulating you. He made a low bow and, awkwardly, like a child learning to dance, began to scrape first with one foot, then with the other. The member of the Hofkriegsroth gave him a stern look, but concluding, by his idiotic smile, that he was in earnest, he was constrained to listen for a moment. He frowned, to show that he was listening. "'I have the honor of congratulating you. General Mack has come. He's perfectly well, save for a slight wound here,' said he, with a radiant smile, pointing to his forehead. The general frowned, and turned away, and went on his way. "'Heavens!' "'What simplicity!' said he, angrily, after he had gone a few steps. Nesvitsky, with a laugh, threw his arms around Prince Andrei, but the latter, paler than ever, and with a wrathful look on his face, pushed him aside, and turned to Zirkov. The nervous excitement induced by the sight of Mac, by the news of his defeat, and the thoughts of what was awaiting the Russian army, found its outlet in wrath at this ill-timed jest of Zirkov's. "'If you, my dear sir,' he exclaimed scornfully, while his lower jaw twitched a little, "'choose to be a buffoon. Why, I cannot hinder you. But I assure you that if you dare a second time to act like a fool in my presence, I will teach you how to behave.' Nesvitsky and Zirkov were so amazed at this outburst that all they could do was to look in silence at Bolkonsky with wide-open eyes. "'Why?' I only congratulated them, said Zirkov. I am not jesting with you. Be good enough to hold your tongue, cried Bolkonsky, and taking Nesvitsky by the arm he drew him away from Zirkov, who found nothing to say. Well, now, what's the matter, brother? asked Nesvitsky in a soothing tone. What's the matter? repeated Prince Andrei, pausing in his excitement. Why, you know well enough— Either we are officers in the service of our czar and our country, rejoicing at our common success and grieving over our common failure, or we are lackeys who have no interest in our master's concerns. Forty thousand men massacred and the army of our allies destroyed, and still you find it something to laugh at, said he, as though these last sentences, which were spoken in French, added to the effect of what he was saying. It is well enough for a trifler, en garçon de rien, 
like that fellow whom you have made your friend. Only street Arabs could find amusement in such things, said Prince Andrei, suddenly changing to Russian again, but pronouncing the Russian word for street Arab with a French accent. Noticing that Zerkov was still within hearing, he waited to see if the cornet had any answer to make. But Zerkov went away and left the corridor. End of chapter 3 Part 2, Chapter 4 of War and Peace by Leo Tolstoy, translated by Nathan Haskell Doyle. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Marianne. The Pavlograd Regiment of Hussars was encamped two miles from Brnau. The squadron in which Nikolai Rostov served as Yunker was quartered in the German village of Salzenek. The squadron commander, Captain Denisov, who was known to the entire cavalry division as Vaska Denisov, had been assigned to the best house in the village. Junker Rostov had shared the captain's quarters ever since he joined the regiment in Poland. On the very same October day, when at headquarters all had been thrown into excitement by the news of Mac's defeat, the camp life of the squadron was going on in its usual tranquil course. Denisov, who had been playing a losing game of cards all night long, had not yet returned to his rooms, when Rostov, early in the morning rode up on horseback from his foraging tour. He was in his younger uniform, and, as he galloped up to the doorstep and threw his leg over with the agile dexterity of youth, he paused a moment in the stirrup, as though sorry to dismount, but at last sprang lightly from the horse and called the orderly. "'Hey, Bondarenko, my dear fellow,' he shouted to the hussar, who hurried forth to attend to the horse, "'Lead him about a little, my friend,' said he, with that fraternal geniality with which handsome young men are apt to treat everybody when they are happy. "'I will, your illustriousness,' replied the little Russian, gaily shaking his head. "'See that you walk him about well.' Another hussar also hastened up to attend to the horse, but Bondarenko had already taken the bridle. It was evident that the yunker gave handsome fees and that it was a pleasure to serve him." Rostov smoothed the horse's neck, then his flank, and turned and looked back from the step. "'Excellent. He'll be a horse worth having,' said he to himself, and then smiling and picking up his sabre, he mounted the steps with clinking spurs. The German who owned the house glanced up as he worked in his shirt-sleeves and nightcap, pitching over manure in the cowhouse. The German's face always lighted at the sight of Rostov. He gaily smiled and winked. "'Good morning, good morning,' he reiterated, evidently taking great satisfaction in giving the young man his morning greeting. "'Busy already, Schundfleisig? asked Rostov, with the same good-natured, friendly smile, which so well became his animated face. "'Hurrah for the Austrians! Hurrah for Russians! Hurrah for the Kaiser Alexander!' he shouted, repeating the words which his German host was fond of saying. The German laughed, came out from the door of the cowhouse, took off his nightcap, and waving it over his head, cried, Hurrah for the whole world! Und die ganze Welt hoch! Rostov, following the German's example, waved his forage cap around his head, and with a merry laugh shouted, Und vivant die ganze Welt! Long live the whole world! Although there was no special reason for rejoicing, either on the part of the German who was engaged in pitching manure, or for Rostov, who had been on a long ride with his men after hay, Nevertheless, both men looked at each other with joyous enthusiasm and brotherly love, nodded their heads to show that they understood each other, and then separated with a smile, the German to his cowhouse and Rostov to the cottage which he and Denisov shared together. "'Where's the baron?' he asked of Luvroshka, Denisov's rascally valet, who was known to the whole regiment. "'He hasn't been in since evening, probably been losing at cards,' replied Lavrushka. "'I have learned—' that if he has good luck, he comes in early and in high spirits, but if he does not get in before morning, it means he's been losing, and he'll come in mad enough. Will you have coffee? Yes, give me some. In less than ten minutes, Lavrushka brought the coffee. He's coming, he said. Now we'll get it. Rostov glanced out the window and saw Denisov meandering home. He was a little man, with a red face, brilliant black eyes, and dark moustache and hair all in disorder. He wore a hussar's pelisse unbuttoned, wide, sagging pantaloons, and a hussar's cap on the back of his head. He came up the steps in a gloomy mood, with hanging head. 
Lavushka, he cried in a loud, surly voice. Here, you blockhead, take this off. Don't you see I am taking it off, replied Lavrushka's voice. Ah, you up already? asked Denisov, as he came into the cottage. Long ago, replied Rustov, I've been after hay, and I saw Fraulein Matilda. So, ho, and there I have been, brother, losing horribly all night, like a son of a dog, cried Denison, slurring over his R's. Such horrid bad luck, perfectly horrid. The moment you left, luck changed. Hey, tea. Denisov snarled with a sort of smile that showed his short, sound teeth, and began to run the short fingers of both hands through his thick, black hair that stood up like a forest. The devil himself dwove me to that what, the officer's nickname was the rat, said he, rubbing his forehead and face with both hands. Just imagine, didn't have a single cod, not one, not a single one. Denisov took out the pipe which he had been smoking, knocked the ashes into his palm, and scattering the fire, laid it upon the floor, and went on shouting. Simple stakes, lose the doubles, simple stakes, lose the doubles. After he had scattered the fire, he broke his pipe in two and flung it away. Then, after a silence, he suddenly looked up at Rostov, with his bright black eyes full of merriment. If there were only some women here, but here there's nothing to do but dwink. If we could only have a wound of fighting. He, who's there? he cried, going to the door, on hearing the sound of heavy boots and the jingling of spurs in the next room. The quartermaster, announced Lavrushka. Denisov frowned still more portentously. Twat it, he exclaimed, flinging his friend a purse containing a few gold pieces. Wistov, count it, chicken. See how much is left, then hide it under my pillow, said he, and went out to see the quartermaster. Rostov took the money, and mechanically making little heaps of the new and old coins, according to their denominations, began to count them. Ah, tell you, Nin, how do you? Got done up last night, Denisov was heard saying in the next room. Where? At Brukov's, at the Rats. I heard about it, said a second, thin voice, and immediately after, Lieutenant Telyanin, a young officer of the same squadron, came into the room. Rustov thrust the purse under the pillow and pressed the little moist hand that was held out to him. Telyanin had been removed from the guards shortly before the campaign, for some reason or other. He now conducted himself very decently in the regiment, but he was not liked, and Rostov, especially, could not conquer, or even conceal, his unreasonable antipathy to this officer. "'Well, young cavalier, how does my Grachek suit you?' Grachek, or young Rook, was a saddle-horse that Telyanin had sold Rostov. The lieutenant never looked the man with whom he was talking straight in the eye. His eyes were constantly wandering from one object to another." I saw you riding him this morning. First rate. He's a good horse, said Rostov, in spite of the fact that the animal for which he had given seven hundred roubles was worth half the price he had paid. He's begun to go lame in the front foreleg. Hoof cracked. That's nothing. I will teach you, or show you what kind of a rivet to put on. Yes, show me, please, said Rostov. I will show you. Certainly I will. It's no secret. And you will thank me for the horse. I'll have him brought right round, said Rostov, anxious to get rid of Telyanin, and he went out to give his orders. In the entry, Denisov, with a pipe in his mouth, was sitting cross-legged on the threshold in front of the quartermaster, who was making his report. When he saw Rostov, Denisov made a face and, pointing with his thumb over his shoulder into the room where Telyanin was, scowled still more darkly, and shuddered with aversion. Ugh, I don't like that young fellow, said he, undeterred by the quartermaster's presence. Rostov shrugged his shoulders, as much as to say, nor I either, but what is to be done about it, and having given his orders, returned to Telyanin. The latter was still sitting in the same indolent position in which Rostov had left him, rubbing his small, white hands. What repugnant people one has to meet, said Rostov to himself, as he went into the room. Well, did you order the horse brought round? asked Telyanin, getting up and carelessly looking around. I did. Come on, then. I just ran over to ask Denisov about today's orders. That was all. Have they come in yet, Denisov? Not yet. Where are you going? 
Oh, I'm just going to show this young man how to shoe his horse, replied Telyanin. They went out down the front steps to the stable. The lieutenant showed Rostov how to make a rivet, and then went home. When Rostov returned, he found Denisov sitting at the table with a bottle of vodka and a sausage before him, and writing with a sputtering pen. He looked gloomily into Rostov's face. I'm writing to her, said he. He leaned his elbow on the table with the pen in his hand, and told to his friend what his letter was to be, evidently taking real delight in the chance of saying faster than he could write all that he had in his mind to put on the paper. "'Do you see, my friend,' said he, "'we are asleep when we are not in love. We are children of the dust. But when you are in love, then you are like God. You are as pure as on the first day of creation. "'Who is there? Send him to the devil. I have no time,' he cried to Lavrushka, who came up to him, not in the least abashed. "'What can I do? It's your own order. It's the quartermaster come back for the money.' Denisov scowled, opened his mouth to shout something, but made no sound. "'Nasty job,' he muttered to himself. "'How much money was there left in that purse?' he asked Rostov. Seven new pieces and three old ones. "'Ach, dwat it! Well, what are you standing there for, like a booby? Fetch in the quartermaster.' cried Denisov to Lavrushka. "'Please, Denisov, take some of my money. You see I have plenty,' said Rostov, reddening. "'I don't like to bawa on my friends. I don't like it,' declared Denisov. "'But if you don't let me lend you money, comrade fashion, I shall be offended,' insisted Rostov. "'Truly, I have plenty.' "'No, indeed, I shan't.' And Denisov went to the bed to get the purse from under the pillow. "'Where did you put it? Rostov?' under the bottom pillow. It isn't there. Denisov flung both pillows on the floor. There was no purse there. That's strange. Hold on. Didn't you throw it out? asked Rostov, picking up the pillows and shaking them, and then hauling off the bedclothes and shaking them. But there was no purse. I could not have forgotten it, could I? No. I remember very well thinking how you kept it like a treasure trove under your pillow. Where is it? he demanded to Lavrushka. I haven't been into the room. It must be where you put it. But it isn't. That is always the way with you. You throw it down and then forget all about it. Look in your pockets. No. If I had not thought about the treasure trove, said Rostov, and I remember putting it there. Lavrushka tore the whole bed apart, looked under it, under the table, searched everywhere in the room, and then stood still in the middle of the room. Denisov silently followed all his motions and when Lavrushka, in amazement, spread open his hands, he glanced at Rostov. Rostov, stop your schoolboy twix. Rostov, conscious of Denisov's gaze fixed upon him, raised his eyes and instantly dropped them again. The blood, till then contained somewhere below his throat, rushed in an overmastering flood into his face and eyes. He could not get a breath. There has been no one in the room except the lieutenant and yourselves. It is nowhere to be found— said Lavrushka. "'Now, you devil's puppet, fly wound, hunt for it,' suddenly cried Denisov, growing livid and starting toward the valet with a threatening gesture. "'Find me that purse, or I'll horsewhip you. I'll horsewhip you all.' Rostov, avoiding Denisov's glance, began to button up his jacket, adjusted his saber, and put on his cap. "'I tell you, give me that purse,' cried Denisov, shaking his man by the shoulders and pushing him against the wall. Denisov, let him go. I know who took it, said Rostov, going toward the door and not lifting his eyes. Denisov paused, considered a moment, and evidently, perceiving whom Rostov meant, seized him by the arm. Wubbish, he cried, the veins on his face and neck standing out like cords. I tell you, you are beside yourself, and I won't have it. The purse is here. I'll take the hide off this wascal, and I'll get it. I know who took it, repeated Rostov in a trembling voice, and went to the door. But I tell you, don't you dare to do it, cried Denisov, throwing himself on the yunker to hold him back. But Rostov freed his arm, and with as much anger as though Denisov were his worst enemy, gave him a direct and heavy blow right between the eyes. Do you realize what you are saying, he cried in a trembling voice. He is the only person beside myself who has been in the room. Of course, if it was not he, then... 
He could not finish and rushed from the room. Ah, the devil take you in all the West, were the last words that Rostov caught. He went straight to Telyanin's rooms. My baron's not at home. He went to headquarters, said Telyanin's man. Why, has anything happened? he added, surprised at the younger's distorted face. No, nothing. You just missed him, said the man. Headquarters were three verse from Salzanek. Rostov, without returning home, took a horse and galloped off to headquarters. In the village occupied by the staff was a tavern where the officers resorted. Rostov went to this tavern. At the doorsteps he saw Telyanin's horse. The lieutenant himself was sitting in the second room of the tavern with a plate of sausages and a bottle of wine. Ah, so you have come too, young man, said he, smiling and lifting his brows. Yes, said Rostov though it required the greatest effort to speak this monosyllable, and he took his seat at the next table. Neither said more. Two Germans and a Russian officer were the other occupants of the room. No one was talking, and the only sounds were the rattle of knives and forks and the lieutenant's munching. When Telyanin had finished his breakfast, he pulled out of his pocket a double purse, and with his delicate white fingers, which turned up at the ends, slipped up the ring, took out a gold piece, and lifting his brows, gave it to the waiter. "'Please make haste,' said he. The gold piece was new. Rostov got up and went to Telyanin. "'Allow me to look at your purse,' he said, in a quiet, almost inaudible voice. With wandering eyes and still lifted brows, Telyanin handed him the purse. "'Yes, it's a handsome little purse, isn't it?' "'Yes,' said he, and suddenly turned pale. "'Look at it, youngster.' he added. Rostov took the purse into his hand and looked at it, and at the money that was in it, and at Telyanin. The lieutenant glanced around in his usual way, and apparently became suddenly very merry. If we ever get to Vienna, I shall leave all this there, but there's nothing to get with it in these filthy little towns, said he. Will you give it back to me, youngster? I must be going. Rostov said nothing. And you, aren't you going to have some breakfast? "'Pretty good fare,' continued Telyanin. "'Give it to me.' He stretched out his hand and took hold of the purse. Rostov let it go. Telyanin took the purse and began to let it slip into the pocket of his riding trousers, and his brows went up higher than usual, and his mouth slightly parted as much as to say, "'Yes, yes, I will put my purse in my pocket, and it is a very simple matter, and it is no one's business at all.' "'Well, what is it, youngster?' said he, sighing and glancing into Rostov's eyes from under his raised eyebrows. Something like a swift electric flash darted from Telyanin's eyes into Rostov's, and was darted back again, and again, and again, all in a single instant. "'Come here with me,' said Rostov, taking Telyanin by the arm. He drew him almost to the window. "'This money is Denisov's. You took it,' he whispered in his ear. "'What? What? How do you dare? What?' exclaimed Telyanin, but his words sounded like a mournful cry of despair and a prayer for forgiveness. As soon as Rostov heard this note in his voice, it seemed as though a great stone of doubt had fallen from his heart. He was rejoiced and at the same time felt sincere pity for the unhappy man standing before him, but he was obliged to carry the matter to the end. "'There are men here. God knows what they will think,' stammered Telyanin, seizing his cap and starting for a small unoccupied room." We must have an explanation. I know this and can prove it, said Rostov. I... All the muscles of Telyanin's scared, pale face began to tremble. His eyes kept wandering, though they were fixed on the floor, and never once raised to Rostov's, and something like a sob was heard. Count! Don't ruin a young fellow. Here's that wretched money. Take it, he threw it on the table. I have a father who is an old man. I have a mother... Rostov took the money, avoiding Telyanin's gaze, and, not saying a word, started to leave the room. But at the door he paused and turned back. "'My God!' said he, with tears in his eyes. "'How could you have done it?' "'Count,' said Telyanin, coming towards the younger. "'Don't touch me!' cried Rostov, drawing himself up. "'If you need this money, take it!' He tossed him the purse and hurried out of the tavern. End of chapter 4 Part 2, Chapter 5 of War and Peace by Leo Tolstoy. 
Translated by Nathan Haskell Doyle. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Marianne. On the evening of the same day, a lively discussion took place in Denisov's rooms between some of the officers of the squadron. But I tell you, Rostov, that it's your business to apologize to the regimental commander, said the second captain, a tall man with grayish hair, enormous mustache, and powerful wrinkled features. Captain Kirsten had twice been reduced to the ranks for affairs of honor, and twice promoted again. I will not allow anyone to call me a liar, cried Rostov, who flushed crimson and was in a great state of excitement. He told me that I lied, and I told him that he lied, and there the matter rests. He may keep me on duty every day, he may put me under arrest, but neither he nor anyone else can force me to apologize. If he, as regimental commander, considers it improper to give me satisfaction, then— Yes, yes, calm yourself, Batyushka, listen to me, interrupted Captain Kirsten, in his deep, bass voice, calmly twirling his mustaches. You told the regimental commander, in the presence of other officers, that an officer had stolen. It wasn't my fault that the conversation took place before other officers. Maybe it was not best to have spoken before them, but I am not a diplomat. That is why I joined the hussars. I thought that here, at least, such fine distinctions were not necessary. And he told me that I lied. Let him give me satisfaction, then. That's all very good. No one thinks that you are a coward. But that isn't the point. Ask Denisov. Put it to anyone if a yunker can demand satisfaction of his regimental commander. Denisov, chewing his mustache, was listening to the discussion with a gloomy expression of countenance, evidently not wishing to take any part in it. In reply to the captain's question, he shook his head. In the presence of other officers, you spoke to the regimental commander about this rascality, continued the second captain. Bogdanuich, so the regimental commander was called, Bogdanuitch shut you up. He did not shut me up. He told me that I was lying. Well, have it so. But you were saying foolish things to him, and you ought to apologize. Not for the world, cried Rostov. I did not think that of you, said the captain, seriously and sternly. You are unwilling to apologize, and yet, Batyushka, you are in fault, not only towards him, but towards the whole regiment, towards all of us. This is the way of it. If you had only thought, if you had only taken advice as to how to move in this matter, but no, you out with it, right before other officers, too. Well, then, what can the regimental commander do? Must he bring the other officer before court-martial and disgrace the whole regiment? Insult the whole regiment on account of a single rogue? Is that your idea of it? Well, it isn't ours. And Bogdanuitch was a brave fellow— he told you that you were not telling the truth. Disagreeable, but what else could he do? You found your match, and now, when we want to hush it up, you, out of sheer obstinacy and pride, aren't willing to apologize, but want to have everybody know about it. You are offended because you are put on extra duty, because you are required to apologize to an old and honored officer. Even if it were not Bogdanuitch, our honorable and brave old colonel, even then you would be offended and would be willing to insult the whole regiment, would you? The captain's voice began to tremble. Yes, Batyushka, you, who will perhaps not be in the regiment a year from now, today here, tomorrow transferred somewhere as adjutant, you don't care a fig if it is said thieves in the Pavoglard regiment, but it isn't all the same to us. What do you say, Denisov? It isn't a matter of indifference, is it? Denisov had kept silent all the time, and did not move, though he occasionally glanced at Rostov from his brilliant black eyes. "'Your pride is so dear to you that you aren't willing to apologize,' continued the captain. "'We old men who have grown up, and are going to die, if God grant it, in the regiment, guard its honor dearly. And Bogdanuitch knows it. Oh, how we love it, Batyushka! And this is not good of you, not good at all. Get mad, if you please.' but I shall always stick to Mother Truth. You're all wrong. And the captain got up and turned his back on Rostov. White, devil take it, screamed Denisov, jumping up. Now then, Wostov, now then. 
Rostov, flushing, turned pale, looked first at one and then at the other officer. No, gentlemen, no, you do not think. I see that you are perfectly mistaken in your opinion of me. I, for my own sake, for the honor of the regiment, what am I saying? And I will prove it. Yes, for my own sake and the honor of the regiment. Well, it's all the same. You're right. I was to blame. Tears stood in his eyes. I was to blame, to blame all around. Now what more do you want? That's the way to do it, cried the captain, turning round and slapping him on the shoulder with his big hand. I tell you, cried Denisov, he's a glorious young fellow. That's the best way, Count, repeated the captain, as though the giving him his title made his words more emphatic. Go and apologize, your illustriousness, that's it. Gentlemen, I won't do anything. No one shall ever hear another word from me, declared Rostov, in a low, supplicating voice. But I cannot apologize, by heavens, I cannot. How can you expect it? How can I apologize like a little schoolboy, begging forgiveness? Denisov laughed. So much the worse for you. Bogdanuitch is spiteful. You will pay for your stubbornness, said Kirsten. By God, tis not stubbornness. I cannot describe every feeling for you. I assure you, I cannot. Well, do just as you please, said the captain. By the way, where is this worthless scamp? asked he of Denisov. He reported himself ill. He's to be struck off the list in tomorrow's orders, replied Denisov. Well, it's a kind of illness. There's no other way of explaining it, said the captain. Whether illness or not, he'd better not come into my sight. I'd kill him, cried Denisov, in a most bloodthirsty manner. At this instant, Zerkov came into the room. What are you doing here? demanded the officer, turning to the newcomer. An expedition, gentlemen. Mac and his army have surrendered. It's all up with them. What a story! I saw him myself. What? You saw Mac alive, with his hands and his feet? An expedition! An expedition! Give him a bottle for bringing such news. But how came you here? I am sent back to my regiment on account of that devil of a Mac. The Austrian general complained of me. I congratulated him on Mac's arrival. How are you, Rostov? Just out of a bath. My dear boy, we've been having such a stew here these two days. The regimental adjutant came in and confirmed the news brought by Zerkov. The regiment was ordered to break camp the next day. An expedition, gentlemen. Well, glory to God for that. No more inaction. End of chapter 5 Part 2, Chapter 6 of War and Peace by Leo Tolstoy Translated by Nathan Haskell Doyle This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Marianne Kutuzov was retreating toward Vienna, destroying the bridges behind him over the River Inn, at Bernau, and over the River Tuan, at Linz. On the 4th of November, the Russian army were crossing the River Enns. At noon, the baggage wagons, the artillery, and the columns of the army stretched through the city of Enns, on both sides of the river. It was a mild autumnal day, but showery. The wide prospect commanded by the height where stood the Russian batteries protecting the bridge, was now suddenly veiled by a muslin-like curtain of slanting rain, then again was suddenly still further broadened so that distant objects stood out distinctly, gleaming in the sunlight as though they were varnished. At their feet lay the little city with its white houses and red roofs, its cathedral and the bridge, on both ends of which the Russian troops could be seen, pouring along in dense masses. Down the bend of the Danube, where it was joined by the waters of the Enns, could be seen boats and an island with a castle and park. Farther still was the left bank of the river, with bold rocks and overgrown with evergreens, while in the mysterious distance arose green mountains with deep ravines. The turrets of a monastery stood out above the wild and apparently impenetrable pine forest, and far away, on a height in front, on the same side of the river ends, the enemy's scouts could be discerned. On the brow of the hill, among the field pieces, stood the general in command of the rear guard, with an officer of his suite, making observations of the landscape with a glass. A little behind them, astride a gun carriage, sat Nesvitsky, 
who had been sent to the rear guard by the commander in chief. The Cossack who accompanied him was handing out a lunch bag and flask, and Nesvitsky was inviting the officers to share his little pies and genuine dopokumel. The officers gaily crowded around him, some on their knees, some sitting Turkish fashion on the wet grass. Certainly that Austrian prince was no fool in building his castle there. Glorious place. You are not eating anything, gentlemen, said Nesvitsky. Thank you cordially, prince, returned one of the officers, glad of the chance to exchange a word with such an important member of Kutuzov's suite. Yes, it is a splendid place. We went by that very park, saw a couple of deer, and it's a magnificent house. Look, prince, said another, who would very gladly have accepted another pie, but was ashamed to do so, and was, therefore, pretending to examine the landscape. Look yonder. Our infantry have got in already. Look there, on that meadow, behind the village. Three men are dragging something along. They'll clear out that little place quick enough, said he, with evident approval. Yes, that's so, said Nesvitsky. Ah, but I should like, he added, stuffing a pie into his handsome, moist mouth, I should like to get in yonder. He pointed to the turret convent, which could be seen on the mountainside. He smiled, and his eyes contracted and flashed. That would be some fun, gentlemen. The officers laughed. How I should like to frighten those little nuns. Italians, they say, and some of them young and pretty. Truly, I would give five years of my life. And they say they find it a bore, said an officer, bolder than the rest, with a laugh. Meantime, the officer of the suite, standing on the brow of the hill, was pointing out something to the general, who scrutinized it with his field glass. Yes, that is so, that is so, said the general, gravely, taking the glass from his eye and shrugging his shoulders. You are right. They are going to fire at them as they cross the river. Why do they dawdle so? In that direction, with even the naked eye, could be seen the enemy and his battery, from which arose a milk-white puff of smoke, immediately followed by the distant report, and it could be seen how the Russian troops were hastening to get across the river. Nesvitsky dismounted from the cannon and, with a smile, went up to the general. "'Wouldn't your excellency like to have a bite of luncheon?' he asked. "'It's all wrong,' said the general, not answering him. "'Our men are so slow.' "'Shall I not go down to them, Your Excellency?' asked Nesvitsky. "'Yes, do go down, please,' replied the general, reiterating the orders that he had already given. "'And tell the hussars to cross last and burn the bridge, as I ordered, and see to it that no combustible materials are left in it.' "'Very good,' said Nesvitsky. He called the Cossack to bring up the horses, bade him pack up the bag and flask, and lightly swung his heavy body into the saddle. "'Truly,' I am going to that nunnery, said he to the officers, who were looking at him with a smile, and then galloped off down the path that skirted the hill. Now, then, try if you can reach them. Take good aim, Captain, said the general, turning to the officer. You'll relieve the monotony by a little fun. Serve the guns, commanded the officer, and in a minute the gunners were running with a will from their bouviac fires and beginning to load. Number one, rang the command. Number one, rushed spitefully away. With a deafening metallic ring, the cannon resounded, and the whizzing shell flew far away over the head of the Russians in the valley, and then a spurt of smoke showed where it had fallen, and burst long before it reached the enemy. The faces of the officers and men grew radiant at this report. All leaped to their feet and watched with intense curiosity the motions of their troops in the valley below them, and the approach of the enemy, all spread out before them, as on the palm of the hand. At the moment the gun had been fired, the sun came out entirely from under the clouds, and the report of the cannon and the brilliancy of the sun mingled in one single martial and joyous impression. End of chapter 6 Part 2, Chapter 7 of War and Peace by Leo Tolstoy Translated by Nathan Haskell Doyle This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Marianne Two of the enemy's shots had already been fired at the men as they crossed the river, and on the bridge there was a jam. Halfway across stood Prince Nesvitsky, who had dismounted from his horse and was leaning with his stout body against the parapet. Laughing, he looked back at his Cossack, who stood a short distance behind him holding the bridles of their two horses. 
As soon as Prince Nesvitsky tried to force his way forward, the throng of soldiers and baggage wagons crowded him and forced him up against the parapet, and nothing was left for him but to wait. "'Look out there, my boy!' cried the Cossack to a soldier who was driving a baggage wagon and forcing his way right into the infantry as they thronged under the horse's feet and among the wheels. "'Look out there! Have a little patience! Don't you see the general wants to pass?' But the driver, paying no heed to the title of general, only cried to the soldiers who blocked his way, "'Hey there, boys! Keep to the left! Hold on!' But the boys, crowding shoulder to shoulder and locking bayonets, moved on across the bridge in one unbroken mass. As Nesvitsky looked down over the parapet, he could see the swift babbling ripples of the ends chase each other along as they bubbled, curled, and foamed around the piers of the bridge. Looking at the bridge, he saw almost incessant living waves of soldiery, tassels, shaycocks, shakus with covers, knapsacks, bayonets, and muskets, and under the shakus, faces with high cheekbones, sunken cheeks, and careless, weary eyes, and legs trampling through the mud which covered the planks of the bridge. Sometimes among the monotonous waves of the infantry, like a spurt of white foam on the ripples of the river, an officer in riding cloak would force his way through, his face noticeable for its refinement in contrast to the men. Then again, like a chip borne along on the river, a hussar on foot, an officer, a denschik, or a civilian, would be carried across the bridge by the tide of troops, and sometimes, like a log floating downstream, an officer's company, or baggage wagon loaded to the top and covered with leather, would roll across the bridge, submerged in the throng. See, it's like a freshet breaking through the dike, said the Cossack, hopelessly blocked. Say, are there many more of you to come? A million, minus one, replied a jolly soldier, in a torn overcoat, winking as he passed. In an instant he was carried by. Behind him came an old soldier. When he, he, that is the enemy, takes to making it hot for us on the bridge, said the old soldier glumly, in his Tembuf dialect, addressing a comrade, we shan't stop to scratch ourselves. And the Tembuf soldier and his comrade passed beyond. Following them, came a soldier riding a baggage wagon. "'Where in the devil did I put my leg wrappers?' exclaimed Adenshik, hurrying behind the wagon and rummaging into the rear of it. And he, in turn, was borne past with the wagon. Behind them came a jovial band of soldiers who had evidently been drinking. "'My dear fellow, he hit him with the butt-end of his gun, right in the teeth,' gaily said one of the soldiers, who wore the collar of his overcoat turned up, and was eagerly gesticulating. "'Good for him, a regular milksop,' said the other with a loud laugh, and they too passed by. So that Nesvitsky did not find out who was struck in the teeth, and to whom the epithet applied. "'Ugh, they're in such a hurry. Because he fired a blank cartridge, one would think they were all in danger of being killed,' said a non-commissioned officer, in an angry, reproachful tone." When it flew by me, that round shot, said a young soldier with a monstrous mouth, I thought I was dead. Fact. I was that frightened, by God, added the soldier, scarcely restraining himself from laughing outright with pleasure at the thought of being so frightened. And he, too, passed on. Behind him came a vehicle unlike any that had passed so far. This was a German forspun, loaded apparently with the effects of a whole household, Behind the cart, which was drawn by a pair of horses driven by a German, was a handsome brindled cow with an enormous udder. On a pile of feather beds sat a woman with a baby at the breast, an old granny, and a young, healthy-looking German girl, with flaming red cheeks. Evidently, these natives were availing themselves of the general permission to remove with all their permissions. The eyes of the soldiers were fixed upon the women, and as the cart moved forward at a slow pace, step by step, all sorts of remarks were directed at the two young women. Almost all the faces wore the peculiar smile suggested by unseemly thoughts concerning them. "'Look ye, that sausage there, she's moving too.' "'Sell me the little woman,' cried another soldier to the German, who, with downcast eyes, walked with long strides, frightened and solemn. "'Eh, ain't she gay?' 
They're fine little devils. There's a chance for you to make up to em for it off. Did you ever see anything like it, old fellow? Where are you going? asked an infantry officer, who, as he munched an apple, looked up at the pretty German girl with a half smile. The German shut his eyes, signifying that he did not understand. If you'd like it, take it, said the officer, giving the girl an apple. She took it and thanked him with a smile. Nesvitsky, like all the rest who were on the bridge, kept his eyes on the women till they vanished from sight. After they had passed beyond, came the same manner of soldiers with the same interchange of repartee, and then at length the train came to a halt. As often happens, the horses attached to some company's baggage wagon became entangled at the end of the bridge, and the whole line were obliged to halt. What are they waiting for? There's no order, said the soldiers. Don't crowd. The devil! Why can't you have patience? It will be worse than this when he sets the bridge on fire. You're crushing that officer. Such were the remarks made on all sides among the halting columns as the men looked at each other and still kept trying to push forward toward the outlet. As Nesvitsky looked under the bridge at the water of the ends, he suddenly heard a sound that was new in his ears of something swiftly approaching him, of something huge, and something that splashed into the water. Did you see where that flew to? gravely asked a soldier who was standing near and trying to follow the sound. They are encouraging us to move a little faster, said another uneasily. Again the throng began to move along. Nesvitsky realized that it had been a cannonball. He, Cossack, bring me my horse, he said. You there, make way. Get out of the way. Clear the road. By main force he managed to swing himself upon his horse. By shouting constantly, he succeeded in forcing his way forward. The soldiers crowded together so as to let him pass, but immediately after pressed on his heels so that they squeezed his leg, and those who were nearest could not help themselves because they were pushed on from behind. Nesvitsky! Nesvitsky! Is it you, you old fright? cried a hoarse voice just behind him. Nesvitsky turned round and saw twenty paces away, but separated from him by this living mass of hurrying infantry, the handsome Vaska Denisov, shaggy as ever, with his cap on the back of his head, and with his hussar's pelisse jauntily flung back over his shoulder. "'Tell these devils, these fiends, to give us womb!' cried Denisov, going into a paroxysm of rage, his coal-black eyes, with their bloodshot whites, rolling and flashing while he brandished his unsheathed saber in his bare little hand as red as his face he vasya replied nesvitsky delighted is that you can't get through the squad one cried vaska denisov angrily showing his shining teeth and spurring on his handsome coal-black bedouin which pricked back his ears at the touch of the bayonets and snorting and scattering around him the froth from his bit was pawing impatiently on the planks of the bridge, apparently ready to leap over the parapet, if only his rider gave the permission. "'What does this mean? Like sheep! Just like sheep! Out of the way! Give us womb to pass! Hold on there! You men, driving that wagon! Dwat it! I'll cut you into mincemeat!' he cried, actually drawing his saber and beginning to flourish it. The soldiers, with frightened faces, crowded closer together, and Denisov managed to reach Nesvitsky. "'So you aren't drunk today,' said Nesvitsky, as Denisov joined him. "'They don't give us time to get drunk,' replied Baska. "'The wedgement has been wanning this way and that way all day long. If we're going to fight, then let us fight. But the devil knows what all this means.' "'How fine you are these days,' said Nesvitsky, glancing at his new police and housings. Denisov smiled took his scented handkerchief from his saber tasha and held it to Nesvitsky's nose. Can't help it. I'm going into action, perhaps, and so I shaved, brushed my teeth, and perfumed myself. Nesvitsky's imposing figure, with his Cossack in attendance, and Denisov's determination, as he flourished his saber and shouted at the top of his voice, enabled them to get to the farther end of the bridge and halt the infantry. Nesvitsky there found the colonel to whom he was obliged to deliver the message, and having accomplished his errand, he rode back. After the way was cleared, Denisov reined up his horse at the exit of the bridge. 
carelessly holding in his stallion that stood pawing with one hoof anxious to join his fellows, he gazed at the squadrons that were moving in his direction. The hoofbeats of the eager horses sounded hollow on the flooring of the bridge, and the squadrons with the officers riding in advance hastened to cross the bridge, four men abreast, and began to pour off from the other end of the road. The infantry, which had halted in the mud and were packing together, gazed at the neat, jaunty hussars riding by in good order, with that peculiar malevolent feeling of jealousy and scorn with which different branches of the service are apt to regard each other. Very tidy, lads, but only fit for the Podnovinskoya. What's the use of them? They're merely for show, said another. You infantrymen, don't kick up such a dust, jestingly shouted a hussar, whose horse playfully splattered the foot-soldier with mud. If you'd been forced to march two stages with a knapsack, your gold lace would be tarnished, said the infantryman, wiping the mud from his face with his sleeve. You're not a man, but a bird on that horse. Well, now, Zekin, if they should put you on a horse, you'd have an easy time of it. You'd make a graceful rider, jestingly remarked the corporal, aiming his jest at the lean little soldier, who was bent almost double under the weight of his knapsack. Take a broomstick between your legs. That would be a good enough horse for you, retorted the hussar. End of chapter 7